Chapter 25 God or Country By the great Lord Brahma, growled Brigo. Brigo had finally reached Devagiri. He had been delayed on the recently built road between Dharmakhet in Swadeep and Meluha by the flood waters of an overwhelming Yamuna, which had submerged the pathway. While he was stuck in this no-man's land between the Chandravanshi and Suryavanshi empires, Brigu availed of the facilities of the traveler's guest house, built by the Meluhans alongside the road. Not that its comforts calmed him though, for he needed to be in Devagiri. What did alleviate his stress was the arrival of Parvateshwar along with Anandamai. They traveled together from there onwards, and Brigu used this opportunity to discuss battle strategy with him. The flooding of the Yamuna of the Yamuna had transformed what should have been a quick journey of a few weeks into many months. Briku, Daksh, Parvateshwar and Kanakla conferred in the private royal office of Devagiri, examining the ramifications of the Nilkant's proclamation. May I see the notice, Maharishiji? asked Parvateshwar. Brigu handed over the stone tablet and then turned to Daksha and Kanakla. When were they put up? A few months ago, my lord, said Daksha. At all major temples in practically every city within the empire, added Kanakla. And was this a simultaneous event, orchestrated on the same day? asked Parvateshwar, obviously impressed by the logistical feat. Yes, said Kanakla. Only the Nilkant could have organized this. But why would he do it? He loves Meluha and we worship him. We therefore assumed that it had to be someone else who was trying to slander the reputation of our lord. Sadly, we still haven't made any headway in our investigation and do not know who the real perpetrators are. Do you have any traitors in your administration, your highness? asked Brigu. Daksha bristled but did not dare make his anger apparent. Certainly not, my lord. You can trust the Maluhans like you trust me. Brigu's ironic smile did not leave much to the imagination. What do you make of it, Lord Parvateshwar? I would have expected nothing less from the Nilkant, said Parvateshwar. Kanakla was stunned by this revelation, but prudently chose silence. But I must tell you that we responded well, my lord, said Daksha to Brigu. They were removed within a few days and were replaced with official notices stating that the earlier ones had been put up by a fraud and should not be believed. Kanakla reeled from shock. She had inadvertently sinned when she put up the new notices that Daksha had asked her to and become party to a lie. She considered resigning from her position. However, it was obvious that a war was imminent, and her wartime duties were clear, complete and unquestioning loyalty to the king and country. She had never faced a situation where her duties stood in direct conflict with her dharma. The confusion was bewildering. So you see, my lord, this particular problem has been handled, said Daksha. We need to now focus on how to repel Shiva's forces. Brigu gestured towards Daksha. Not now, your highness. Let me first confer with General Parvateshwar in private. Kanakla was still lost in the turmoil within her conscience and did not notice the exchange. The proclamation was made by the Lord Nilkant. How can we go against his word? This is wrong. If the Lord says that the Somras is not to be used, then I don't see how we can go against this diktat. Parvateshwar had accompanied Kanakla to her office after the meeting. He could tell that she was very disturbed by the events of the morning. I've already stopped using the Somras, Kanakla. As will I, from this instant. But that is not what troubles me. The Nilkant wants the whole of Meluha to stop using the Somras. And the consequences of ignoring his decision are very clear from his message. If we don't, then we become his enemies. I'm aware of that. For all practical purposes, war has already been declared. His army is mobilizing even as we speak. Meluha must stop using the Somras. Does the law allow either you or me to pass an order banning the Somras? No, only the emperor can do that. And he hasn't, has he? Also, the emperor's orders are unquestionable in times of war. Can't we avoid a war in some way? Why don't you speak to Maharishi Brigu? He respects you. The Maharishi is not convinced that the Somras has turned evil. Then we should approach the people directly. Kanakla, you know better than that. It would mean breaking your oath as Prime Minister, since you would be directly going against the order of your Emperor. But why should I follow his orders? 
He made me lie to our own people. I assure you that nothing like that will happen again for as long as I'm alive and in Maluha. Kanakla looked away as she struggled to get a grip over her raging emotions. Kanakla, let's say we do approach the Maluhans directly, said Parvadeshwar. We will have to convince our countrymen to voluntarily choose to end their life much before it normally would have. And we will have nothing to give them in return. Convincing people to do this is not an easy task. Even with those as duty-bound and honourable as the Maluhans, it will take time. The Nilkant, however, is not patient when it comes to the Sombras. He wants its use to end right now. The only way he can do that is to attack the epicenter. Which is Meluha. Exactly. Right now, our task is to protect our country. You know Lord Ram's laws state very clearly that our primary duty is towards our country. He said that even if it comes to choosing between Lord Ram and Meluha, we should choose Meluha. Who would have imagined that it would actually come down to such a choice, Parvateshwar? That we would need to choose between our God and our country? Parvateshwar smiled sadly. My duty to my country is above all others, Kanakla. Kanakla ran her hand over her bald pate and touched the knotted tuft of hair at the back of her head, trying to draw strength from it. What kind of challenge is fate throwing at us? It's a stupid idea, Your Highness, said Brigo. Your problem is that you do not look beyond the next three months when you dream up your strategies. Daksha had been sitting expectantly at the Maharishi's feet, eagerly awaiting his response. For he had just unfolded to Brigo his brilliant scheme to avoid the war altogether. An unmoved Brigo then leaned towards him from his stone bed. We are not fighting with a Nilkant, but the devotion that he inspires in your people, making him a martyr, will turn your people against you, and inevitably the Sombras. Daksha expressed acknowledgement. You're right, my lord. Had we succeeded in killing him in Panchavati, the people would have blamed the Nagas. That failure was most unfortunate. Also, your highness, while it is not unethical to attack an unprepared enemy, there are some codes that just cannot be broken, even in times of war, like killing a peace ambassador or even a messenger. Of course, my lord, said a distracted Daksha. His mind, in fact, was already working on refining his plan. Are you listening, your highness? asked an irritated Brigo. The chastened Daksha looked up immediately. Of course I am, my lord. Brigo sighed and waved his hand, dismissing him from his chamber. Parvateshwar strode into his house and nodded towards the attendant even as he ran up the steps that skirted the central courtyard. As he approached the first floor, he seemed to remember something and stepped back towards the landing overlooking the central courtyard. Rati! Yes, my lord, answered the attendant. Isn't it the day of the week when Lady Anandamai bathes in milk and rose petals? asked Parvateshwar. Yes, my lord, warm water on all days of the week except the day of the sun when she bathes in milk and rose petals. Parvateshwar smiled. So, is it ready? Rati smiled indulgently. She had served Parvateshwar her entire life, but had never seen her master smile as much as he had in the last few days since he had returned with the new mistress. It'll be ready any moment now, my lord. Be sure to inform the lady as soon as it's ready. Yes, my lord. Parvateshwar turned and ran up the remaining two flights of stairs before reaching his private chamber on top. He found Anandamai relaxing in the balcony on a comfortable chair as she observed the goings-on in the street below. A cloth canopy screened out the evening sun. She turned around as she heard Parvateshwar rush in. What's the hurry? asked a smiling Anandamai. Parvateshwar stopped, smiling broadly. I just wanted to know how you're doing. Anandamai smiled and beckoned Parvateshwar. The Maluha general walked over and sat down beside her on the armrest. Anandamai rested her head on his arm as she continued to study the street below. The markets were still open, but unlike the loud and garrulous Chandravanshis, the citizens of Devagiri were achingly polite. The road, the houses, the people, everything reflected the prized Suryavanshi values of sobriety, dignity and uniformity. What do you think of our capital? asked Parvateshwar. Isn't it astonishingly well-planned and orderly? Anandamai looked at Parvateshwar 
with an indulgent smile playing on her lips. It's heartbreakingly lackluster and colorless. Parvateshwar laughed. You're more than enough to add color to this city. Anandamai placed a head on Parvateshwar's as she remarked, So, this is the land where I will die. Parvateshwar turned his hand around and held hers in reply. Any news? asked Anandamai. Has the Lord entered the territory of Meluha? No reports as yet, said Parvateshwar. But what is truly worrying is the absence of bird couriers from Ayodhya. Anandamai's visage transformed as she straightened up with concern. Has Ayodhya been conquered? I don't know, darling. But I don't think the Lord has enough men to conquer Ayodhya. The city has seven concentric walls, albeit badly designed. That is formidable defense, even if the soldiers are ill-trained. Anandamai narrowed her eyes in irritation. They are poorly led, Parvateshwar, but the soldiers are brave men. My country's generals may be idiots, but the commoners will fight hard for their homeland. This reinforces my argument that the Lord Nilkant couldn't have conquered Ayodhya with just the 150,000 soldiers of Branga and Vaishali. So what do you think has happened? Clearly, Meluhan interests are not being served in Ayodhya. One possibility is that your father, King Dilipa, has aligned with the Nilkant. Impossible. My father is too much in love with himself. He's getting medicines from Lord Brigu, which is keeping him alive. He will not risk that for anything. The people of Ayodhya may have rebelled against their king and thrown in their lot with the Nilkant. Hmm, that's possible. My people are certainly more devoted to the Nilkant than to my father. And if the Nilkant has Ayodhya under control, he will quickly turn his attention to his main objective, Meluha. He aims to destroy the Somras Parva. He will not indulge in wanton destruction. Why would he do that? It would turn your people against him. He will only go for the Somras. Parvateshwar's eyes flashed open. Of course, he will target the secret Somras manufacturing facility and its scientists. That would end the supply of the Somras. People will have no choice but to learn to live without it. There you are. That's his target. Where is this secret Somras manufacturing facility? I don't know, but I will find out. Yes, you should. In any case, said Parvateshwar, I've told Kanakla not to send any more messages to Ayodhya. We could just be passing on information to the enemy. If Ayodhya is already in their control and they leave now, they could be in Meluha quite soon. Yes, it could be as early as six months. Also, along with Ayodhya, the Lord would have a massive army. Redouble your preparations. Hmm, I'll also order Vidyun Mali to leave for Lothal with 20,000 soldiers. Lothal? Just because they didn't send you their monthly report? Isn't that a bit of an overreaction? I don't have a good feeling about them said Parvateshwar, slowly shaking his head. They didn't respond to my bird courier. Can you afford to send 20,000 soldiers away based on a mere hunch? Lothal is not too far away. Also, it's a border town. It is the closest Meluhan city from Panchavati. It may not be such a bad idea to reinforce it. Chapter 26 Battle of Mrithikavati The exhausted scout tumbled into the military tent, barely able to conceal his anxiety. Shiva jerked his head up from the map he'd been poring over as the soldier managed a hasty salute. What? Shot like an arrow, Shiva's voice made Kali, Sati, Gopal and Chinardwaj look up too, worry creasing their faces. Shiva's army had marched in quickly from Lothal, and was just a day away from Ritikavati. My lord, I have bad news. Give me the facts. Don't jump to conclusions. Ritikavati is much better defended now than it had been earlier. Brigadier Vidyun Mali sailed into the city a few days back. Apparently, he was on his way to Lothal to strengthen Maluha's defenses at the border. Clearly, Emperor Daksh has no idea as yet that Lothal has pledged loyalty to you, my lord. How many men does Vidyunwali have? asked Chinardwaj. Around 20,000, my lord. Added to which are the 5,000 soldiers already stationed at Pritikavati. We're still at a substantial advantage in terms of numbers, my lord, said Chinardwaj. But Pritikavati's defenses can make even 25,000 men seem like a lot. Shiva shook his head. I don't think that should be a problem. It doesn't matter how many soldiers they have. 
We just want to commandeer their ships, not conquer the city. If Vidyun Mali has sailed with 20,000 soldiers, his transport ships would also be in the Mritikavati port, right? So, there are even more ships for us to capture. Kali smiled. That's true. Prepare to march to Mritikavati, said Shiva. We attack in two days. Shiva could see the panic-stricken people rush back into the city as the warning conches were blown repeatedly from the ramparts of Mritikavati. The unexpected appearance of a massive enemy force had shocked the Maluhans. Atop his horse, at a vantage point on the hill, Shiva could clearly see the city of Mritikavati and its port. Like most Maluhan cities, it had also been built on a massive platform a kilometer away from the Saraswati as a protection against floods. But it was the port, obviously built on the banks of the great river, which fascinated Shiva. The circular harbour was massive, with the waters of the Saraswati going into it through a narrow opening. A semicircular dock was separated by a pool of water from the outer ring of the port. A dome covered in a dock protected the various repair yards. Ships were anchored along the outer side of the inner dock and the inner side of the outer pier. This ingenious design could hold nearly 50 ships in a relatively small space. The expanse of water between the two parallel circles of ships allowed for free movement of the vessels. The ships could move fairly quickly within the harbour in a single file. Being relatively small, the harbour gate afforded the entry or exit of only one ship at a time. But considering that ships could tail each other in the circular channel within the port, the narrow gate did not affect the speed at which the ships could enter or leave the port. However, it did allow for effective defence against enemy ships. The gate was shut and Shiva could see the numerous points across the harbour walls from where a defence could be mounted. Shiva smiled. Typical foolproof Maluhan planning. Kali leaned across Shiva. The fortified pathway between the city and the port may be a weakness. Yes, said Sadi. Let's attack from there. If we succeed in making them feel vulnerable, they will be forced to shut the gates of the city that lead to this pathway and pull their soldiers within. The city and the port are not next to each other, which means that they will have to sacrifice one or the other if the pathway walls are breached. I would imagine they would compromise and give up the port. Shiva looked at Sadi. Vidyanmali is aggressive. He doesn't like to make compromises. Once he realizes that we are after their ships and not the city itself, he may take a gamble. He may choose to step out of the city and mount a rearguard assault on our attacking forces. That may appear like a sensible choice to him. He may think that he can rout us on the pathway, thus saving both the port and the city. I hope he makes that mistake. Shiva rode up and down the line of his all-inclusive army, consisting of Brangas, Vasudevs, Nagas and some Surya Vanshis from Lothal. Sati and Kali were on horseback, leading their sections of the army. The soldiers were ready but knew that the Meluhans were well fortified. Soldiers! roared Shiva. Mahadevs! Hear me! Silence descended on the men. We are told that a great man walked this earth a thousand years ago. Lord Ram, Mariada Purushottam, the most celebrated amongst the kings. But we know the truth. He was more than a man. He was a god. Soldiers listened in pin-drop silence. These people, said Shiva, pointing to the Maluhans stationed on the fort walls of Mritikavati, only remember his name. They don't remember his words. But I remember the words of Lord Ram. I remember he had said, If you have to choose between my people and Dharm, choose Dharm. If you have to choose between my family and Dharm, choose Dharm. Even if you have to choose between me and Dharm, always choose Dharm. Dharm, bellowed the army in one voice. The Meluhans have chosen evil, bellowed Shiva. We choose Dharm. Dharm. They have chosen death. We choose victory. Victory. 
They have chosen the Somras, roared Shiva. We choose Lord Ram. Jai Shri Ram, shouted Sati. Jai Shri Ram, Kali joined the war cry. Jai Shri Ram, shouted all the soldiers. Jai Shri Ram, Jai Shri Ram. The familiar cry from the Nilkant's army reverberated within the walls of Mrithikavati. It was a cry that usually charged the Maluhans, but this time it infused fear. Shiva turned to Kali, surrounded by the roars of his warriors, and nodded at her. A small, cold smile curved Kali's lips, and she nodded in return, her eyes glittering, and swung her sword so it flashed in the sun. Then she raised a single hand to the soldiers behind her, and a wave of silence rolled out across the army until all that could be heard was the wind snapping at the banners flying above their heads. She signaled again, and the men tensed and readied their weapons. Then she raised one sword, pointed towards the sky, and with a blood-curdling scream brought her blade forward to unleash a roaring tide of men at the walls. Shiva keenly observed the battle raging in a narrow section of the fortified pathway. Kali was engaged in making repeated assaults with the Vasudev elephants and makeshift catapults, concentrating all resources on breaching one small section. A small number of exceptionally brave Naga soldiers fought against daunting odds as the Maluhans shot arrows and poured boiling oil from the battlements that lined the pathway. Famed for their superhuman courage, the Nagas were ideal for this battle of attrition. Small breaches began opening up on the pathway walls. Shiva soldiers would soon be able to block the city's access to its port. This triggered the reaction that Shiva expected from Vidyanmali. The main gates of Mrithikavati were thrown open and the Maluhans marched out, arranged in a formation that they had learned from Shiva himself. The Maluhan soldiers had formed themselves into squares of 20 by 20 men. Each soldier covered the left half of his body with his shield and the right half of the soldier to the left of him. The soldier behind used his shield as a lid to cover himself and the soldier in front. Each warrior used the space between his own shield and the one next to him to hold out his long spear. This formation provided the defense of a tortoise but could also be used as a devastatingly offensive battering ram with long spears bearing in on the enemy. However, the tortoise had one weakness that was known to the creator of the formation himself, Shiva. This chink in the armor was at its rear. If attacked from behind, there was little that the soldiers could do. They were weighed down with heavy spears which pointed ahead. It was difficult to turn around quickly. Furthermore, there was no shield protection at the back of the formation. So, if an enemy were to get behind, he could attack the soldiers and rout them completely. Shiva turned towards Sati with a smile. Vidyon Mali is so predictable. Sati nodded. To formation? To formation, agreed Shiva. Sati immediately turned her horse and rode out to the right, quickly extending the line of the army under her command towards the pathway wall. She steadily put herself between the Maluhan tortoises emerging from the city gates and Kali's brave Nagas who were attacking the fortified pathway behind her. Her task was to first fight hard and then begin retreating slowly, giving the Maluhans a false sense of imminent victory, keeping them marching forward. It would be a tough battle which would lead to heavy casualties, as she would be right in front of the unstoppable tortoise formations. As the Maluhans moved ahead, space would open up behind them, allowing Shiva to ride out with his cavalry and attack them from the rear. Shiva, meanwhile, rode towards the elephant corps and the cavalry on the left. Steady! Shiva ordered the Vasudev brigadier in command of the elephant corps. Shiva had to move quickly, but he also had to move at the right time. If he charged too early, Vidyanmali would smell the trap. As Veerbhadra saw the Meluhan tortoise charge into Sati's army, he turned to Shiva, worried. The task is too difficult for Sati. We should... Stay focused, Bhadra, said Shiva. She knows what she's doing. The tortoise formations were bearing down hard on Sati and her soldiers. 
In the best traditions of Surya Vanshi warfare, Sati led from the front. She could see the walls of shields moving steadily towards her at a slow, jostling run, a forest of spears bristling out of every crevice. The sun bounced off the polished metal with every thudding step they took. She breathed out slowly and urged her horse forward into a smooth canter, then a gallop as she held herself just out of the saddle, poised and still, waiting for her moment. Closer and closer she came to the formation, eyes searching for a gap. For a moment, a shield shifted slightly out of alignment as they ran, exposing the neck of a soldier. Without shifting in her seat, Sati drew a knife from her sheath and flung it with deadly accuracy, striking home and felling the soldier in mid-step. The tortoise was almost upon her. She pulled hard on the reins, her horse rearing up as she tried to turn backwards. She felt a sharp pain in her shoulder and heard her horse neigh desperately as it faltered beneath her. Gasping in pain from the spear thrust, she tried to kick free from her dying mount as it came to its knees. She looked up to see which soldier had stabbed her, but could not make out which pair of eyes, peering over their shields, held the spear that was buried in her shoulder. The spear was thrust deeper and she cried out, half in pain and half in anger, her eyes watering. She swung her sword violently, hacking the spear in two as she rolled off the horse and onto her feet. A few arrows sped past Sati's shoulders, striking more soldiers in the tortoise through the gap that she had created. For a moment, the Meluhan charge slowed and faltered, the shield line crumbling in slightly as replacement soldiers struggled to come forward and seal the breach. Admirably though, the Meluhans were back in formation quickly and resumed their charge. Sati stepped back a pace and in the same movement, almost like they were in lockstep, her army stepped back as well, imperceptibly, as they fought on bravely. They kept withdrawing gradually, as though being mowed down by the unstoppable tortoise core. Just a few more minutes of steady retreat by Sati's men and the Meluhans would have marched forward far enough for Shiva to ride out behind them and destroy their formations. Shiva observed the battle raging in the distance. His eyes fell on the Meluhan chariots on the side of the tortoise formations, providing protection to their flanks. Each chariot had a charioteer to steer the horses and a warrior to engage in combat. The two-man team allowed for frightening speed and brutal force. These chariots could stall the impending charge of Shiva's cavalry. I want your elephants to take out those chariots now, he ordered the Vasudev Brigadier. The Vasudev Brigadier turned to his mouths, quickly relaying the orders. The elephants raced out at a fearsome pace, making the ground rumble with their charge. The Maluhan warriors on the chariots confidently observed the elephants approach. They immediately relieved their charioteers of the reins of their horses, who in turn pulled out drums stored for just such an occasion. The Maluhans still remembered the battles against Chandravanshi elephants. Loud noises from drums always disturbed the giant animals, making them run amok, often crushing their own army. But these beasts had been trained by the Vasudevs to tolerate sudden loud sounds. Much to the shock of the Maluhan charioteers, the elephants continued their charge. Seeing their tactic fail, they immediately abandoned the drums and took up the reins of their horses. The warriors pulled out their spears and readied themselves for battle. The Maluhan chariots moved quickly as the Vasudev elephants drew near, weaving around the pachyderms as they charged, throwing their spears at the giant beasts, hoping to injure or at least slow them down. But the elephants were prepared. There were massive metallic balls tied to their trunks. The elephants swung their trunks expertly, smashing the metallic balls into the bodies of the horses and the charioteers. Some of the Maluhans were fortunate enough to die instantly, but others had the balls smashed through their bones, leaving them alive to suffer in agony. And as if this wasn't bad enough, a second surprise was in store for the Maluhan charioteers. All of a sudden, fire spewed out of the elephant howdahs. The Vasudevs had fitted their elephants with machines designed by their engineers. Two Vasudev soldiers kept pushing the levers, shooting out an almost continuous stream of flames which burned all in its path. The few unfortunate Maluhan chariots that did not get burned were stamped out of existence under massive elephant feet. The chariot core of the Maluhans was no match for the Vasudev elephants. Shiva drew his sword and held it high. He turned to his cavalry and shouted over the din. 
Ride hard into the rear of those formations. Charge into them. Destroy them. Even as Shiva's cavalry thundered out, Sati was playing her part perfectly. Her soldiers had been progressively stepping back, drawing the Maluhans further and further away into the open, exposing a massive breach between the rear of their tortoise formations and the fort walls. To maintain the credibility of the tactic and keep the Maluhans engaged in battle, Sati's soldiers were not running away in haste, but continuing to fight, taking many casualties in the process. Sati herself had also been seriously injured, having been struck on both the shoulder and the thigh. But she battled on. She knew she couldn't afford to fail. Her forces' success in their task was crucial to their overall victory. Shiva's cavalry rode hard in a great arc around the main battlefront. He could see the Vasudev elephants and the Maluhan chariots clashing on his right. Practically decimated, the chariots could not ride out to meet the new threat from the cavalry. Shiva rode fast, unchallenged, till he reached the unprotected rear of the Maluhan daughter's formations. Jai Shri Ram! thundered Shiva. Parhar Mahadev! bellowed his cavalry, kicking their horses hard. Shiva's 3,000 strong cavalry charged into the Maluhans. Locked into their formation as they faced the opposite side, weighed down by immensely heavy spears, they were unable to turn around. Shiva's mounted soldiers cut through the Maluhan tortoise core, hacking away with their long swords. Within moments of this brutal attack, the Maluhan formations started breaking. Some soldiers surrendered, while others simply ran away. By the time Vidyunmali, who was fighting at the head of his army, received the news of the decimation of his troops towards his rear, it was already too late. The Maluhans had been outflanked and defeated. Chapter 27 The Nilkant Speaks The survivors had been disarmed and chained together in groups. The chains had been fixed into stakes buried deep in the ground. They were surrounded by four divisions of Shiva's finest. It was well nigh impossible for them to escape. Ayurvati had commandeered the outer port area and created a temporary hospital. The injured of both the Maluhan as well as Shiva's army were being treated. Shiva squatted next to a low bed where Sati had just received a quick surgery. The wound on her shoulder would heal quickly, but thigh injury would take some time. Kali and Gopal stood at a distance. I'm all right, said Sati, pushing Shiva away. Go to Mritikavati. You need to take control of the city quickly. They need to see you. You need to calm them down. We don't want skirmishes breaking out between the citizens of Mritikavati and our army. I know, I know. I'm going said Shiva. I just needed to check on you. Sati smiled and pushed him once again. I'm fine. I will not die so easily. Now go. Didi is right, said Kali. We need to do a flag march within the precincts of the city and cow them down. A surprised Shiva turned around. We are not taking our army into the city. Kali flailed her hands in exasperation. Then why did we conquer the city? We haven't conquered the city. We've only defeated their army. We need to get the citizens of Mrithikavati on our side. On our side? Why? Because we will then be free to sail out of here with our entire army. We have 10,000 prisoners of the Meluhan army. Do you want to commit our soldiers to guarding prisoners of war? If Mrithikavati comes to our side, we can keep the Meluhan army imprisoned within the city itself. They're not going to do that, Shiva. In fact, if they see any weakness in us, they will sense an opportunity to rebel. It's not weakness, Kali, but compassion. People usually know the difference. You've got to be joking. How in God's name are you going to show compassion after massacring their army? I will do it by not marching into the city with my army. I will go there only with Bhadra, Nandi and Parshuram. And I will speak to citizens. How will that help? It will. You have just destroyed their army, Shiva. I don't think they would be interested in listening to anything you have to say. They will be. I am their Nilkant. Kali could barely contain her irritation. At least let me accompany you with some Naga soldiers. 
you may need some protection. No. Shiva, do you trust me? What does that have to do with Kali? Do you trust me? Of course I do. Then let me handle this, concluded Shiva, before turning to Sati. I'll be back soon, darling. Sati smiled and touched Shiva's hand. Go with Lord Ram, my friend, said Gopal, as Shiva rose and turned to leave. Shiva smiled. He's always with me. A collective buzz of a thousand voices hovered over the central square as the citizens of Nitikavati came in droves for a glimpse of their Nilkant. News of his presence in the city had spread like wildfire. Was it the Nilkant who attacked us? Why would he attack us? We are his people, he is our god. Was it really him who banned the Sumras and not a fraud Nilkant? Did our emperor lie to us? No, that cannot be. Shiva stood tall in the stone podium, surveying the milling, excitable crowd. He allowed them to have a clear view of his uncovered blue throat, the Nilkant. Unarmed as ordered, Nandi, Virbhadra and Parshuram stood apprehensively behind him. Citizens of Mritikavati, thundered Shiva. I am your Nilkant, whispers hummed through the square. Silence, said Nandi, raising his hand quietening the audience immediately. I come from a faraway land, deep in the Himalayas. My life was changed by what I had believed was an elixir. But I was wrong. This mark I bear on my throat is not a blessing from the gods, but a curse of evil, a mark of poison. I carry this mark, said Shiva, pointing to his blue throat. But my fellow Maluhans, you bear this scourge as well, and you don't even know it. The audience listened, spellbound. The Somras gives you a long life and you are grateful for that. But these years that it gifts to you are not for free. It takes away a lot more from you. And its hunger for your soul has no limit. A sinister breeze rustled the leaves of the trees that lined the square. For those few additional transient years, you pay a price that is eternal. It is no coincidence that so many women in Maluha cannot bear children. That is the curse of the Somras. Shiva's words found ready resonance in Maluhan hearts, many of which had been broken by the long, lonely wait for children from the Mica adoption system. They knew the misery of growing old without a child. It's no coincidence that the mother of your country, the mother of Indian civilization itself, the revered Saraswati, is slowly drying to extinction. The thirsty Somras continues to consume her waters. Her death will also be due to the evil of the Somras. The Saraswati River was not just a body of water to most Indians. In fact, no river was. And the Saraswati was the holiest among them all. It was their spiritual mother. Thousands of children are born in Mica with painful cancers that eat up their bodies. Millions of Swadvipans are dying of a plague brought on by the waste of the Somras. Those people curse the ones who use the Somras. They are cursing you, and your souls will bear this burden for many births. That is the evil of the Somras. Veerbhadra looked at Shiva's back and then at the audience. Shiva felt his blue throat and smiled sadly. It may appear that the Somras has my throat, but in actual fact, it has all of Meluha by the throat. And it is squeezing the life out of you slowly, so slowly that you don't even realize it. And by the time you do, it will be too late. All of Meluha, all of India will be destroyed. The citizens of Mritikavati continue to be engrossed in his speech. I did try to stop this peacefully. I sent out a notice to every city and every kingdom all across this fair land of our India. But in Maluha, my message was replaced by another, put up by your emperor, stating that it wasn't I who banned the Somras, but some fraud Nilkant. Nandi could sense the tide turning. Your emperor lied to you. There was pin drop silence. Emperor Daksh occupies the position that was Lord Ram's more than a thousand years ago. 
He represents the legacy of the great seventh Vishnu. He is supposed to be your protector. And he lied to you. Parshuram looked at Shiva with reverence. He had swayed the Maluhans firmly to his side. As if that wasn't enough, he sent his army to drive a wedge between you and me. But I know that nothing can tear us apart. I know that you will listen to me. For I am fighting for Maluha. I am fighting for the future of your children. Collective wave of understanding swept through the crowd. The Nilkant was fighting for them, not against them. You have heard myths about the tribe of Vasudev, left behind by our great lord Sri Ram. Well, the legendary tribe does exist, the ones who carry the legacy of Lord Ram. And they are with me, sharing my mission. They also want to save India from the Somras. Almost every Maluhan was familiar with the fable of the Vasudevs, the tribe of Lord Ram himself. Now knowing that they not only existed in flesh and blood, but were with the Nilkant as well, drove the issue beyond debate in their minds. I am going to save Maluha! I am going to stop the Somras! roared Shiva. Who's with me? I am! screamed Nandi. I am! shouted every citizen of Mritikavati. I love Maluha more than the Somras! said Shiva. So I put up a proclamation banning the Somras. Your emperor loves the Somras more than Maluha, so he decided to oppose me. Whose side are you on, Maluha or the Somras? Maluha! Then what do we do with the army that fights for your emperor, that fights for the Somras? Kill them! Kill them? Yes! No! shouted Shiva. The audience remained quiet. I want the soldiers to be imprisoned in Vritikavati, said Shiva. I want you to ensure that they do not escape. If they do, they will follow your emperor's orders and fight me again. Will you keep them captive in your city? Yes. Will you ensure that not one of them escapes? Yes. Shiva allowed a smile to escape. I see gods standing before me. Gods who are willing to fight evil. Gods who are willing to give up their attachment to evil. The citizens of Mritikavati absorbed the praise from their Nilkant. Shiva raised his bald fist high in the air. Har Har Mahadev! Har Har Mahadev! roared the people. Nandi, Virbhadra and Parshuram raised their hands and repeated the stirring cry of those loyal to the Nilkant. Har Har Mahadev! Har Har Mahadev! The governor's palace in Mritikavati had been modified to serve as a prison for the surviving soldiers of the Maluhan army. Shiva's troops escorted the prisoners into the makeshift prison in small batches. Shiva, Kali, Sati, Gopal and Chinardwaj were standing at a small distance from the entrance when Vidyun Mari was led in. He tried to break free and lunge at Shiva. A soldier kicked Vidyun Mali hard and tried to push him back in line. It's all right, said Shiva. Let him approach. Vidyun Mali was allowed to walk past the bamboo shields held by the soldiers and move towards Shiva. You were doing your duty, Vidyun Mali, said Shiva. You were only following orders. I have nothing against you. But you will have to stay imprisoned till the Somras has been removed. Then you will be free to do whatever it is that you want to do. Vidyan Mali stared at Shiva with barely concealed disgust. You were a barbarian when we found you, and you are still a barbarian. We Maluhans don't take orders from barbarians. Chinadwaj drew his sword. Speak with respect to the Nilkant. Vidyan Mali spat at the governor of Lothal Maika. I don't speak to traitors. Kali drew her knife out, moving towards Vidyan Mali. Perhaps you shouldn't speak at all. Kali, whispered Shiva, before turning towards Vidyan Mali. I have no enmity with your country. I tried to achieve my purpose with peace. I had sent out a clear proclamation asking all of you to stop using the Somras. We are a sovereign country. We will decide what we can and cannot use. Not when it comes to evil. When it comes to the Somras, 
you will do what is in the interest of the people and the future of Meluha. Who are you to tell us what is in our interest? Shiva had had enough. He waved his hand dismissively. Take him away. Nandi and Veerbhadra immediately dragged a kicking Vidyunmali towards the makeshift prison. You will lose, you fraud! screamed Vidyunmali. Meluha will not fall! Shiva, I'd like you to meet someone, said Braspati. Braspati had just walked into Shiva's private chamber in the Mritikavati official guest house, accompanied by a Brahmin. Sati, Gopal and Kali were with the Nilkant. Do you remember Panini? asked Braspati. He was my assistant at Mount Mandar. Of course I do, said Shiva, before turning to Panini. How are you, Panini? I am well, great Nilkant. Shiva, said Braspati. I found Panini in Mritikavati, leading a scientific project being conducted at the Saraswati Delta. He has asked me if he can join us in our battle against the Somras. Shiva frowned, wondering why Braspati was disturbing him with such an inconsequential request at this time. Braspati, he was your assistant. I completely trust your judgment. You don't have to check with me about... He has some news that may be useful, interrupted Braspati. What is it, Panini? asked Shiva politely. My lord, said Panini, I was recruited by Maharishi Brigu for some secret work at Mount Mandar. Shiva's interest was immediately piqued. I thought the Somra's factory at Mount Mandar has not been rebuilt as yet. My mission had nothing to do with the Somras, my lord. I was asked to lead a small team of Meluhan scientists personally chosen by the Maharishi to make Devi Astras from materials that he had provided. What? Was it you who made the Devi Astras? Yes. Did the Vayuputras come and help you? We were trained by Maharishi Brigo himself on how to make them from the core material that he provided us. I do know a bit about the technology of Devi Astras, but not enough to make any usable weapons. Perhaps I was selected because even my little knowledge is more than most. But weren't any Vayuputras present in order to assist you? asked Shiva once again. Did you see them with Maharishi Brigo, perhaps? I don't think that the core material that the Maharishi gave us was from the Vayuputras. A surprised Shiva looked at Gopal before turning back to Panini. What makes you say that? The little that I know of the Devi Astra technology is based on Vayuputra knowledge. Maharishi Brigo's processes and the materials were completely different. Did he have his own core material to make the Devi Astras? It appeared so. Shiva turned towards Gopal once again. The implications were obvious and portentous. To begin with, the Vayuputras were not on Brigu's side after all. But more importantly, Brigu was an even more formidable opponent if he could make the core material for the Devi Astras all by himself. And I also think, said Panini, that Maharishi Brigu may have used the last of the Devi Astra core material that he had when he asked me to prepare the weapons. Why do you think so? Well, he was always exhorting me to be careful with the core material and not waste even small portions of it. I remember once when we had accidentally spoilt a minuscule amount of it. He was livid and had angrily rebuked us that this was all the Devi Astra core material that he possessed, that we should be more careful. Shiva took a deep breath before turning to Gopal. He has no more Devi Astras. It appears so, answered Gopal. And the Vayuputras are not with him. That would be a fair assumption to make. Shiva, said Braspati, there's more. Shiva raised a brow and turned towards Panini. My lord, said Panini, I also believe that the secret Somra's factory is in Devagiri. How can you be sure? asked Shiva. I'm sure you're aware that the Somras need the Sanjeevani tree in large quantities. I was brought to Devagiri on a regular basis, but only in the night to check the quality of the Sanjeevani logs coming into the city. I don't understand. Isn't it a part of your normal duties to check the consignment before it's sent off to the Somras factory? That's true. But I had a friend in the customs department with whom I checked whether the Sanjeevani logs ever left the city. He was unaware of any such movement. 
If such huge quantities of the Sanjeevni logs are being brought into Devagiri and not being taken out, then the most logical assumption is that this is a city where the Somras is being manufactured. Shiva's expression reflected his gratitude towards the Brahmin. Panini, thank you. You have no idea how useful your information is. Magad has fallen, asked Parvateshwar. Parvateshwar was in the office of the Meluhan Prime Minister, Kanakla. She had finally received a bird courier from Ayodhya after many months. There's more, said Kanakla. The entire army of Magad has been routed. Prince Surapadman is dead. King Mahendra has gone into deep mourning. The Brangas are now in control of Magad. Parvateshwar pressed the bridge of his nose as he absorbed the implications. If they controlled Magad, they controlled the choke point on the Ganga. They would only have to keep a few thousand soldiers within the fort of Magad to be able to attack any Ayodhyan ship that attempts to sail past. Exactly. That means Ayodhya cannot come to our aid quickly enough. They will have to march through forests to their west and then move towards us. If Magad has been conquered, it means the Lord Nilkant can leave a small force in that city sail up the Ganga with the rest of his forces and march into Meluha from Swadweep. We can expect an attack within as little as the next three or four months. We should ask our Ayodhyan allies to leave for Meluha at once. I will speak to Lord Brigo. There's more, said a worried Kanakla. The courier also said that the army that besieged Ayodhya and attacked Magad was led by Ganesh, Karthik, Bhagirath and Chandraketu. Then where is the Lord Nilkant? Exactly, said Kanakla. Where is the Lord Nilkant? Just then, an aide rushed into Kanakla's office. My lord, my lady, please come at once to His Highness's office. Lord Brigu has asked that the both of you come immediately. As Kanakla and Parvateshwar rushed out of the office, another aide approached them with a message for the Meluhan general. From the stamp, it was clear that the message was from Vidyon Mali. Parvateshwar broke the seal intending to read the letter on his way to the emperor's office. Chapter 28 Meluha Stunned What is it, Parvateshwar? asked Kanakra. She had seen the Meluhan general's face turn white as he read Vidyunmali's message. Before Parvateshwar could answer, they found themselves at the door of Daksha's office. No sooner had Parvateshwar and Kanakla entered the Emperor's chamber, than Daksha unleashed his fury. Parvateshwar, are you in control of the army or not? What in Lord Ram's name have you been up to? Parvateshwar knew what the Emperor was talking about. He also knew that speaking with the Emperor on this topic was a waste of time. He wisely kept silent, saluting the Emperor with a short bow of his head and his hands folded in a namaste. Bad news, General, spoke Brigu. Mritikavati has been attacked and conquered by Shiva. What? asked a stunned Kanakla. How did they even reach Mritikavati? How could they get through the defences of Lothal? Lothal was an exceptionally well-designed sea fortress. Its defences were so solid that an attacker would have to fight overwhelming odds to have any hope of conquering it. It was also known that Lothal was the gateway to southeastern Meluha, and an attacking army would have to cross this city to be able to march up to Mridhikafiti. Brigu raised five sheets of papyrus. This is from the governor of Mridhikavati. Apparently, Chinadhwaj has pledged loyalty to Shiva, the traitor. That swine, growled Daksha. I knew I should never have trusted him. Then why did you appoint him governor of Lothal, your highness? asked Brigu. Daksh lapsed into a sulk. Brigu turned to Parvateshwar. Your suspicions about Lothal were correct, Lord Parvateshwar. I should apologize for not having listened to you earlier. Had we perhaps sent Vidyun Mali to Lothal promptly with a strong force, we would still be in control of that city. We cannot undo what has happened, my lord, said Parvateshwar. Let's concentrate on what we can do now. I've received a message from Vidyunmali. 
Brigu looked at the letter in Parvateshwar's hand. What does the brigadier say? It sounds like an intelligence failure to me, said Parvateshwar. He says Lord Shiva took them by surprise as he appeared at the gates of Mrithikavati with 100,000 soldiers. Vidyan Mali put up a brave defense with a mere 25,000 but was routed. Kanakla understood the strategic significance of Mrithikavati. Mrithikavati houses the headquarters of the Saraswati fleet and Vidyan Mali had taken what was left of our warships as well. If the Lord controls Mrithikavati, he now controls the Saraswati river. Shiva is not a lord, screamed Daksha. How dare you? Who are you loyal to, Karakla? Your Highness, said Brigu, his calm tone belying the menace beneath. Daksha recoiled in fear. Your Highness, perhaps it would be better if you retired to your personal chambers. But, Your Highness, said Brigu, that was not a request. Daksh closed his eyes, shocked at the immense disrespect being shown to him. He got up and left his office, muttering under his breath about the respect due to the Emperor of India. Brigu turned to Parvateshwar, unperturbed, as if nothing had happened. General, what else does Vidyan Mali say? The entire Saraswati fleet is under the Lord Nilkant now, but it gets worse. Worse? The people of Mritikavati have now pledged loyalty to him. The survivors of Vidyan Mali's army have been held prisoner in Mritikavati. Fortunately for us, Vidyan Mali managed to escape with 500 soldiers and send this message. So, the Nilkant has stationed himself in Mritikavati for now? asked Brigu, careful not to use the term fraud Nilkant in Parvateshwar's presence. Because he will have to commit his own soldiers to guard ours, right? No, said Parvateshwar, shaking his head. Our army is being held prisoner by the citizens of Mrithikavati. The citizens? Yes, so the Lord Nilkant does not have to commit any of his own soldiers for the task. He has managed to take 25,000 of our soldiers out of the equation, but he still has practically his whole army with him. He has commandeered our entire Saraswati fleet. I'm sure he's making plans to sail up north even as we speak. Vidyan Mali also writes about a fearsome corps of exceptionally well-trained elephants in the Lord's army, which are almost impossible to defeat. Lord Ram, be merciful, said a stunned Kanakla. This is worse than we'd ever imagined, said Brigu. But I don't understand one thing, said Kanakla. How does the Lord have an army of 100,000 in Meluha when 150,000 of his soldiers were in Ayodhya a few weeks back? Ayodhya? asked a surprised Brigu. Yes, said Kanakla, and proceeded to tell him about the message that she had just received from Ayodhya about the siege and the destruction of the Magadan forces. By the great Lord Brahma, said Brigu, this means the Ayodhya army cannot sail past Magad. They will have to march through the forest, which means it will take them forever to come to our aid. But I still don't understand how the Lord Nilkant has so many soldiers in Maluha, persisted Kanakla. The Branga and Naga armies together don't add up to this number. The truth finally dawned on Brigo. The Vasudevs have joined forces with Shiva. They are the only ones outside of the Suryavanshis and the Chandravanshis who can bring in so many soldiers. This also explains the presence of the exceptionally well-trained elephants Shiva used in the Battle of Mithikavati. I have heard stories about the prowess of the Vasudev elephants. Brigo was not aware that the strongest strategic benefit of the Vasudevs was not the elephant core, but their secret Vasudev pundits hidden in temples across the sub Sindhu. These pundits were the eyes and ears of the Nilkant, providing him with the most crucial advantage in war timely and accurate information. Lord Shiva will be here soon with a large army, said Parvateshwar and the 300,000 soldiers of Ayodhya will not reach us in time. He has played his cards really well. I do not have a military mind, General, said Brigo, but even I can see that we are in deep trouble. What do you advise? Parvateshwar brought his hands together and rubbed his chin with his index fingers. He looked up at Brigo after some time. If Ganesh decides to enter Meluha from the north, we are finished. There is no way we can defend ourselves against a two-pronged attack. 
Our engineers have been working hard at repairing the road that was ruined by the Yamuna floods. I'll immediately send them instructions to leave the road as it is. If Ganesh chooses to cross from there, then we must make the journey difficult for him. Marching a 150,000 strong army on a washed out road is not going to be easy. Good idea. The Lord Nilkant could be in Devagiri in a matter of weeks. It's a good thing you have engaged the army in training exercises and simulations, said Priku. The Lord will not win here, said Parvateshwar. That is my word to you, Maharishji. I believe you, General. But what do we do about the Vasudev elephants? We cannot win against Shiva's army unless we stop his elephants. What do you think, Shiva? asked Gopal. Gopal, Sati and Kali were with Shiva in his chamber at Mrithikavati, conferring. They were re-evaluating their strategy in the light of the news received from Panini. Kali was clear in her mind. Shiva, I propose that you leave Mrithikavati and sail out to Pareha. If you can convince the Vayuputras to give you a lethal Devi Astra, say the Brahmastra, this war will be as good as over. We cannot actually use these Devi Astras, Your Highness, said Gopal. It will be against the laws of humanity. We can only use such weapons as deterrents to make the other side see sense. Yes, yes, said Kali dismissively. I agree. How long will the journey to Pareha take, Pandaji? asked Shiva. Six months at the minimum, said Gopal. It could take even nine to twelve months if the winds don't favor us. Then the decision is clear, said Shiva. I don't think going to Pareha at this stage makes sense. Why? asked Kali. We have momentum and time on our side, Kali, said Shiva. Ayodhya's army cannot come into Meluha for another six to eight months at least. Ganesh and Karthik can reach the northern frontiers of Meluha within a few weeks. We will have a six-month window with 250,000 soldiers on our side against just 75,000 on the side of Meluha. I like those odds. I say we finish the war here and now. In the time that it will take me to go to Pareha and return, the situation may have become very different. Also, don't forget, all we know is that the Vayuputras are not with Maharishi Bhrigu. That does not necessarily mean that they will choose to be with us. They may well decide to remain neutral. That makes sense, agreed Sati. If we conquer Devagiri and destroy the Somras factory, the war will be over regardless of what the Vayuputras choose to believe. So what do you suggest, Shiva? asked Gopal. We should divide our navy into two parts, said Shiva. I'll move up the Saraswati and then north up the Yamuna with a small sailing force of 25 ships. I'll meet Ganesh and Karthik as they march down the Yamuna road and we'll board their soldiers onto my ships. By sailing, we can get to Devagiri quicker instead of waiting for them to march to the Meluhan capital. In the meantime, Sati will lead the other contingent of the navy, carrying our entire army from Mithikavati up the Saraswati to Devagiri. Sati should leave three weeks after me so that we reach Devagiri around the same time. With 250,000 soldiers besieging Devagiri, they may actually see some sense. Sounds good in theory, said Kali, but coordination may prove to be a problem in practice. There could be delays. If one of our armies reaches Devagiri a few weeks earlier, it may leave them weakened against the Maluhans. But Shiva is not suggesting that we mount an attack and conquer Devagiri as soon as either one of us reaches, said Sati. We would just fortify ourselves and wait for the other. Once we have joined forces, only then should we attack. True, but what if the Maluhans decide to attack? asked Kali. Remember, anchored ships are sitting ducks for devil boats. I don't see them stepping out of the safety of their fort, said Shiva. The army that I will lead will have a hundred and fifty thousand soldiers who have just destroyed the mighty Magadans. The Maluhans will not attack us with only seventy-five thousand soldiers. Sati's army will have a hundred thousand, and don't forget, she will also have the Vasudev elephants. So you see, even our separate armies are capable of taking on the Maluhans on an open field. 
General Parvateshwar has a calm head on his strong shoulders. He will know that it's better for them to remain in the safety of their fort rather than marching out and attacking us. But I get your point, Kali, said Sati. If I reach early, I will encamp some 10 kilometers south of Devagiri. There is a large hill on the banks of the Saraswati which can serve as a superb defensive position since it will give us the advantage of height. I will set up a chakra view formation with our Vasudev elephants as the first line of defense. It will be almost impossible to break through. I know that hill, said Shiva to Sati. That is exactly where I will camp as well if I happen to reach before you do. Perfect. There is no respite from the speed, is there, my lord? Shiva and Parshuram stood on the deck of his lead ship, battling to keep their eyes open against the onslaught of the wind upon a speedily moving object. The fleet was racing up the Saraswati, skeletally staffed as it was, with just 2,000 soldiers, not giving any opportunity for the Meluhans to launch small strikes. While none of the cities on the Saraswati were prepared for naval warfare, since the Meluhans never expected such an attack, Shiva had decided not to tempt fate. The Meluhans were not wanting in honor and courage. As an additional precaution, he had also inducted many of the courageous Naga soldiers into his navy. Kali, the queen of the Nagas, was traveling in the rear guard ship of the convoy. Shiva smiled. No, Parshuram, there will be no respite. Speed is of the essence. In keeping with Shiva's orders, there had been no breaks in the rowing. Four teams had been set up on grueling six-hour shifts. The timekeepers, beating on the drums to set the rhythm for the rowers, maintained it at battle-ramming speed. Shiva did not want to trust the unpredictable winds with determining how fast they moved. In the interest of fairness, Shiva had also added his own name to the roster for rowing duties. His six hours of rowing for the day were to come up soon. It's a beautiful river, my lord said Parshuram. It's sad that we may have to kill it. What do you mean? My lord, I have been researching the Somras. Lord Gopal has explained many things to me and an idea has struck me. What? The Somras cannot be made without this, said Parshuram, pointing to the Saraswati. Praspati tried that, Parshuram. He tried to find some way to make the Saraswati waters unusable. But that didn't work, remember? That's not what I meant, my lord. What if the Saraswati didn't exist? Neither would the Somras, would it? Shiva observed Parshuram closely with inscrutable eyes. My lord, there was a time when the Saraswati, as we know it today, had ceased to exist. The Yamuna had started flowing east towards the Ganga. Saraswati cannot exist without the meeting of the Yamuna and the Satluj. We cannot kill the Saraswati, said Shiva almost to himself. My lord, for all you know, maybe that's what nature was trying to do more than a hundred years ago when an earthquake caused the Yamuna to change its course and flow into the Ganga. If Lord Brahmanayak, the father of the present emperor, had not changed the Yamuna's course to flow back into the Satluj and restore the Saraswati, history would have been very different. Maybe nature was trying to stop the Sobras. Shiva listened silently. We don't have to think the Saraswati would be dead. Its soul would still be flowing in the form of the Yamuna and the Satluj. Only its body would disappear. Shiva stared at the Saraswati waters, perceiving her depths. Parshram had a point, but Shiva didn't want to admit it. Not even to himself. Not yet, anyway. Chapter 29 Every army has a traitor. Any news, Ganesh? asked Bhagirath. Bhagirath and Chandraketu had just joined Ganesh and Karthik on the lead ship. The massive navy was sailing up the Ganga en route to Meluha from the north. Further ahead, they were to take the Ganga Yamana road. They had slowed down only for a few hours to allow a boat to rendezvous with them. The boatman carried a message from a Vasudev Pandit. I've just received word that my father's army has conquered Mritikavati, said Ganesh. Chandraketu was thrilled. That is great news. It is indeed, 
answered Ganesh. And it gets even better. The citizens of Mrithikavati have been won over to my father's side. They have imprisoned what was left of the Meluhan army in the city. And have they discovered the location of the Somras factory? asked Bhagirath. Yes, said Karthik. It's Devagiri. Devagiri? What are you saying? That is so stupid. It's their capital. One would think that the factory would be built in a secure, secret location. But they could have built this factory only within cities with large populations, right? And if so, which city would be better than Devagiri? They must have assumed that they could certainly keep their capital safe. So what are our orders now? asked Chandraketu. The Meluhans have only 75,000 soldiers in Devagiri, said Ganesh. So we're going to launch a coordinated attack. What are the details of the plan? We're to sail up the Ganga and reach the Ganga-Yamuna road. We will then march to Meluha. My father is going to sail up the Yamuna in a fleet to meet us as we march. Together, we will then sail down to Devagiri. My mother, in the meantime, will arrive with the 100,000 soldiers under her command. So, we will have 250,000 soldiers, all fired up with the fervor of recent victories, against 75,000 Meluhans holed up on their platforms, said Bhagirath. I like the odds. That's exactly what Baba must have said, grinned Karthik. You are going to give me the answer I want, growled Vidyun Mali, whether you like it or not. A Vasudev major, captured from Shiva's army, had been tied up on a movable wooden rack with thick leather ropes. The stale air in the dark dungeon was putrid. The captured Vasudev was already drenched in his own sweat, but unafraid. The Maluhan soldiers, standing at a distance, looked at Vidyun Mali warily. What their brigadier was asking them to do was against the laws of Lord Ram. But they were too well trained. Meluhan military training demanded unquestioning obedience to one's commanding officer. This training had forced the soldiers to suppress their misgivings and carry out Vidyun Mali's orders until now. But their moral code was about to be challenged even more strongly. Vidyun Mali heard the Vasudev whispering something again and again. He bent close. Do you have something to say? The Vasudev soldier kept mumbling softly, drawing strength from his words. Jai Guru Vishwamitra, Jai Guru Vashisht, Jai Guru Vishwamitra, Jai Guru Vashisht. Vidyan Mali sniggered. They aren't here to help you, my friend. He turned and beckoned a startled Maluhan soldier. The brigadier pointed at a metallic hammer and a large nail. My lord? whispered the nervous soldier, knowing full well that to attack an unarmed and bound man was against Lord Ram's principles. I'm not sure if we should... It's not your job to be sure, growled Vidyan Mali. That's my job. Your job is to do what I order you to do. Yes, my lord, said the Maluhan, saluting slowly. He picked up the hammer and the nail. He walked slowly to the Vasudev and placed the nail on the captive's arm a few inches above the wrist. He held the hammer back and flexed his shoulders, ready to strike. Vidyan Mali turned to the Vasudev. You'd better start talking. Jai Guru Vishwamitra. Jai Guru Vashisht. Vidyan Mali nodded to the soldier. Jai Guru Vishwamitra. Jai Guru. Ah! The ear-splitting scream from the Vasudev resounded loudly in the confines of the dungeon. But this deep, abandoned underground hellhole, somewhere between Mrithikavati and Devagiri, had not been used in centuries. There was nobody around to hear his screams except for the nervous Meluhan soldiers at the back of the room who kept praying to Lord Ram, begging for his forgiveness. The soldier kept robotically hammering away, pushing the nail deep into the Vasudev's right arm. The Vasudev kept screaming up to a point where his brain simply blocked the pain. He couldn't feel his arm anymore. His heart was pumping madly as blood came out in spurts through the gaping injury. Vedyan Mali approached his ear as the Vasudev breathed heavily, trying to focus on his tribe, on his gods, on his vows, on anything except his right arm. Do you need some more persuasion? asked Vidyan Mali. The Vasudev looked away, focusing his mind on his chant. Vidyan Mali yanked the nail out, took a wet cloth and wiped the Vasudev's arm. 
Then he picked up a small bottle and poured its contents into the wound. It burned deeply, but the Vasudev's blood clotted almost immediately. I don't want you to die, whispered Vidyanmali. At least, not yet. Vidyanmali turned towards his soldier and nodded. My lord, whispered the soldier with tears in his eyes. He had lost count of the number of sins that he was taking upon his soul. Please. Vidyanmali glared. The soldier immediately turned and picked up another bottle. He walked up to the Vasudev and poured some of the viscous liquid into the wounds he had inflicted. Vidyanmali stepped back and returned with a long flint, its edge burning slowly. I hope you see the light after this. The Vasudev's eyes opened wide in terror, but he refused to talk. He knew he couldn't reveal the secret. It would be devastating for his tribe. Fire will purify you, whispered Vidyanmali softly, and you will speak. The dungeon resonated once again with the desperate screams of the Vasudev as the smell of burning flesh defiled the room. Are you sure? asked Parvateshwar. As sure as I can ever be, said a smiling Vidyanmali. Parvateshwar took a deep breath. He knew that it was Shiva who led the massive fleet of ships that had just sped past Devagiri two weeks back. Parvateshwar suspected that Shiva was sailing north to pick up Ganesha's army and bring them back to Devagiri. He had also received reports about the delays faced by Ganesha's army as they marched through the washed-out Ganga Yamuna road. It would probably take a month for Shiva to return to Devagiri along with 150,000 soldiers in Ganesha's army. He also knew that another contingent of the Nilkant's army, being led by Sati, had just sailed out of Mrithikavati. They would reach Devagiri in a week or two. Knowing full well that Ganesh would be delayed, Parvateshwar expected Sati's army to reach Devagiri first. He also knew that this was a force of a hundred thousand soldiers against his own seventy-five thousand. Once Shiva and Ganesh's army sailed in, the strength of the army would rise to two hundred and fifty thousand. Parvateshwar knew that his best chance was to attack Sati's army before Shiva and Ganesh arrived. The only problem was that he had no answer for the unstoppable Vasudev elephant corps under Sati's command until now. Chili and dung? asked Parvateshwar. It just seems so simple. Apparently, the elephants don't like the smell of chili, my lord. It makes them run amok. We should keep dung bricks mixed with chili ready. Burn them and catapult them towards the elephants. The acrid smoke will drive them crazy and hopefully into their own army. There are no elephants to test this on, Vidyanmali. The only way to test this would be in battle. What if this doesn't work? My apologies, General. But do we have any other options? No. Then what's the harm in trying? Parvateshwar nodded and turned to stare at his soldiers practicing the distance. How did you get this information? Vidyanmali was quiet. Parvateshwar returned his gaze to Vidyanmali, his eyes boring into him. Brigadier, I asked you a question. There are traitors in every army, my lord. Parvateshwar was stunned. The famous Vasudev discipline was legendary. You found a Vasudev traitor? Like I said, there are traitors in every army. How do you think I escaped? Parvateshwar turned and looked once again at his soldiers. No harm in trying this tactic. It just might work. Devagiri, the abode of the gods, had become the city of the thoroughly bewildered. Its 200,000 citizens could not recall a time in living memory when an enemy army had gathered the gumption to march up to their city. And yet, here they were, witness to unbelievable occurrences. Just a few weeks earlier, they had seen a large fleet of warships race past their city, rowing furiously up the Saraswati. It was clear that these ships were a part of the Mrithikavati-based Meluhan fleet and that it was now in control of the enemy. Why those enemy ships simply sailed by without attacking Devagiri was a mystery. 
News had also filtered in about a massive army garrisoning itself next to the Saraswati, about 10 kilometers south of the city. The normally secure Devagiri citizens now confined themselves within the walls of the city, not venturing out unless absolutely necessary. Merchants had also halted all their trading activities and their merchant ships remained anchored at the port. Rumors ran rife in the city. Some whispered that the enemy army stationed south of Devagiri was led by the Nilkant himself. Others swore they saw the Nilkant on the warships that had sailed past. However, they couldn't hazard a guess as to where Lord Shiva was headed in such a hurry. Facts had also found their way in from other cities that except for Mrithikavati, this mammoth army had not engaged in battle with any other Maluhan city while sailing up the Saraswati. They had not looted any city or plundered any village, nor had they committed any acts of wanton destruction, but had marched through Meluha with almost hermit-like restraint. Some were beginning to believe that perhaps the purported gossip they had heard was in fact true. The Nilkant was not against Meluha, but only the Somras, that the proclamation they had read many months ago was actually from their lord and not a lie as their emperor had stated. That may be the Nilkant's army waited at the banks of the Saraswati without attacking because the lord himself was negotiating possible terms of surrender with the emperor. But there were also others still loyal to Maluha who refused to believe that their government could have lied. They had good reason to believe that the armies of Shiva comprised the Chandravanshis and the Nagas, that the Naga queen herself was a senior commander in the Nilkant's army and the Nilkant had been misled by the evil combination of the Chandravanshis and Nagas. They were willing to lay down their lives for Maluha. What they didn't understand was why their army was not engaging in battle as yet. Are you sure, General? asked Brigu. Parvateshwar was in Brigu's chamber in the Devagiri royal palace. Yes, it is a gamble, but we have to take it. If we wait too long, the Lord will lead Ganesha's army from the Yamuna to Devagiri. Combined with Sati's army, they will then have a vast numerical advantage and it will be impossible for us to win. Right now, our opponents are only Sati's soldiers who have garrisoned themselves close to the river. They are obviously not looking for a fight. I plan to draw them out and then try to cause some chaos amongst their elephants. If it works, their elephants may just charge back into their own army. They would have no room to retreat with the river right behind them. If everything goes according to plan, we may just win the day. Isn't Sati your goddaughter? asked Brigo, looking deeply into Parvateshwar's eyes. Parvateshwar held his breath. At this point of time, she is only an enemy of Maluha to me. Brigo continued to peer into his eyes, increasingly satisfied with what he read. If you are convinced, General, then so am I. In the name of Lord Ram, attack. Sati couldn't remain holed up on her anchored ships. Ships are unassailable from land when sailing fast but sitting ducks when they are anchored, susceptible to bombardment and devil boat assaults. So, she had decided to garrison herself on land, which would offer protection to her ships as well, by deterring the Maluhans from coming too close to the river banks. She had chosen a good location to dig in her army. It was on a large, gently rolling hill right next to the Saraswati. The trees between the hill and the city of Devagiri had been cut down. Therefore, from the vantage point of the hill, Sati had a clear line of sight of enemy movements at the Devagiri city gates 10 kilometers away. The height of the hill also gave her another advantage. Charging downhill was far easier than advancing uphill, which her enemies would have to do. The elevation also increased the range of her archers significantly. Having occupied the high ground, Sati then opted to assume the most effective of defensive military formations, the Chakravyu. The core of the Chakravyu comprised columns of infantrymen in the tortoise position. The tortoises themselves were protected to the rear by the river and the Saraswati fleet at anchor in the middle of the river. They would provide protection against any Maluhan forces that might attack from the river end. Rowboats had been beached and tied in the river shallows as a contingency for retreating if necessary. 
rows of cavalry, three layers deep, reinforced the core towards the front. Two rows of war elephants formed an impregnable semicircular outer shell, protecting the formations within. The giant Chakraview, comprising 50,000 soldiers, left adequate space between the lines for inner maneuverability and for fortification of the outer shell by the cavalry in case of a breach. All the animals had been outfitted with thin metallic armor, and the soldiers had broad bronze shields to protect against any long-range arrows. It was a near-perfect defensive formation, designed to avoid battle and allow a quick retreat if needed. Sati intended to remain in this formation till she heard from Shiva. Chapter 30 Battle of Devagiri Sati sat on a tall wooden platform that had been constructed for her behind the cavalry line. It gave her a panoramic view of the entire field and the city of Devagiri in the distance. She watched the city where she had spent most of her life, which she had once called home. A nostalgic corner of her heart longed to be able to revel in its quiet, sober efficiency and understated culture. To worship at the temple of Lord Agni, the purifying fire god, a ritual she had adhered to as a vikarma, an ostracized carrier of bad fate. Despite being so close, she couldn't even enter it now to meet her mother. She shook her head. This was no time for sentimentality. She had to focus. Sati checked her horse, which had been tethered to the platform base. Nandi and Virbhadra waited next to the platform, mounted on their stallions. They had been designated her personal bodyguards. Sati knew this would be a difficult period, the time till Shiva returned with Ganesha's army. She had to keep her soldiers in war readiness and yet avoid war. As any general knows, this can sometimes breed restless irritability amongst the troops. Her attention was pulled away as she detected some movement in the far distance. She couldn't believe what she saw. The main gate of the Tamra or bronze platform of Devagiri was being opened. What are they doing? Why would the Maluhans step out into the open? They are outnumbered. Steady, ordered Sati. Everyone remain in their positions. We will not be provoked into launching an attack. Messengers below immediately relayed the orders to all the brigade commanders. It was important for Sati's soldiers to remain in line. As long as they did, it was almost impossible to beat them. It was especially crucial that the elephant line at the periphery of Sati's formation held position. They were the bulwark of her defense. Sati continued to watch the small contingent of Maluhan soldiers marching out of Devagiri, perhaps no more than a brigade. As soon as they were out, the city gates were shut behind them. Is it a suicide squad? For what purpose? The Maluhan soldiers kept marching slowly towards Sati's position. She watched their progress, intrigued. Perched at a height, she soon observed that the soldiers were being followed by carts that were being pulled laboriously by oxen. What do these thousand-foot soldiers hope to achieve? And what is in those carts? As the Maluhans drew close to the hill, she saw that many of the soldiers carried long weapons in their left hands. Archers! She instantly knew what was about to happen as she saw them stop. They even had a strong wind supporting them. The Maluhans had clearly planned for this, for when the winds would work in their favor. She knew the elements well in these parts and realized immediately that her archers would not have the pleasure of giving as much as receiving. Shields! shouted Sati. Incoming arrows! But the archers were too far. They had clearly overestimated the wind. The arrows barely reached Sati's forces. The strong wind, though advantageous for the Maluhans, was not working to Sati's benefit. She couldn't reply to the Maluhan volley of arrows in kind with her own archers. She saw the Maluhans inch closer, lugging ox-drawn carts behind the archers. In all her years, Sati had never seen ox-drawn carts being used in warfare. Sati frowned. What in Lord Ram's name can oxen do against elephants? What is Prithitulia doing? Sati was clear that she did not want to test General Parvateshwar's strategy today. It was admittedly tempting because this small contingent would be wiped out in minutes if she sent her elephants. However, 
She smelt a trap and did not want to leave the high ground. She knew what had to be done. Hold position till Shiva returned. She did not want to fight. Not today. Having moved even closer, the Maluhan archers loaded their arrows again. Shields! ordered Sati. This time, the arrows hit the shields at the right end of Sati's formation. Having tested the rage, the Maluhan archers moved once more. The Maluhans probably have some secret weapon that they are not absolutely sure about. The ox torn carts may have some role to play in it. They want to provoke some of my men into charging at them, so that they can test their weapon. The upshot was obvious. If her army refused to get provoked, no battle would take place. All the animals in her army were well armored. The soldiers had massive shields prepared in defense for the very arrow attack that the Maluhans were attempting right now. Despite two showers of arrows, her army had not suffered a single casualty. There was nothing to gain by breaking formation and nothing to lose by staying in formation. Sati also figured that since the enemy had already come close, ordering her own archers to shoot arrows now may prove counterproductive. The ox-drawn carts were not manned. A volley of arrows may well drive the animals crazy, making them charge in any direction, perhaps even at her own army, along with whatever evil they carried in the carts. She had a better idea. She instructed her messengers to tell a cavalry squad to ride out from behind the hill she was positioned on, thus hiding their movement and go around to an adjoining hill towards the west. She wanted them to launch a flanking attack from behind the crest of that hill, surprise and decimate the Maluhan archers as well as drive the oxen away. All she had to do was wait for the Maluhans to move a little closer to her position. Then she could have them blindsided with her cavalry charge. Sati shouted out her orders once again. Be calm! Hold the line! They cannot hurt us if we remain in formation! The Maluhan archers, having moved closer, arched their bows and fired once again. Shields! Sati's army was ready. Though the arrows reached right up to the center of her army, not one soldier was injured. The Maluhans held their bows to their sides and prepared to draw nearer once again, this time a little tentatively. They're nervous now. They know their plan is not working. What the hell? growled an angry Vasudev elephant rider as he turned to his partner. They're a puny brigade with oxen against our entire army. Why doesn't General Sati allow us to attack? Because she's not a Vasudev, spat out the partner. She doesn't know how to fight. My lords, said the Mahut to the riders. Our orders are to follow the general's orders. The Vasudev turned in irritation to the Mahut. Did I ask you for your opinion? Your order is only to follow my orders. The Mahut immediately fell silent as the distant shout of the brigadier's herald came through. Shields! Another volley of arrows. Again, no casualties. Enough of this nonsense! barked one of the elephant riders. We're Kshatriyas! We're not supposed to cower like cowardly Brahmins! We're supposed to fight! Sati saw a few elephants on the far right of her formation, the ones that were closest to the Maluhan Brigade, begin to rumble out. Hold the line! shouted Sati. Nobody will break formation! The messengers carried forward the orders to the other end of the field immediately. The elephants were pulled back into formation by their mahouts. Nandi! said Sati, looking down. Ride out at the end and tell those idiots to remain in formation. Yes, my lady, said Nandi, saluting. Wait, said Sati, as she saw the Maluhan archers loading another set of arrows. Wait out this folly and then go. The order of shields was relayed once again and the arrows clanged harmlessly against the raised barriers. None of Sati's soldiers were injured. As Sati put her shield down and looked up, she was horrified. Twenty elephants on the right had charged out recklessly. The fools! yelled Sati as she jumped onto her horse from the platform. She galloped forward to cover the breach opened up by the recklessly charging elephants, closely followed by Veerbhadra and Nandi. While passing by the cavalry line, she ordered the reserve cavalry to follow her. Within a few minutes, Sati had stationed herself in the position left open by the Vasudev elephants that had charged out of formation. Stay here! Sati ordered the soldiers behind her as she raised her hand. She could see her elephants sprinting forward in the distance, goaded on by their mahouts bellowing loudly. 
the Maluhan archers stood their ground bravely and shot another round. The order resonated through Sati's army. Shields! The Vasudev elephant riders screamed loudly as they crashed into the archers. Jai Shri Ram! The elephants swung their powerful trunks, tied to which were strong metallic balls. Maluhan soldiers were flung far and wide with the powerful swings. The few who remained were crushed under giant feet. Within just a few moments of this butchery, the archers began retreating. Though it appeared as if the twenty Vasudev elephants were smashing the Maluhan archers to bits, Sati shuddered with foreboding as she felt a chill run down her spine. She screamed loudly even though she knew that the elephant riders couldn't hear her. Come back, you fools! The Vasudev elephant riders, though, were on a roll. Encouraged by the easy victory, they goaded their mahouts to keep the elephants moving forward. Charge! The elephant riders primed their main weapon, pulling the levers and the flamethrowers. Long, spear-like flames burst forth from the howdahs. The riders positioned the weapon, aiming for maximum effect as they crashed into the next line of Maluhans. The elephants continued dashing forward, seeing the ox-drawn carts further ahead. And then, the tide turned. The retreating Maluhan archers spun around with arrows that had been set on fire, aiming straight for their own carts. The dry and volatile dung cakes on the carts had been mixed with chili and caught fire immediately. The startled oxen, sensing the blaze somewhere behind them, ran forward in panic towards the advancing elephants. It was the Mahouts who had the first inkling that something was wrong. Attuned deeply to the beasts, they could sense their innate distress. Goaded on by the fiery elephant riders behind them though, they continued to press their elephants ahead. Soon, the contents of the carts were completely aflame, letting out a thick, acrid smoke. But the elephant riders were too committed to the charge. They rode straight into the blinding smoke. As soon as the smoke hit them, the elephants shrieked desperately. The Mahut recognized the smell. Chili! Retreat! screamed a Mahut. No! shouted back a belligerent elephant rider. We have them! Crush the oxen! Move forward! But the elephants were already in a state of frenzied panic. They turned from the source of their discomfort and ran. The hysterical oxen, with the fires burning hard on the carts, continued their frantic sprint forward as though to elude the blaze. Sati could see the developing situation unfolding from the distance. Whatever the oxen were carrying was making the pachyderms hysterical. Within a matter of a few minutes, the oxen would reach her remaining outer elephant line and spread the panic deep into her force. She saw a fire arrow being shot from the gates of Devagiri as they opened once again. The Meluhans could see their strategy was working and were committing themselves to a full attack. Her worst fears were confirmed as she saw the Maluhan cavalry thunder out of the Devagiri gates. The city was 10 kilometers away and she knew she had the luxury of some time before they reached her position. Her immediate concern was the oncoming oxen that could make all the Vasudev elephants charge madly back into her own force. Turning back, she shouted out to her herald, Tell the lines at the back to retreat to the boats, now! She ordered the remaining elephant line to disband and escape southwards immediately. If the ox-driven carts reached the end of the lumbering animals and managed to spread panic amongst the hundreds of elephants under her command, her army would get destroyed completely by her own pachyderms. She then ordered her cavalry forward. Charge at the beasts moving towards us. We have to deflect them onto a different path. We need time for our soldiers to retreat. Her cavalry drew their swords and roared. Har Har Mahadev! Har Har Mahadev! bellowed Sati as she drew her sword and charged forward. Sati's skilled cavalry kept up a steady volley of arrows as they drew near the elephants and oxen. While this did deflect many of the oxen away from Sati's army, the elephants continued their headlong charge. Many of the elephant howdahs had transformed into hell holes, emitting fire continuously. The shocked elephant riders, sitting atop the berserk animals, had fallen on some of their flamethrowers, breaking the levers. Moments later, Sati's cavalry fearlessly charged headlong into her retreating elephants, riding expertly to avoid the wildly swinging trunks and metallic balls. They needed to bring their own elephants down. This required riding up close from behind and slashing the beast's hamstrings, thus making their rear legs collapse. But this was easier said than done, 
with the malfunctioning flamethrower spewing a continuous stream of fire. Sati bravely led her section of the cavalry in pursuit of the task at hand. Since there were only 20 elephants, they were brought down quickly. But not before many of the cavalrymen had lost their lives, some crushed, many burnt by the flamethrowers. Sati herself had had her face scorched on one side. In the meantime, the rest of Sati's cavalry had managed to redirect all the charging oxen through the skilled use of spears and arrows. The bulls were still charging, panic-stricken with the burning carts tethered to them, but to the west and safely away from the rest of Sati's elephant corps. Sati looked back to the east, where many of her foot soldiers were already sailing out to the safety of the ships. Her cautious planning had ensured that a large number of rowboats had been kept ready for just such an eventuality. But this would prove to be a minor victory before absolute disaster. The Maluhan cavalry had been riding hard towards the battlefield, making good time. And as the oxen stampeded away, the Maluhan riders charged into Sati's cavalry. Swords clashed. Sati's cavalry had numbered 3,000 riders and was evenly matched with the Maluhans. But her riders had just emerged from a bruising encounter with the panic-stricken elephants and oxen. Their numbers had come down and their strength was already sapped. However, Sati knew that retreat was not an option. She had to battle on for a little longer so that all her foot soldiers could get away to the safety of the ships. Then Sati heard the sounds of the elephants once again. She killed the Maluhan in front of her and looked behind. Lord Ram, be merciful! Some of the elephant corps that she had ordered south were now thundering back. The elephants were trumpeting desperately with fire spewing in all directions. The Mahuts had already fallen off, leaving the animals totally out of control. Behind the elephants were charging oxen with burning carts tethered to them. The Meluhans had, in a brilliant strategic move ordered by Parvateshwar, kept another core of ox-driven carts laden with chili-laced dung cakes to the south of Sati's position. These carts had slipped out of Devagiri the previous evening, disguised as agricultural produce transport. Since Sati had not besieged the city, but only camped close to it, they only attacked armament transport and let non-lethal materials travel freely in and out of Devagiri. The reason was very obvious. A full siege would have committed too many soldiers and possibly even provoked a battle. Sati had wanted to avoid that. Little did Sati's Chandravanshi scouts realize that even dung and agricultural produce could be lethal for them. As the elephants had charged towards these carts, they had also been set on fire. And, as expected, these retreating elephants turned around in alarm and charged back into the battlefield. Sati was in a bind, the Maluhan cavalry was in front and a huge horde of charging, panic-stricken elephants spewing fire was behind her. Retreat! yelled Sati. Her cavalry disengaged and galloped towards the river. Fortunately for them, the Maluhan cavalry did not give chase. Alarmed by the sight of the terrified elephants speeding towards them, they turned around and rode towards the safety of their own walls. Many among Sati's horsemen were trampled or burned down by the rampaging elephants. Some of the riders managed to reach the river and rode into the waters without a second's hesitation. The horses swam desperately towards the ships, carrying their riders with them to safety. Many, though, sank into the Saraswati under the weight of their light armor. Sati, Virbhadra and Nandi were among the lucky few who managed to reach the vessels. While most of the foot soldiers had been saved, the elephant and cavalry corps had been decimated. Memories of the elephant's killer blows in the battle of Mrithikavati were quickly forgotten as the magnitude of the disaster the animals had wreaked sank in. Chinardwaj, who was in charge of the ships, quickly ordered that they retreat as soon as the last of the surviving soldiers was on board. Without the protection of the land army, their stationary navy was a sitting duck for further attacks. Chapter 31 Stalemate Absolute decimation, crowed Vidyan Mali. We should now chase those imbeciles and finish off what's left of the fraud's army. They should learn that nobody invades our fair motherland. 
Vidyanmalai had joined Daksh, Brigu, Parvateshwar and Kanahala in the Emperor's private office. Though brigadiers did not normally participate in strategy meetings, Daksh had insisted that he be allowed to attend, keeping in mind his sterling role in providing the information about the elephants. Parvateshwar raised his hand to silence Vidyanmali. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, Vidyanmali. Remember, Sati's tactics under pressure were exceptional. She managed to save most of her army. So it's not as if we'll have a huge numerical advantage if we chase them. Vidyanmali fumed silently, keeping his eyes pinned on the floor. Praise for a rifle general? What is wrong with Lord Parvateshwar? She may have been a Meluhan princess once, but now she's a sworn enemy of our motherland. And we should not forget, said Kanakla, that the Nilkant is sailing down from the north with a large army. The safest place for our army right now is within these fort walls. Nilkant? fumed Vidyanmali silently, unwilling to argue openly with senior officers of the empire. He's not the Nilkant, he's our enemy, and our army should be fighting, not keeping itself safe behind high walls. Kanakla is right, said Daksha. We should keep our army here and attack that fraud Nilkant the moment his ships dock. That coward left my daughter to fight alone while he went gallivanting up the Yamuna. He should pay for his cowardice. Vidyanmali couldn't believe what he was hearing. Does anyone here put Meluha's interests above all else? Let's worry about Meluha instead of Princess Sati and her husband's duties towards her, said Brigu. Lord Parvateshwar is right. We have won a great victory. But we should measure our next steps carefully. What do you suggest, General? My Lord, we have taken out their elephant corps and cavalry, said Parvateshwar. Sati's army is in retreat. Hence, I do not expect the Nilgar to stop and attack us here. Of course he won't, quipped Daksh. He's a coward. Your Highness, said Brigo, barely hiding his irritation. The Maharishi turned towards Parvateshwar. Why won't he stop here, General? My scouts have sent back confirmations of our earlier estimates of Ganesha's army, said Parvateshwar. They do have 150,000 soldiers. That is a big army, but it's not enough to defeat our forces if we remain within our fort walls, given that Sati's forces are no longer available to augment them. And from our defensive positions, we can slowly wear his army down. Therefore, the Nilgant will not want to commit to a long siege here. He'll gain nothing and will unnecessarily lose men. So what do you think he will do? He will sail past Devagiri and join with Sati's army, perhaps in Mritikavati or Lothal. Then we should attack their ships, interrupted Daksh. That will be difficult, Your Highness, said Parvateshwar. Their ships are sailing downriver. We'll have to march on road since there are no warships on the Saraswati under our control. They will have the advantage of speed. We will not be able to catch up. So where should we attack them? asked Brigo. If we have to attack them, I would prefer to do so at Mrithikavati. Why? Lothal is not a good idea. I have designed the defenses of Lothal myself, and sacrificing false modesty, I will say that those defenses are solid. We would need a 10 to 1 advantage in soldiers to conquer Lothal. We don't have that. We will be pitting 80,000 of our men against more than 200,000 of the joint Sati Ganesh army. Attacking Lothal will be a disaster for us. We will lose too many men. On the other hand, Mrithikaviti's defenses do not require that kind of numerical advantage. Also, we have 20,000 of our own soldiers within Mrithikaviti. I agree they may be imprisoned, but if they find out that their brother Maluhan soldiers are besieging the city, they may create a lot of trouble for the Lord from within. Having said that, I would expect the Lord to retreat to Lothal and not Mrithikavati for this very reason. Brigu had an inkling that Parvateshwar preferred an altogether different strategy. I get the feeling that he would choose to not attack at all. Not attack at all? asked a surprised Daksh. Why not? Our army has tasted victory. Parvateshwar, you should... Your Highness, interrupted Brigo. Perhaps we should leave it to an expert like Lord Parvateshwar to suggest what we should do. Go on, General.
The reason I suggest we avoid aggression right now is that the Lord Nilkant would hope that we attack, said Parvateshwar. One cannot attack a well-defended fort without the advantage of numbers. We don't have that. So by attacking them, we'll gain nothing and lose too many men. So I say that we stay within the safe walls of Devagiri. If we wait for six more months, Ayodhya's army will get here. Combined with their 300,000 soldiers, we will have a huge numerical advantage over the Lord's army. So are you suggesting that we just sit around like cowards? Asked Daksh. It would not be cowardly to refrain from attacking when the situation is not in our favor, said Brigu, before turning back to Parvateshwar. Go on, General. Once Ayodhya's troops come in, we should march to Karachapa, said Parvateshwar. We still have control over the Indus command of our navy. Along with Ayodhya's soldiers, we will have a 400,000 strong army. Combine that with a vastly superior naval fleet that we have in the Indus, and we can mount a very solid attack on Lothal. What you are saying appears to make sense, said Brigu, before turning to Daksh. I suggest that we follow Lord Parvateshwar's strategy, Your Highness. Daksh immediately nodded his assent. But Vidyanmali could guess that the Emperor's heart was not in this decision. He wondered if there was an opportunity for him to convince the Emperor of a more aggressive course of action. The stunned army of Ganesh was transfixed by the devastation on the hilly battlefield south of Devagiri as they sailed down the Saraswati. Bloated carcasses of elephants and horses littered the hill, flies buzzing around them. Crows and vultures fought viciously over the beasts in trails, even though there were enough corpses around for them all. The squawking and cawing of the feasting birds added pathos to the macabre scene. Of particular interest to the soldiers, though, was the fact that there were no human dead bodies on the battlefield. The Meluhan, true to their honorable traditions, had in all likelihood conducted funeral ceremonies for all their enemy warriors. Also, they noticed that there was no debris in the Saraswati. That meant Sati's ships had escaped the devastation, hopefully with most of her army intact. Shiva stood on the deck of the lead ship, surveying the battlefield along with his sons and sister-in-law. He knew that he couldn't stop now and engage in a battle at Devagiri. He simply didn't have the strength of numbers anymore. He had to retreat further south and find what was left of Sati's army. His scouts had already told him that the devastation looked worse than it actually must have been. Most of the infantrymen in Sati's army had survived and her ships were sailing south to safety. Shiva knew that with much of Sati's army intact, he still had a fighting chance in the war, but he would have to reformulate his strategy. All that was for later though. His mind was seized for the moment with one thought alone. Was his Sati all right? Was she hurt? Was she alive? Nilkant, said Gopal, brushing up to Shiva. He had just received word from a Vasudev Pandit envoy who was hiding on the eastern bank of the Saraswati waiting for Shiva's ships to arrive. Lady Sati was still alive when she was pulled aboard one of the retreating ships. Still alive? What do you mean? She was badly injured, Shiva. She personally led the cavalry against the rampaging elephants and Meluha's own horsemen. Nandi and Virbhadra managed to pull her to safety. She was unconscious by the time she reached the ship. Unfortunately, the man I talked to didn't have any further information. Shiva made his decision immediately. He knew that his naval formation would only be able to sail as quickly as the slowest ship. He couldn't wait that long. Ganesh, I'm taking the fastest ship and sailing down south. I have to find your mother's ship. Kali, Karthik and you will remain with the fleet. Avoid all battles, sail as quickly as you can and meet me at Mrithikavati. Ganesh and Karthik stood mute, sick with worry about their mother. She's alive, said Shiva, holding his son's shoulders. I know she's alive. She cannot die without me. Shiva's ship had raced down the Saraswati and caught up with Sati's retreating fleet. He had clambered aboard his wife's ship to discover that his Sati was out of danger now.
but still bedridden. However, this relief was accompanied by some terrible news received from a Vasudev Pandit. Reports of the devastation of Sati's army in Devagiri had given the Maluhan prisoners of war in Vithikavati the courage to challenge their citizen captors. They had broken out of their prison and taken control of the city. 3,000 citizens loyal to the Nilkhand had died in the process. Shiva had no choice but to avoid Mrithikavati for now as it was no longer safe for his army. He decided to sail down another distributary of the Saraswati and then retreat to Lothal. Orders had been conveyed through a Vasudev Pandit to Ganesha's army as well. For the moment though, Shiva remained on Sati's ship as it sailed down the Saraswati. Having checked on the naval movements with the captain, Shiva descended to Sati's cabin. Ayurvati sat by her bedside, applying soothing herbs on Sati's burnt face. Quickly and efficiently, she tied a bandage of neem leaves. This will ensure that your wound doesn't get infected. Sati nodded politely. Thank you, Ayurvati ji. Also, continued Ayurvati, thinking Sati may be concerned about the ugly mark which covered nearly a quarter of her face. Don't worry about the scar. Whenever you're ready, I will perform a cosmetic surgery to smoothen out your skin. Sati nodded, her lips burst tight. Ayurvati looked at Shiva and then back at Sati. Take care, my child. Thank you once again, Ayurvati ji, said Sati, unable to smile due to the scar tissue forming on her face. Ayurvati quickly walked out of the cabin. Shiva went down on his knees and held her hand. I'm sorry, Shiva. I failed you. Please stop saying that again and again, said Shiva. I've been told about the way our elephants reacted to the burning chili. It's a miracle that you managed to save as many of our people as you did. You are just being kind because I'm your wife. We have lost our elephant corps and most of our cavalry. This is a disaster. Why are you so hard on yourself? What happened at Devagiri was not your fault. We'd lost our elephant corps the moment the Maluhans discovered. The smoke from burning chilies sends them into a state of panic. But I should have withdrawn earlier. You withdrew as soon as you saw the effect on the elephants. You had no choice but to go in with the cavalry. Otherwise, our soldiers would have got massacred. Practically, our entire army is still intact. You did a great job to ensure that we didn't suffer even higher casualties. Sati looked away unhappily, still feeling terribly guilty. Shiva touched her forehead gently. Sweetheart, listen to me. Leave me alone for a while, Shiva. Sati. Shiva, please. Please leave me alone. Shiva kissed Sati gently. It's not your fault. There are usually enough tragedies in life that we are genuinely responsible for. Feel guilty about them, for sure. But there is no point in burdening your heart with guilt over events that are not your fault. Sati turned towards Shiva with a tortured expression. And what about you, Shiva? Do you really think a six-year-old child could have done anything to save that woman at Kailash? It was Shiva's turn to be silent. The honest answer is no, said Sati. And yet, you carry that guilt, don't you? Why? Because you expected more from yourself. Shiva's eyes welled up with the agony of that childhood memory. There wasn't a day in his life when he didn't silently apologize to that woman he hadn't been able to save. The woman he hadn't even tried to save. I expected more from myself as well, said Sati, her eyes moist. They empathized with each other in a silent embrace. Shiva and Sati's convoy of ships had just reached the last navigable point on this distributary of the Saraswati. From here on, the river was too shallow for the ships. Even further, the Saraswati ran dry on land itself, unable to push through to the sea. Shiva had avoided the distributary which led to Mritikavati. He was on the southernmost part of the inland mouth of the Saraswati. From here on, his army would march to the frontier stronghold of Lothal. Leaving the empty ships behind was fraught with risk. It was only a matter of time before the Maluhans would get to know about it. Shiva would, in effect, be handing over 25 well-fitted military ships back to the Maluhans, which would allow them to move their army up and down the Saraswati with frightening speed. 
the decision was obvious. The ships had to be destroyed. Once his entire army had disembarked and the caravan that would march on to Lothal had been readied, Shiva gave orders for the ships to be burned. Fortunately, there had been a break in the rains which had arrived early this year, allowing the fire to consume the ships quickly. Shiva stood observing the massive flames. He didn't hear Gopal and Chinardwaj as they stepped up to him. Lord Agni consumes things rapidly, said Gopal. Shiva looked at Gopal before turning back to the burning ships. We have no choice, Pandaji. No, we don't. What do you suggest we do, Pandaji? asked Shiva. The rainy season is here, said Gopal. It will be difficult to mount a campaign to attack Devagiri any time soon. Even if we could, without the advantage of our cavalry, it is unlikely that we will be able to conquer a well-designed citadel like Devagiri. But it will be difficult for them to attack us in Lothal as well, said Shiva. Lothal, in fact, is better designed for defense than even Devagiri. True, said Gopal. So, it is a stalemate, which suits the Meluhans just fine, since all they will have to do is wait for the Ayodhyan forces to reach Meluha. They could be here in as little as six months. Silently, Shiva gazed at the burning ships, contemplating this unhappy turn of events. Chinardhwaj spoke up. I have a suggestion, my lord. Shiva turned to Chinardhwaj with a frown. We can draw up a crack force of Nagas and my troops, said Chinardhwaj. The commandos will attack the Somra's factory stealthily. It will be a suicide mission, but we will destroy it. No, said Shiva. Why, my lord? Because Parvateshwar will certainly be prepared for that. He's not an idiot. It will be a suicide mission, all right but not a successful one. There is one other way, whispered Gopal. The Vayuputras? asked Shiva. Yes. Shiva looked back at the burning ships, his expression inscrutable. The Vayuputras appear to be the only recourse now. Chapter 32 The Last Resort Shiva had pulled a light cloth over his head and wrapped it around his face, leaving his eyes open. His angavastram was draped across his muscular torso, affording protection from the fine drizzle. Sati lay in a covered cart as oxen pulled it gently. She was strong enough to walk now, but Ayurvati had insisted on exercising abundant caution during the march to Lathal. Shiva parted the curtains on the cart and looked at his sleeping wife. He smiled and drew the curtain shut again. He kicked his horse into a canter. Pandaji, said Shiva, slowing his horse down as he approached Gopal. About the Vayuputras. Yes? What is that terrible weapon that they possess that Kali spoke of? The Brahmastra, asked Gopal, referring to the fearsome weapon of Brahma. Yes. How is it different from the other Deviastras? asked Shiva, for he didn't understand how a Brahmastra was so much more terrible than any other divine weapons. Most Deviastras only kill men, but there are some, like the Brahmastra, that can destroy entire cities, if not kingdoms. By the holy lake, how can one weapon do that? The Brahmastra is the weapon of absolute destruction, my friend a destroyer of cities and a mass killer of men. When fired on some terrain, a giant mushroom cloud will rise high enough to touch the heavens. Everyone and everything in the targeted place would be instantly vaporized. Beyond this inner circle of destruction will be those who are unfortunate enough to survive, for they will suffer for generations. The water in the land will be poisoned for decades the land will be unusable for centuries. No crops will grow on it. This weapon doesn't just kill once. It kills again and again for centuries after it has been used. And people actually contemplate using a weapon such as this? asked a horrified Shiva. Pandaji, using such a dreadful weapon is against the laws of humanity. Precisely, great Nilkant. A weapon like this 
can never actually be used. The mere knowledge that one's enemy has this weapon can strike terror in one's heart. No matter what the odds, one will surrender. One cannot win against the Brahmastra. Do you think the Vayuputras will give this weapon to me? Or am I being too presumptuous? After all, I'm not one of them. They think I'm a fraud, don't they? I can think of two reasons why they might help us. First, they have not tried to assassinate you, which they would have had a majority of them believed that you were a fraud. Maybe a strong constituency amongst them still respects your uncle, Lord Monobu. And the second? Lord Brigu used Devi Astras in his attack on Panchavati. It was not the Brahmastra, but it was a Devi Astra nonetheless. Even if it was fabricated from Lord Brigu's own material, he broke Lord Rudra's laws by actually using one. That, I suspect, would have turned the Vayuputras virulently against him. And an enemy's enemy is a friend, said Shiva, completing Gopal's statement. But I'm not sure these are reasons enough. We don't have any other choice, my friend. Perhaps. How do we get to the land of the Vayuputras? Pariha is at a substantial distance towards our west. We can march overland through the great mountains to get there. But that is risky and time-consuming. The other option is to take the sea route. But we will have to wait for the northeasterly winds. The northeasterlies? But they begin only when the rains stop. We will have to wait for one or two months. Yes, we will have to. I have an idea. I'm sure the Maluhans will set up spies and scouts in and around Lothal once they know that we have retreated into the city. So, if we take the conventional route to Parya, they will know that I have sailed west. Lord Brigu may guess that I've gone to the Vayuputras to seek help, which may encourage him to send assassins in pursuit. How about sailing north in a small convoy of military ships? Gopal immediately understood. We'll make them think that we're going to the Narmada, onwards perhaps to either Ujjain or Panchavati. Exactly, said Shiva. We could disembark from our military ships at a secret location and then set sail in a nondescript merchant ship to Pareha. Brilliant. The Maluhans can keep searching for you along the Narmada while we are on our way to Pareha. Right. And if we use just one merchant ship, instead of an entire convoy, we could keep the voyage secretive and be quick. Right again. Sati stood at a window in a lookout shelter on the southern edge of Lothal Fort, staring at the vast expanse of sea beyond its walls. The monsoon had arrived in earnest and heavy rain was pelting the city. Shiva and his army were well fortified within the city walls. Ganesh was expected to arrive in Lothal within a week or two, along with his force. Ayurvati rushed into the shelter with a loud whoop, propping her cane and cloth umbrella beside the entrance. Lord Indra and Lord Varun be praised! They have decided to deliver the entire quota of this year's rain in a single day! Sati turned towards Ayurvati with a worn look. Ayurvati sat next to her and squeezed the end of her drenched Angavastaram. I love the rain. It seems to wash away sorrows and bring new life with renewed hope, doesn't it? Sati nodded politely, not really interested. Yes, you are right, Ayurvati ji. Not one to give up, Ayurvati plodded on, determined to lighten Sati's mood. I'm quite free right now. There aren't too many injured and the monsoon diseases have, surprisingly, been very low this year. That is good news, Ayurvati ji, said Sati. Yes, it is. So, I was thinking that this would be a good time to do your surgery. Sati's face carried an ugly blemish on her left cheek, where scar tissue had formed over the remains of the burns she had suffered during the battle of Devagiri. There's nothing wrong with me, said Sati politely. Of course there isn't. I was only referring to the scar on your face. It can be removed very easily through cosmetic surgery. No, I don't want any surgery. Ayurvati assumed that Sati was worried about the long recovery time and the possible impact on her ability to participate in the next battle. But it's a very simple procedure, Sati. You will recover in a couple of weeks. 
We seem to be in for a good monsoon this year. This means there will be no warfare for a few months. You will not miss any battle. Nothing would keep me away from the next battle. Then why don't you want me to do this surgery, my child? I'm sure it would make the Lord Nilkant happy. A hint of a smile escaped her solemn demeanor. Shiva keeps telling me I'm as beautiful as ever, scar or no scar. I know I look horrendous. He's lying because he loves me. But I choose to believe it. Why are you doing this? asked an anguished Ayurvati. It won't hurt you at all. Not that you're scared of pain. No, Ayurvati ji. But why? You have to give me a reason. Because I need this scar, said Sati grimly. Ayurvati paused for a moment. Why? It constantly reminds me of my failure. I will not rest till I have set it right and recovered the ground that I lost for my army. Sati, it wasn't your fault that... Ayurvati ji, said Sati, interrupting the former chief surgeon of Maluha. You of all people should not tell me a white lie. I was the commanding officer and my army was defeated. It was my fault. Sati, this scar stays with me. Every time I look at my reflection, it will remind me that I have work to do. Let me win a battle for my army and then we can do the surgery. Dada, whispered Kartik, gently placing his hand on his angry brother's arm. Ganesha's army had just arrived at Lothal. They too had avoided Mritikavati as advised by a Vasudev Pandit. Just like Shiva, Ganesha had ensured that all his ships were destroyed on the Saraswati before his army marched south. They were received at the gates of Lothal by Governor Chinardwaj. Ganesh and Karthik had wanted to meet their parents immediately, but were informed by Chinardwaj that Shiva wanted to meet them beforehand. Shiva wanted to prepare them for their first meeting with their mother after her defeat at the Battle of Devagiri. Meanwhile, the allies of the Nilkant, Bhagirath, the Prince of Ayodhya, Chandraketu, the King of Branga, and Matali, the King of Vaishali, were led to their respective chambers in the Lothal governor's residence by protocol officers. Chichandavanshi royalty, used to the pomp and pageantry of their own land, were distinctly underwhelmed by the austere arrangements of the Meluhan accommodation. It was difficult to believe that the governor of one of the richest provinces of the richest empire in the world lived in such simplicity. However, they accepted their housing with good grace, knowing it was the will of Shiva. The army was accommodated in guest houses and temporary shelters erected within the city. It was a tribute to the robust urban planning of Meluha that such a large number of new arrivals could be so quickly accommodated in reasonable comfort. All in all, a massive army, now totaling nearly 250,000 soldiers, had set up residence in Lothal. Having been briefed by Shiva, Ganesh and Karthik rushed to meet their mother. They had been told about the nature of her injuries. Shiva did not want the brothers to inadvertently upset her further. While Karthik was, as instructed by Shiva, able to control his anger and shock, Ganesha's obsessive love for his mother did not allow him that ability. Ganesh clenched his fists, staring at his mother's disfigured face. He gritted his teeth and breathed rapidly, his normally calm eyes blazing. His long nose was stretched out, trembling in anger. Ganesh growled, I will kill every single one of those b- Ganesh, said Sati calmly, interrupting her son. The Maluhan soldiers were only doing their duty, as was I. They have done nothing wrong. Ganesh's silence was unable to camouflage his fury. Ganesh, these things happen in a war, you know that. Dada, Ma is right, said Karthik. Sati stepped close and embraced her elder son. She pulled his face down and kissed his forehead, smiling lovingly. Calm down, Ganesh. Karthik held his mother and brother as well. Dada, battle scars are a mark of pride for a warrior. Ganesh held his mother tight, tears streaming down his face. You're not entering a battlefield again, Ma. Not unless I'm standing in front of you. Sati smiled feebly and patted Ganesh on his back.
Shiva walked into a suite of rooms in the governor's residence at Lothal. Sati had moved some of the furniture to create a training circle and was practicing her sword movements. Shiva leaned against a wall and observed his wife quietly so as not to disturb her. He admired every perfect warrior move, the sway of her hips as she transferred her weight, the quick thrusts and swings of her sword, the rapid movement of her shield, which she used almost like an independent weapon. Shiva breathed deeply at yet another reminder of why he loved her so much. Sati swung around with a shield held high as her eyes fell on Shiva. For how long have you been watching? She asked, surprised. Long enough to know that I should never challenge you to a duel. Sati smiled slightly, not saying anything. She quickly sheathed her sword and put her shield down. Shiva stepped over and helped untie her scabbard. Thank you, whispered Sati as she took the scabbard from Shiva, walked up to the mini armory and placed her shield and sheathed sword. We will not be able to go to Pariha together, said Shiva. I know, said Sati. I was told by Gopalji that Parihans only allow Vayuputras and Vasudevs to enter their domain. I am neither. Well, technically, nor am I. Sati pulled her angvastram over her head so as to cover her left cheek. She held the hem of the cloth between her teeth, covering her facial scar. But you are the Nilkant. Rules can be broken for you. Shiva came forward and pulled Sati close with one hand. With the other, he held the angvastram covering her face and tried to pull it back. Even though she knew he did not care, Sati liked to hide her scar from Shiva. It didn't matter to her if others saw it, but not Shiva. Shiva, whispered Sati, holding her angvastram close. Shiva tugged hard and pulled the angvastram free from her mouth. An upset Sati tried to yank it back, but Shiva managed to overpower her, holding her close. I wish you could see through my eyes, whispered Shiva, so you could see your own ethereal beauty. Sati rolled her eyes and turned away, still struggling within Shiva's grip. I'm ugly, I know it. Don't use your love to insult me. Love? asked Shiva, pretending mock surprise, wiggling his eyebrows. Who said anything about love? It's lust, pure and simple. Sati stared at Shiva, her eyes wide. Then she burst out laughing. Shiva pulled her close again, grinning. This is no laughing matter, my princess. I am your husband. I have rights, you know. Sati continued to laugh as she hit Shiva playfully on his chest. Shiva kissed her tenderly. I love you. You're mad. That I am, but I still love you. Chapter 33 The Conspiracy Deepens Brilliant idea, Your Highness, said Vidyunmali. Daksha sat in his private office with his new confidant, Vidyunmali. The Maluhan brigadier's increasing frustration with Parvateshwar's cautious approach had forged a new alliance. According to Vidyunmali, this wait-and-watch strategy of General Parvateshwar was giving Shiva's army time to recover from its defeat at Devagiri. He had begun to spend more and more time with the Emperor. Daksha had got him reassigned to head a brigade of a thousand soldiers that guarded the Emperor, his family and his palace. This gave him a simple advantage. The brigade could carry out personal missions mandated by the Emperor. Sensing increasing comfort in the relationship, Daksha had finally confided in him about his idea to end the war. Much to Daksha's delight, Vidyanmali's reaction was very different from Bregu's. Exactly! exclaimed a happy Daksh. I don't know why the others don't understand. Your Highness, you are the Emperor, said Vidyanmali. It doesn't matter if the others don't agree. If you have decided to go ahead, then that is the will of Miluha. You really think we should go ahead? It doesn't matter what I think, Your Highness. What do you think? I think it's brilliant. Then that is what Miluha thinks as well, my lord. I think we should implement it. What are your orders for me, my lord? I haven't worked out the details, Brigadier, said Daksh. You will need to think it through. My job is to look at the big picture. Of course, said Vidyanmali. My apologies, Your Highness. But I don't think we can execute our plan 
till the Maharishi and the general leave Devagiri. They may try to stop us if they get a slightest whiff of our intentions. They were planning to leave for Karachappa, or at least that was Parvateshwar's latest plan. I was not supportive of the idea earlier, but now I will encourage it and hasten their departure. An inspired move, Your Highness. But we must also concentrate on getting the right assassins. I agree. But where do we find them? They must be foreigners, Your Highness. We do not want them recognized. They will be wearing cloaks and masks, of course. You want them to look like Nagas, right? Yes, of course. I know some people. They are the best in the business. Where are they from? Egypt. By the great Lord Varun, that's too far. It will take too much time for them to get here. I will leave immediately, Your Highness. That is, if I have your permission. Of course you have it. Accomplish this, Vidyun Mali, and Meluha will sing your praises for centuries. Lord Gopal and I will leave within a week, said Shiva. Shiva and Gopal sat in the governor's office, surrounded by Sati, Kali, Ganesh, Kartik, Bhagirath, Chinadhwaj, Chandraketu and Matali. The monsoons were drawing to an end, light smatterings of rain appearing occasionally, as if to bid farewell. Shiva and Gopal had decided to travel south, as planned, in their small convoy of military ships. They intended to rendezvous with a merchant ship at a secret location north of the Narmada Delta. The southwesterly winds would have receded by the time and the rains would have stopped. They would then board the merchant ship and use the northeasterly winds to set sail towards the west in the direction of Pareha. With luck, the deception would work and the Maluhans would be unaware of Shiva's actual destination. I want our destination to be kept secret, continued Shiva. Victory is assured if our mission succeeds. What are you planning to do, my lord? asked Bhagirath. Leave that to me, my friend, said Shiva cryptically. In my absence, Sati will be in command. Everyone nodded in instant agreement. They were unaware, though, that Sati had fought this decision. After Devagiri, she didn't think she deserved this command. But Shiva had insisted. He trusted her the most. Pray to Lord Ram and Lord Rudra that our mission is a success, said Gopal. Shiva stood on the shores of Mansarovar Lake, watching the slow descent of the sun in the evening sky. There was no breeze at all, and it was eerily still. A sudden chill enveloped him, and he looked down, surprised to see he was standing in knee-deep water. He turned around, and began wading out of the lake. Thick fog had blanketed the banks of Mansarovar. He couldn't see his village at all. As he stepped out of the lake, the mist magically cleared. Sati? asked a surprised Shiva. Sati sat calmly atop a thick pile of wood. A metal armor had been secured around her torso. Carved armbands glistened in the dusky light. Her sword lay by her side, and the shield was fastened on her back. She was prepared for war. But why was she wearing a saffron angvastram, the color of the final journey? Sati, said Shiva, walking towards her. Sati opened her eyes and smiled serenely. It appeared that she was speaking, but Shiva couldn't hear the words. The sound reached his ears with the delay of a few moments. I'll be waiting for you. What? Where are you going? Suddenly, a hazy figure appeared, bearing a burning torch. Without a moment's hesitation, he rammed it into the pile of wood that Sati sat upon. It caught fire instantly. Sati! screamed a stunned shiver as he raced towards her. Sati continued to sit upon the burning pile, at peace with herself. A beatific smile presented an eerie contrast to the flames that leapt up around her. Sati! shouted Shiva. Jump off! But Sati was unmoved. Shiva was just a few meters away from her when a platoon of soldiers jumped in front of him. Shiva drew his sword in a flash, trying to push the soldiers aside. But they battled him relentlessly. 
The soldiers were huge and unnaturally hairy, like the monster from his dream. Shiva battled them tirelessly, but could not push through. Meanwhile, the flames had almost covered his wife, such that he couldn't even see her clearly. And yet, she continued to sit on the pyre without attempting to escape. Sate! Shiva woke up in a sweat as his hands stretched out desperately. It took a moment for his eyes to adjust to the darkness. He turned to his left instinctively. Sati was asleep, her burnt cheek clearly visible in the nightlight. Shiva immediately bent over and embraced his wife. Shiva, whispered a groggy Sati. Shiva didn't say anything. He held her tight as tears streamed down his face. Shiva, asked Sati, fully awake now. What's the matter, darling? But Shiva couldn't say a word, choked with emotion. Sati pulled her head back to get a better look in the dim light. She reached up and touched his cheeks. They were moist. Shiva, sweetheart, what's wrong? Did you have a bad dream? Sati, promise me that you will not go into battle till I return. Shiva, you made me the leader. If the army has to go into battle, I will have to lead them. You know that. Shiva kept quiet. What did you see? He just shook his head. It was just a dream, Shiva. It doesn't mean anything. You need to focus your attention on your journey. You're leaving tomorrow. You must succeed in your mission with the Vayuputras. That will bring an end to this war. Don't let anxieties about me distract you. Shiva remained impassive, refusing to let go. Shiva, you carry the future on your shoulders. I'm saying this once again. Don't let your love for me distract you. It was just a dream, that's all. I can't live without you. You won't have to. I'll be waiting for you when you return, I promise. Shiva pulled back a bit, looking deep into Sati's eyes. Stay away from fires. Shiva, seriously, what? Sati, promise me, you will stay away from fires. Yes, Shiva, I promise. Chapter 34 With the help of Ambargaon Shiva was ready to leave. His bags had been sent to his ship. He had ordered all his aides out of this chamber. He wanted a few minutes alone with Sati. Bye, whispered Shiva. She smiled and embraced him. Nothing will happen to me, my good man. You will not be rid of me that easily. Shiva laughed softly, for Sati had used his own line on him. I know. It was just an overreaction to a stupid nightmare. Shiva pulled Sati's face up and kissed her affectionately. I love you. I love you too. A couple of weeks later, Shiva and Gopal stood on a beach in a hidden lagoon, a short distance to the north of the Narmada Delta. The small convoy of military ships had sneaked into the lagoon the previous night. Shiva and Gopal had disembarked into rowboats along with a skeletal crew and stolen onto the beach. Early next morning, the merchant ship that would take them to Pareha arrived in the lagoon. Hmm, good workmanship, said an admiring Shiva. It was without doubt a bulky ship, obviously designed to carry large cargo. However, any sailor could judge that with its double masts, high stern and low bow. This craft was also built for speed. In addition, the ship had been rigged with two banks of oars to allow for human propulsion if required. We won't really need the rowers, said Gopal. Our vessel will have the northeasterly winds in its sails. Where is this beauty from? asked Shiva. A small shipping village called Ambargaon. Ambargaon? Where is it? It's to the south of the Narmada River Delta. That's not part of any empire, Swadeep or Meluha. You guess right, my friend. That makes it a perfect place to build ships that one doesn't want to tract. The local ruler, Jadav Rana, is a pragmatic man. The Nagas have helped him many times. He values their friendship. And most importantly, his people are expert shipbuilders. This ship 
will get us to Pareha as fast as is humanly possible. Interesting. We should be grateful for their invaluable help. No, said Gopal, smiling. It is Pareha that should be grateful to Ambargaon, for the Ambargaonis have ensured that the gift of the Nilkant shall reach Pareha. I'm no gift, said a discomfited Shiva. Yes, you are, for you will help the Vayuputras achieve their purpose. You will help them fulfill their vow to Lord Rudra to not let evil win. Shiva remained silent, as always, embarrassed. And I'm sure, continued the prescient Gopal, that one day Pareha too shall send a gift in return to Ambargaon. How are you feeling now, my friend? asked Gopal, as soon as he entered Shiva's cabin. The vessel bearing the two men had been sailing in the open seas for a little more than a week. They were far beyond the coastline and unlikely to run into any Maluhan military ships. They'd run into choppy waters, though, in the last few days. The sailors, used to the ways of the sea, were not really troubled by it. Neither was Gopal, who had travelled on these great expanses of water many times. But Shiva had undertaken a sea voyage just once from the Narmada Delta to Lothal, where the ship had stayed close to the coast. It was, therefore, no surprise that the rough sea had given the Nilkant a severe bout of seasickness. Shiva looked up from his bed and cursed, his eyes half shut. I have no stomach left. It has all been churned out. A plague on these wretched waters. Gopal laughed softly. It's time for your medicines, Nilkant. What's the point, Panditji? Nothing stays inside. For whatever little time the medicine remains, it will serve a purpose. Take it. Gopal gently poured a herbal infusion into a wooden spoon. Balancing it delicately, the chief Vasudev offered it to Shiva, who swallowed it quickly and fell back on the bed. Holy Lake, help me, whispered Shiva. Let this medicine stay within me for a few minutes at least. But the prayer probably didn't reach Mansur over lake in time. Shiva lurched to his side and retched into the large pot that had been placed on the ground. A sailor, standing by the bed, rushed forward quickly and handed a wet towel to Shiva, who wiped his face slowly. Shiva shook his head and looked up at the ceiling of his cabin in disgust. Crap! Brigo and Parvateshwar rode on horseback at the head of a massive army that had marched out of Devagiri. They were on their way to the Bias River, from which point ships would sail them down to Karachapa. I was thinking that the powerful fleet in Karachapa is not the only advantage derived from our decision to shift our war command. Parvateshwar frowned. What other benefit does it serve, my lord? Well, there's also the fact that you will not have to suffer idiotic orders from your emperor. You will be free to conduct the war the way you deem fit. It was obvious that Brigu held Daksh in contempt and did not think much of his harebrained schemes. But Parvateshwar was too disciplined Maluhan to speak openly against his emperor. He was stoic in his silence. Brigu smiled. You really are a rare man, General. A man of the old code. Lord Ram would have been proud of you. Aided by the northeasterly winds pushing hard into its sails, the merchant ship was cutting through the waters with rapid speed. Having tossed and turned for a few days, Shiva had finally adapted to the sea. The Nilkant was able, therefore, to enjoy the stiff morning breeze on the main deck at the bow with Gopal for company. We are now crossing over from our western sea through a very narrow strait, said Gopal. It's just over 50 kilometers across. What's on the other side? asked Shiva. The Jamsrayang. Sounds scary. What in Lord Ram's name does that mean? Gopal laughed. Something absolutely benign. Zrayang simply means sea in the local language. And what does Jam mean? Jam means to come to. To come to? Yes. 
So this is the sea that you come to? Yes, a simple name. This is a sea you must come to if you want to go to Elam or Mesopotamia or any of the lands further west. But most importantly, this is a sea you must approach if you need to go to Pareha. I've heard of Mesopotamia. It has strong trade relations with Meluha, right? Yes, it's a very powerful and rich empire established between two great rivers in the region, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Is the empire bigger than Meluha and Swadeep? No, smiled Gopal. It's not even bigger than Meluha alone. But they believe human civilization began in their region. Really? I thought we Indians believed that human civilization began here. True. So who's right? Gopal shrugged. I don't know. This goes back many thousands of years. But frankly, does it matter who got civilized first? so long as all of us eventually became civilized. Shiva smiled. True. And where is Elam? Elam is a much smaller kingdom to the southeast of Mesopotamia. Southeast? asked Shiva. So, Elam is closer to Pariha. Yes, and Elam acts as a buffer state between Pariha and Mesopotamia, which is why the Parihans have occasionally helped the Elamites unofficially. But I thought Pareha never got involved in local politics. They try to avoid it. And most people in the region have not even heard of the Vayuputras. But they were concerned that expanding Mesopotamia would encroach into their land. Expanding Mesopotamia? A gifted gardener had once conquered the whole of Mesopotamia. A gardener? How did a gardener become a warrior? Did he train in secret? Gopal smiled. From what I've heard of the story, he wasn't trained. Shiva's eyes widened with amazement. He must have been very gifted. Oh, he was talented, but not in gardening. Shiva laughed. What was his name? Nobody knows his original name, but he called himself Sargon. And he conquered the whole of Mesopotamia. Yes, and surprisingly quickly at that. But it did not satiate his ambition. He went on to conquer neighboring kingdoms as well, including Elam. That would have brought him to the borders of Pariha. Not exactly, my friend, but uncomfortably close. Why didn't he move further east? I don't know. Neither he nor his successors did, though. But the Vayaputras were troubled enough to offer anonymous assistance to Elam. The Elamites were able to repel because of this support and the conquest of the Mesopotamians did not last for too long. King Sargon seems like a very interesting man. He was. He challenged the entire world and even fate itself. He was so feisty that he dared to name his empire after the water carrier who was his adopted father. His father was a water carrier? Yes, named Aki. So they called themselves the Empire of the Akkadians. And does this empire still exist? No. That's sad. I would have loved to meet these remarkable Arcadians. The people of Elam would have thought very differently, Lord Nilkant. The soldiers are bored and restless, said Ganesh. They have been mobilized, but there's been no action, no battle. Karthik and Ganesh had just entered Sati's chamber and were happy to find Kali with their mother. I was just discussing that with Didi, said Kali. The men are spending their time gambling and drinking to keep themselves occupied. Training is suffering because they don't see the point of it when there's hardly any chance of combat in the near future. This is a time when stupid incidents occur which can blow up into serious problems. Let's keep them busy, suggested Karthik. Let's organize some animal hunts in the forests around the city. We know that the Maluhan army has still not moved out of Karachapa, so there's no risk in letting our soldiers out in large groups. Hunting will give them some sense of action. Good idea, agreed Kali. We can also use the excess meat to organize feasts for the citizens of Lothal. It will help assuage some of their irritation with having to host such a large army. 
The excitement and the blood rush will also prevent boredom from creeping into our troops, said Ganesh. I agree, said Sati. I'll issue the orders immediately. It was nearly a month and a half since they had started their journey from the secret lagoon off the Narmada Delta. Shiva's ship came to anchor off a desolate coast on the Jam Sea. There didn't seem to be any habitation of any kind at all. In fact, it appeared as though this land had never been disturbed by humans. Shiva was not surprised. Just like the Vasudevs, the Vayuputras were secretive about their existence. He did not expect a welcoming port of landing. But he did expect some secret symbol, something like the emblematic Vasudev flame on the banks of the Chambal near Ujjain. Then he thought he detected something. The coast was lined by a thick row of tall bushes, maybe three or four meters high. From the distance of the anchored ship, it seemed like these bushes had reddish-orange fruit hanging in abundance. The shrubs were covered with small dark green leaves, except at the top, where it was bright red. These bright red leaves, combined with the reddish-orange fruit, gave the impression that the bush was on fire. A burning bush! Shiva immediately turned and began climbing the main mast all the way up to the crow's nest. Once there, the symbol became obvious. The bushes, when combined with the white sand and brownish rocks, came together to form a symbol that Shiva recognized only too well. Fravashi, the holy flame, the feminine spirit. Shiva came down to find Gopal standing below. Did you find something, my friend? asked Gopal. I saw the holy flame, the pure being. I saw the Favashi. Gopal was astonished at first, but not for long. Of course, Lord Monabhu, he would have told you about Favashi. Yes. It's a symbol of the faith of Lord Rudra's people. The Favashi represents pure spirits, the angels. They exist in large numbers, their scriptures say, in the tens of thousands. They send forth human souls into this world and support them in the eternal battle between good and evil. They are also believed to have assisted God in creating the universe. Shiva nodded. The Vasudevs believe in the Fravashi as well, I assume. We respect the Fravashi, but it is a Parihan symbol. Then why do you have a Fravashi at the entrance to your land? Gopal frowned. A Fravashi symbol? Where? At the clearing on the Chambal from where we communicated with you through clapping signals. Oh, smiled Gopal, as understanding dawned upon him. My friend, we have a symbolic fire as well, but we don't call it Fravashi. We call it Agni, the god of fire. But the symbol is almost exactly like the Fravashi. Yes, it is. I am aware that the Parehans gave enormous importance to fire rituals. So do we Indians. The first hymn of the first chapter in the Rig Veda is dedicated to the fire god Agni. The importance of the element of fire is, I believe, common across all religions of the world. Fire is the beginning of human civilization. It is the beginning of all life, my friend. It is the source of all energy. For one way of looking at the stars is to see them as great balls of fire. Shiva smiled. A sailor walked up to the two men. My lords, the rowboat has been lowered. We are ready. The rowboat was a hundred meters from the coast when a tall man appeared from behind the bushes. He wore a long brownish black cloak and held what looked like a staff, or it could have been a spear. Shiva couldn't be sure. He reached for his sword. Gopal reached out to stay Shiva's hand. It's all right, my friend. Shiva spoke without taking his eyes off the stranger. Are you sure? Yes, he is a Parihan. He has come to guide us. Shiva relaxed his grip on the sword but kept his hand close to the hilt. He saw the stranger reach into the bushes and tug at what looked like ropes. Shiva immediately caught his breath and reached for his sword once again. To his surprise though, Four horses emerged from behind the thick row of bushes. Three of them were not carrying anything, clearly ready for their new mounts. The fourth 
was loaded with a massive sack. Perhaps it was carrying provisions. Shiva moved his hand away from his sword and let it relax. The stranger was a friend. Chapter 35 Journey to Pareha I'm glad that the Vayuputras have sent someone to receive us, said Gopal. His sailors were offloading the provisions from the rowboat. Some of the luggage would be tied onto the three horses that would be mounted by Shiva, Gopal and the Parihan, while the rest would be loaded onto the severely burdened fourth horse. How can the Vayuputras ignore the chief Vasudev, my lord? asked the Parihan, bowing low towards Gopal. We received your message from the Vasudev Pandit of Lothal well in time. You are our honoured guest. My name is Kurush and I will be your guide to our city Pareha. Shiva observed Kurush intently. His long brownish black cloak could not hide the fact that he carried a sword. Shiva wondered as to how the Parehan would draw his sword quickly in an emergency if it lay encumbered within the folds of his cloak. The man was unnaturally fair-skinned, not seen often in the hot plains of India. While one may have expected this to make the Parihan look pale and unattractive, this was not so. The long, sharp nose, combined with a full beard, somehow enhanced the beauty of the man while giving him the look of a warrior nevertheless. The Parihan wore his hair long, something that was in common with the Indians. On his head was perched a square white hat made of cotton. For Shiva, the most interesting aspect was his beard. It was just like that of Lord Rudra's image in the revered Vishwanath temple at Kashi. The distinctive beard of the previous Mahadev had many strands of hair curled into independent clumps. Thank you, Kurush, said Gopal. Please allow me the pleasure of introducing the long-awaited Nilkant himself, Lord Shiva. Kurush turned towards Shiva and nodded curtly. Clearly, he was one amongst those Vayuputras who considered Shiva an usurper, a Nidkant who had not been authorized by his tribe. Shiva did not say anything. He knew that the only opinion that mattered was that of their chief, Mitra. Shiva mounted his horse, then turned and waved at the sailors as they rode back to their ship. They intended to sail a little further an anchor in a hidden cove. After a waiting period of two months, the captain would send out a rowboat once every two days to the spot where Gopal and Shiva had met Kurush to check if they had returned. Kurush had already begun riding in front while also holding the reins of the horse bearing the provisions when Gopal and Shiva kicked their horses into a trot. With the Parehan safely out of earshot, Shiva turned to Gopal. Why does the name Kurush sound familiar? Kurush is sometimes also known as Kuru, said Gopal. And Kuru, I'm sure you're aware, was a great Indian emperor in ancient times. So which name came first, Kuru or Kurush? You mean who influenced whom? asked Gopal. Did India influence Pareha or was it the other way around? Yes, that's what I want to know. I don't know. It was probably a bit of both. We learned from their noble culture and they learned from ours. Of course, we can go on about who learned how much and from whom, but that is nothing but our ego, showing our desperation to prove that our culture is superior to others. That is a foolish quest. It is best to learn from everyone, regardless of the cultural source of that learning. The Parehan rode ahead in solitary splendor. They had been traveling for a week now and Kurush had determinedly remained uncommunicative, giving monosyllabic answers to Shiva's companionable queries. The Nilkant had finally stopped talking to him. Did the Lord grow up here? Shiva asked Gopal. Yes, Lord Rudra was born around this area. He came to India when we needed him. He was from the land of fairies. That would obviously make him our guardian spirit as well. Actually, I believe he wasn't born in Pareha but somewhere close to this region. Where? Anshan. 
Doesn't Anshan mean hunger in India? Gopal smiled. It means the same here as well. They named their land hunger? Was it so bad? Look around you. This is a harsh, mountainous desert. Life is perennially difficult here. Unless... Unless what? Unless great men are occasionally able to tame this land. And Lord Rudra's tribe proved to be such men. Yes, they set up the kingdom of Elam. Elam? You mean the same one that the Arcadians conquered? Yes. That would explain the Vayuputra's support, wouldn't it? The Elamites were the people of Lord Rudra. No, that's not the reason why. The Vayuputra supported the Elamites because they genuinely felt the need for a buffer state between them and the Mesopotamians. In fact, Lord Rudra had made it very clear to his fellow Elamites. They could either join the Vayuputra tribe, giving up all links with any other identity that they had previously cherished, or they could choose to remain Elamites. Those who chose to follow Lord Rudra are the Vayuputras of today. So Pareha is not where Anshan used to be? No. Anshan is the capital of the Elamite kingdom. Pareha exists further to the east. It appears to me that the Vayuputras accepted other outsiders as well, and not just the Elamites. My uncle was a Tibetan. Yes, Lord Manubhu was one. The Vayuputras accept members solely on credit, not by virtue of birth. There are many Elamites who try to become Vayuputras, but do not succeed. The only people who were accepted in large numbers because they were refugees were a tribe from our country. From India? Yes, Lord Rudra felt personally guilty about what he had done to them. So he took them under his protection and gave them refuge in his land among the Vayuputras. Who were these people? The Asuras. Before Shiva could react to this revelation, Kurush turned and addressed Gopal. My lord, this is a good place to have some lunch. The path ahead goes through a narrow mountain pass. Shall we take a break here? Lunch was entirely unappetizing and cold, with the harsh mountain winds adding to the discomfort. But the dry fruit that Kurush had brought along provided a boost of energy, much needed for the back-breaking ride that lay ahead. Kurush quickly packed the remaining food, mounted his horse and kicked it into action after making sure that he had a good grip over the reins of the fourth horse. Gopal and Shiva settled into a canter behind him. The Asuras took refuge here? asked Shiva, still in shock. Yes, answered Gopal. Lord Rudra himself brought the few surviving Asura leaders to Pareha. Others who were in hiding were also led out of India by the Vayuputras. Some Asuras went further west, even beyond Elam. I'm not really sure what happened to them, but many of them stayed on in Pareha. And Lord Rudra accommodated these Asuras into the Vayuputra tribe, did he? Not all of them. He found that a few of the Asuras were not detached enough to become members of the Vayuputra tribe. They were allowed to live in Pareha as refugees, but a vast majority of the remainder became Vayuputras. A lot of them would have been Asura royalty. Wouldn't they have wanted to attack India and take revenge on the Devas who had defeated them? No. Once they entered the Vayuputra Brotherhood, they ceased to be Asuras. They gave up their old identities and embraced the primary task Lord Rudra had set for the Vayuputras to protect the holy land of India from evil. Shiva inhaled deeply as he absorbed this news. The Asuras had been able to go beyond their hatred for their former enemies and work for the mission mandated by Lord Rudra. In a strange twist of fate, the Asuras, who to the Devas were demons, were in fact actively working behind the scenes to protect them from the effects of evil, said Gopal, as he guided his horse to the right and entered a narrow pass. Shiva suddenly thought of something and rode up to Gopal. But Pandaji, I'm sure the Asuras would not have forgotten their old culture. They must surely have influenced the Parihan way of life. 
It's impossible to shed one's cultural memes even after having moved away to foreign lands generations ago. Unless, of course, one becomes as detached as the ascetics. You're right, said Gopal. The Asura culture did impact the Parihans. For instance, do you know the Parihan term for gods? Shiva shrugged. Gopal glanced at Shiva conspiratorially. Before you answer, know this, that in the old Parihan language, there was no place for the production and perception of the phonetic sound S. It either became Sh or H. So, what do you think they called their gods? Shiva frowned, making a wild guess. Ahuras? Yes, Ahuras. Good Lord! What were their demons called then? Devas. By the great Lord Brahma! It's the exact opposite of the Indian pantheon. We call our gods Devas and demons Asuras. Shiva smiled slightly. They're different, but they're not evil. Chapter 36 The Land of the Fairies Shiva, Gopal and Kurush had been riding for a little over a month. Late winter made travelling through the harsh mountainous terrain a test of will. Shiva, who'd lived most of his life in the highlands of Tibet, managed the expedition quite well. But Gopal, who was used to the moist heat of the plains, was struggling due to the cold and rarefied atmosphere. We're here, said Kurush, out of the blue one day, as he raised his hand. Shiva pulled his reins. They had been on a narrow pathway, no more than four or five meters wide. Shiva dismounted from his horse, tied the reins to a rocky outcrop, and walked up to Gopal to assist him. He tied Gopal's horse, helped him sit with his back propped up against the mountainside, and offered his water to the chief Vasudev. Gopal sipped the life-nurturing fluid slowly. Having helped his friend, Shiva looked around. To the left was a sheer rocky mountainside, almost as steep as a cliff, which extended upwards for several hundred meters. To the right was a steep drop to a dry valley far below. As far as the eye could see, there was no sign of life anywhere. No human habitation, no animal, not even the few valiant plants and trees that they had seen at lower heights. Shiva looked at Gopal with raised eyebrows and whispered, We're here? Gopal gestured towards Kurush. The Parian was carefully running his hands over the mountain wall, his eyes shut, trying to locate something. He suddenly stopped. He had found what he was seeking. Shiva had moved up in the meantime and saw the faint indentation of a symbol on the mountainside. A figurative flame he had come to recognize. Fravashi. Kurush pressed the ring on his index finger into the center of the symbol. A block of rock the size of a human head emerged from the right. Kurush quickly placed both his hands on the rock, stepped back to get some leverage and pushed hard. Shiva watched in wonder as the mountain seemed to come to life. A substantial section, nearly four meters across and three meters high, receded inwards and then slid aside revealing a pathway going deep into the mountain's womb. Kurush turned towards Shiva and indicated that they were good to go. Shiva helped Gopal onto his horse and handed the reins to his friend. As he walked towards his horse, he noticed that while the rocky outcrop where he had tethered his animal looked natural, in fact, it was man-made. Shiva mounted his horse and quickly joined Gopal and Kurush riding into the heart of the mountain. The rocky concealed entrance had closed behind them just as smoothly. It would have been pitch dark inside except for a flaming torch that was maintained by the Parihans on one of the walls which threw its light ahead for a few meters. Beyond that, the light lost its struggle against the omnipresent darkness of the cavernous pathway. Kurush picked three unlit torches from a recess on the wall, lit them and handed one each to Gopal and Shiva. Thereupon, he swiftly rode ahead, holding his torch aloft. Shiva and Gopal kicked their horses and made haste after him. 
Soon the pathway split into a fork, but Kurush unhesitatingly led them up one, disregarding the other. Just like the Nagas in the Dandrak forests, the Vayuputras too had ensured that in the unlikely scenario of any unauthorized person finding his way into the secret pathway, he would inevitably get lost within the mountain unless led by a Vayuputra guide. Shiva expected many more such misleading paths along the way. He was not disappointed. A half hour later, after a long, monotonous ride, the travelers emerged on the other side of the mountain, almost blinded by the sudden onslaught of bright sunlight. Even as his eyes adjusted, Shiva's jaw dropped with amazement as he took in what lay ahead. The other side of the mountain was dramatically different from what they had seen up to now. A broad, winding road had been cut into the sides of the mountain. Called the Rudra Avenue by the local Parihans, a beautifully carved railing ran along its sides, affording protection for horses or carriages from slipping off the road to certain death in the sheer ravine below. The Rudra Avenue wound its way along the steep mountain in a gentle descent to the bottom. The valley itself, naturally dry as a bone, was surrounded on all sides by steep mountains. The splendor of nature notwithstanding, what Shiva was struck by was what the Parehans had done with it. Hidden away from prying eyes, surrounded by unconquerable mountains, in this secluded spot, they had truly created a land of fairies, Pareha. The Rudra Avenue ended at the base of a terrace. This platform, though, unlike the ones built by the Maluhans, had not been constructed as protection against flood. The problem with water in Pareha was not one of excess, but that of scarcity. The platform had been built to create a smooth base atop the rough, undulating mountainous valley, allowing for the construction of massive structures upon it. The city of Pareha had been built on it. Kurush, Gopal and Shiva approached the platform at the lowest point of the valley. The platform was at its tallest here, nearly 20 meters high. A massive ceremonial gate had been erected at what was obviously the only entry point into the city. The road was surrounded by high walls on both sides and narrowed down as it led to the well-barricaded gate. Looking admiringly around, the warrior in Shiva understood that the approach to the city gates perforce funneled an attacking force into a narrow neck, thus making defense easy for the Parehans. The massive, ornate city gates had been hewn out of the local brown stone that Shiva had frequently seen en route. The gate itself was flanked on either side by large pillars on which crouched two imposing creatures as if ready to pounce in defense of their city. This unfamiliar creature carried the head of a man on the body of a lion and sprouted the broad wings of an eagle. Parihan pride was unmistakable in the features of the face. A sharp forehead held high, a hooked nose, neatly beaded beard, a drooping moustache, and lengthy locks emerging from under a square hat. The aggressive warrior-like visage was tempered somewhat by calm, almost friendly eyes. Shiva noted that Kurush's conversation with the gatekeeper was done. He walked back and spoke respectfully to Gopal. My lord, the formalities have been completed. Please accept my apologies that it took us so long to get here. Shall we? There's no need for an apology, Kurush, said Gopal politely. Let's go. Shiva quietly followed Kurush and Gopal, keenly aware of the gatekeeper's quizzical, perhaps even judgmental eyes. They crossed a massive tiled courtyard, guiding their horses onto the cobbled pathway leading to the top of the platform. A gradient was gentle, making it easy to negotiate the single hairpin bend they encountered. A few pedestrians sauntered along the accompanying steps, provided with long treads to facilitate the climb. All along the pathway, the rock face of the platform had been carved and painted. Against the relief of glazed tiles, Sculpted Parians gazed at passers-by with their distinguished features, long coats and square hats. As if from nowhere, water rippled down the center of the rock face, 
leaving a lilting musical sound in its wake. Shiva made a mental note to ask Gopal the secret of this water source in the harsh desert. Shiva's questions were quickly forgotten as he reached the top and exclaimed with wonder at the sheer beauty of all that he beheld. By the holy lake! He had just had his first vision of the exquisite symmetrical gardens of Pareha. These artificial heavenly creations were so extraordinary that Parehans had named them Paradesa, the walled place of harmony. The Paradesa extended along the central axis of the rectangular city with buildings built around it. The park in the city extended all the way to the edge of a great mountain at the upper end of the valley, which had been named the Mountain of Mercy by the Asuras. A water channel emerged from the heart of the mountain, flowing through the garden in an unerringly straight line, filling up large square ponds intermittently. The ponds themselves had flamboyant fountains constructed in the center, spewing water high into the air. The left and right halves of the garden, divided by the water channel, were perfect mirror images of each other. The entire expanse was covered with a carpet of thick and carefully manicured grass, which provided the base around which flower beds and trees were arranged in perfect harmony. The flora had obviously been imported from around the world. Roses, narcissus, tulips, lilacs, jasmine, orange and lemon trees dotted the landscape in poetic profusion. Shiva was so lost in the beauty of the garden that he didn't hear his friend call. Lord Nilkant? repeated Gopal. Shiva turned to the chief Vasudev. We can always come back here, my friend. But for now, we need to retire to our guest house. Shiva and Gopal had been housed in the state guest house reserved for elite visitors to Pariha. Here too, the duo encountered the Parihan obsession with beauty and elegance. Dismounting from their horses, Shiva and Gopal strode into the building. The entrance led to a wide, comfortable veranda, lined with neat rows of perfectly circular columns, providing support to a great stone ceiling. The columns were colored a vivid pink all the way to the top, at which point, near the ceiling, it contained discreet etchings of animal figurines. Shiva squinted to get a better look. Bulls, remarked Shiva. Bulls and cows were sacred amongst the Indians, central to the spiritual experience of life. Yes, confirmed Gopal. Bulls are revered by the Parihans as well. They are symbolic of strength and virility. As they reached the other end of the veranda, they encountered three elegantly dressed Parihans. The one in front held out a tray with warm, moistened and scented towels. Gopal immediately picked one up and went on to wipe the accumulated dust and grime from his face and hands. Shiva followed his example. A Parihan woman walked up to Gopal, bowed low and spoke softly. Welcome, honored Chief Vasudev Gopal. We can scarce believe our good fortune in hosting the representative of the great Lord Ram. Thank you, my lady, said Gopal. But you have me at a disadvantage. You know my name and I do not know yours. My name is Bahman Dokht. The daughter of Bahman, said Gopal, for he was familiar with their old language, Avesta. Bahman Dokht smiled. That is one of the meanings, yes, but I prefer the other one. And what is that? A maiden with a good mind. I'm sure you live by that name, my lady. I try my best, Lord Gopal. Gopal smiled and folded his hands into a namaste. Unlike most Parihans, who had studiously ignored Shiva all this time, Bahmandokht addressed the Nilkant with a polite bow. Welcome, Lord Shiva. I do hope we have given you no cause for complaint. Not at all, said Shiva graciously. I know you are here on a mission, said Bahmandokht. I do not make so bold as to speak for my entire tribe, but I personally hope that you succeed. India and Pareha are intertwined by ancient bonds. If something needs to be done that is in the interest of your country, I believe it is our duty to help. It is the dictate that Lord Rudra laid down for us. Shiva acknowledged the courtesy and held his hands together in a namaste. 
That spirit is returned in full measure by my country, Lady Bamandokht. Bamandokht glanced at a woman standing at the back towards the end of the lobby. Shiva's eyes followed her and rested on a tall woman dressed in traditional Parehan garb. Despite the attire, it was obvious that she wasn't native to Pariha. Bronze complexioned with jet black hair, she had large attractive doe eyes and a voluptuous body, unlike the slender locals. She was a gorgeous woman indeed. Lord Shiva, said Bamandokht, pulling the Nilkan's attention back. My aid will show you to your chamber. Thank you, said Shiva. As Gopal and Shiva were escorted away, the Nilkant looked back. The mystery woman had disappeared. Shiva and Gopal were led into a lavish suite of rooms with two separate bedchambers. The suite had been furnished with every luxury imaginable. Door-length windows at the far end opened onto a huge balcony with large recliners and a couple of cloth-covered poofs that could double up as tables. The living room contained a mini fountain on the side, its cascading waters creating a soothing tinkle. Delicately woven wall-to-wall -wall plush carpets covered every inch of the floor. Bolsters and cushions of various sizes were strewn on the carpets at several corners, making comfortable floor seating areas. An ornately carved oak table was placed in one corner, accompanied with cushioned chairs on the side. Another corner was occupied by Parehan musical instruments, keeping in mind the role of leisure in hospitality. Lavish gold and silver plated accoutrements decorated the mantelpiece and shelves on the walls. This was ostentatious, even by the standards of Swadweepan royalty. The two bedrooms had comfortable soft beds with silk linen. Bowls of fruit had been thoughtfully placed on low tables next to the beds. Even clothes had been specially ordered and placed in cupboards for the two guests, including traditional Parehan cloaks. Shiva looked at Gopal with a twinkle in his eye and chortled. I think these uh, miserable quarters will have to suffice. Gopal joined in mirthfully. Chapter 37 Unexpected Help After a sumptuous dinner, Gopal and Shiva were back in their chambers, welcoming the opportunity for relaxation and inactivity. The fountain in the room having drawn his attention, Shiva quipped, Pandaji, where do they get the water from? For this fountain? asked Gopal. For all the fountains, ponds and channels that we have seen. Quite frankly, building this city on these gardens would have required a prodigious amount of water. This is a desert land with almost no natural rivers. I was told that they don't even have regular rains. So, where does this water come from? They owe it to the brilliance of their engineers. How so? There are massive natural springs and aquifers to the north of Pareha. That is water within the rocks and the ground, right? Yes. But springs can never be as bountiful. True, but scarcity engenders ingenuity. When you don't have enough water, you learn to use it judiciously. All the fountain and canal water that you see in the city is recycled wastewater. Shiva, who had dipped his hand into the fountain water, immediately recoiled. Gopal laughed softly. Don't worry, my friend. That water has been treated and completely cleaned. It's even safe to drink. I'll take your word for it. Gopal smiled as Shiva judiciously wiped his hands with a sanitized napkin. How far away are these springs and aquifers? The ones that supply this city are a good 50 to 100 kilometers away, answered Gopal. Shiva whistled softly. That's a long distance. How do they get the water here in such large quantities? I haven't seen any canals. Oh, they have canals, but you can't see them as they are underground. They've built underground canals? asked Shiva, stunned. They're not as broad as the canals we have back home, but they serve the purpose. They build canals that are the size of underground drains, which begin at aquifers and springs. But a hundred kilometers is a long way to transport water. 
How do they do that? Do they have underground pumps powered by animals? No, they use one of the most powerful forces of nature to do the job. What? Gravity. They built underground channels with gentle gradients that slope over a hundred kilometers. The water naturally flows down due to the force of gravity. Brilliant! But building something like that would require precision engineering skills of a high order. You're right. The angle of the descent would have to be absolutely exact over very long distances. If the gradient is even slightly higher than required, the water would begin to erode the bottom of the channel, destroying it over time. And if the slope is a little too gentle, the water would simply stop flowing. Exactly, said Gobal. You can imagine the flawless design and execution required in implementing a project such as this. But when did they? Shiva was interrupted by a soft knock on the door. He immediately lowered his voice to an urgent whisper. Pandaji, were you expecting someone? Gopal shook his head. No. And where is our guard? Isn't he supposed to announce visitors? Shiva pulled out his sword, indicating to Gopal that he should follow him as he tiptoed to the door. The safest place for him was behind Shiva. The Vasudev chief was a Brahmin and not a warrior. Shiva waited near the door. The soft knock was heard again. Shiva turned and whispered to Gopal, As soon as I pull the intruder in, shut the door and lock it. Shiva held his sword to the side, pulled the door open and in one smooth motion yanked the intruder into the room, pushing the parian to the ground. Gopal, moving just as rapidly, shut the door and bolted it. I'm a friend, spoke a feminine voice, her hands raised in surrender. Shiva and Gopal stared at the woman on the ground, her face covered with a veil. She slowly got up, keeping her eyes fixed on Shiva's sword. You don't need that. Parihans do not kill their guests. It's one of Lord Rudra's laws. Shiva refused to lower his blade. Reveal yourself, he commanded. The woman removed her veil. You've seen me earlier, great Nilkant. Shiva recognized the intruder immediately. It was a dark-haired mystery woman he had seen in the lobby while he'd been talking to Bahmandokht. Shiva smiled. I was wondering when I would see you next. I've come to help, said the woman, still unable to tear her eyes away from the sword. So I'll repeat that you really don't need that. We Parihans will never break Lord Rudra's laws. Shiva sheathed his sword. What makes you think we need your help? For the same reason that you don't need your sword here. We Vayuputras never break Lord Rudra's laws. I'm here to help you get what you came for. Shiva and Gopal joined the lady, having made her comfortable on the soft cushions. What is your name? asked Shiva. Why do you want to help us? My name is Shehrazad. Shehrazad was a name that harked back to ancient Parihan roots, a person who gives freedom to cities. Shiva narrowed his eyes. That is a lie. You are not from this land. What is your real name? I am a Parihan. This is my name. How can we trust you if you don't even tell us your real name? My name has nothing to do with your mission. What the Amartya Shpand, the Vayaputra Council, think of your mission is what truly matters. And you can tell us what they think, asked Gopal. That's why I'm here. I can tell you what you need to do to fulfill your mission. The Mitra was a ceremonial title for the chief of the Vayuputra tribe. It literally translated as friend, for he was the deepest friend of the Vayuputra god, the Ahura Mazda. The Ahura Mazda was a formless god, much like the Hindu concept of Paramatma, and Mitra was his representative on earth. Lord Rudra had mandated that the ancient title of Mitra be used for the chief Vayuputra. Once a man became the Mitra, all his early identities were erased, including his old name. He even disassociated himself completely from his former family. Everyone was to know him thereafter as the Mitra. Mitra was in the antechamber of his office when he heard a soft noise from the veranda. The nascent moon cast a faint light, impairing vision, 
but Mitra knew who it was as he walked over. He heard a soft feminine voice call out in a whisper. Great Mitra, I have sent her to them. Thank you, Bahman Docht. The Vayu Putras will be indebted to you in perpetuity, for you have helped our tribe fulfill our mission and our vow to Lord Rudra. Bahman Docht bowed low. There had been a time when she had loved the man who'd become the Mitra. But once he had assumed his office as the chief, the only feelings she had allowed herself were those of devotion and respect. She stepped away quietly. The Mitra stared at Bahman Dokht's retreating form and then returned to the antechamber. He sat on a simple chair, leaned back and closed his eyes. The ancient memory was still fresh in his mind, as if it had all happened yesterday. The conversation with his close friend and brother-in-law, Manubhu. Are you sure, Manubhu? asked the Parehan, who would go on to become the Mitra. The Tibetan feigned outrage as he looked at his friend and fellow Vayuputra. I mean no disrespect, Monubhu, but I hope you realize that what we are doing is illegal. Monubhu allowed himself a slight smile as he scratched his shaggy beard. His matted hair had been tied up in a bun with a string of beads in the style favored by his tribe, the fierce Gunas. His body was covered with deep scars acquired from a lifetime of battle. His tall, muscular physique was always in a state of alertness, ever ready for war. His demeanor, his clothes, his hair, all conveyed the impression of a ruthless warrior. But his eyes were different. They were a window to his calm mind, one that had found its purpose and was at peace. Manubu's eyes had always intrigued the Parian, compelling him to become a follower. If you are unsure, my friend, said Monubu. You don't have to do this. The Parehan looked away. Don't feel pressure to do this just because you're related to me, continued Monubu, whose brother had married the Parehan's sister. The Parehan returned his gaze. How does the reason matter? What matters is the result. What matters is where the Lord Rudra's commandment is being followed. Monubu continued to lock gaze with the Parehan, his eyes mirthful. You should know Lord Rudra's commandments better than I do. After all, he was a Parehan, like you. The Parehan stole a look at the back of the room nervously, where a diabolical mixture was boiling inside a vessel, the fire below it steady and even. Monobu stepped forward and put his hand on the Parehan's shoulders. Trust me, the Somras is turning evil. Lord Rudra would have wanted us to do this. If the council doesn't agree, then the hell with them. We will ensure that Lord Rudra's commandments are followed. Parehan looked at Monobu and sighed. Are you sure that your nephew has the potential to fulfill this mission? That he can one day be the successor to Lord Rudra? Monobu smiled. He's your nephew too. His mother is your sister. I know, but the boy doesn't live with me. He lives with you in Tibet. I've never met him. I don't know if I ever will. And you refuse to even tell me his name. So I ask again, are you sure he is the one? Yes, Monobu was confident in his belief. He is the one. He will grow up to be the Nilkant. He will be the one who will carry out Lord Rudra's commandment. He will take evil out of the equation. But he needs to be educated. He needs to be prepared. I will prepare him. But what is the point? The Vayuputra Council controls the emergence of the Nilkant. How will our nephew be discovered? I'll arrange it at the right time, said Monobu. The Parehan frowned. But how will you... Leave that to me, interrupted Monobu. If he is not discovered, it will mean that the time for evil has not yet come. On the other hand, if I am able to ensure that he is discovered, then we will know that evil has arisen, said the Parehan, completing Monobu's sentence. Monobu shook his head, disagreeing partially with his brother-in-law. To be more precise, we would know that good has turned into evil. The conversation was interrupted by a soft hissing sound from the far corner of the room. The medicine was ready. The two friends walked over to the fire and peered into the vessel. A thick, reddish-brown paste had formed, 
Small bubbles were bursting through to the surface. It only needs to cool down now. The task is done, said the Parihan. Bonobu looked at his brother-in-law. No, my friend, the task has just begun. The Mitra breathed deeply as he came back to the present. He whispered, I never thought that our rebellion would succeed, Monobu. He rose from his chair, walked over to the veranda and looked up at the sky. In the old days, his people believed that great men, once they had surrendered their mortal flesh, went up to live among the stars and keep watch over them all. Mitra focused his eyes on one particular star and smiled. Monobu, it was a good idea to name our nephew Shiva, a good clue to help me guess that he is the one. To begin with, let me tell you that most of the Vayuputras are against you, said Shahrazad. That's not really much of a secret, said Shiva Riley. Look, you can't blame the Vayuputras. Our laws state very clearly that only one of us from amongst those who authorized by the Vayuputra tribe can become the Nilkant. You have emerged out of nowhere. The laws don't allow us to recognize or help someone like you. And yet, here you are, said Shiva. I don't think that you're working alone. You were standing right at the back, almost hidden when I saw you in the lobby. I bet you are not a fully accepted Parihan. I can't see someone like you having the courage to do all this by yourself. Some powerful Parihans are putting you up to it, which makes me believe that some Vayuputras realize what I am saying is true, that evil has arisen. Shahrazad smiled softly. Yes, there are some very powerful Vayuputras who are on your side, but they cannot help you openly. Unlike most of the earlier Nilkant pretenders, your blue throat is genuine. This leads to one inescapable conclusion. Some Vayuputra has helped you many decades ago. Can you imagine the chaos this has caused? There were unprecedented accusations flying thick and fast after your emergence. People within Pareha were accusing each other of having broken Lord Rudra's laws and helping you clandestinely when you were young. It was tearing the Vayuputras apart till Lord Mitra put an end to it. He held that our tribe has not authorized you as an Ilkant and perhaps it was the doing of someone from within your own country. So, if any Vayuputra helps me, he will be seen as the traitor who started it all many years ago. Exactly, answered Shahrazad. What is the way out? asked Gopal. You, my Lord Chief Vasudev, must lead the mission, said Shahrazad. Lord Shiva must stay in the background. Don't ask for assistance to be provided for the Nilkant, but to you, as a member of the Vasudev tribe seeking justice. They cannot say no to a just demand from the representative of Lord Ram. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. What does the Nilkant need, Lord Gopal? asked Shahrazad. He needs the Brahmastra to threaten Meluha. How did you... With due respect, don't ask superfluous questions, Lord Gopal. What Lord Shiva and you need is obvious. We have to devise the best way for you to get it. If you ask for the Brahmastra so that you can fight evil, then you will open yourself to questions as to Lord Shiva's legitimacy in deciding what evil is, for we all know that he has not been authorized or trained by the Vayuputras. Instead, seek redress for a crime committed on Indian soil by a person who the Vayuputras have supported in the past. And what crime was that? The unauthorized use of Devi Astras. Lord Priku, said Gopal, remembering the great Maharishi's use of the divine weapons in Panchavati. Exactly. The laws of Lord Rudra make it clear that for the first unauthorized use of Devi Astras, the punishment is a 14-year exile into the forests. A second unauthorized use is punishable by death. Many in the council agree that Lord Bhrigu has got away lightly despite having used Devi Astras. So, the Vasudevs are to present themselves as the one enforcing the justice of Lord Rudra. Exactly. It is impossible for a Vayuputra to say no to this. You should state that the law on the Devi Astra ban was broken and those who did this, Lord Bhrigu 
the emperor of Meluha and the king of Ayodhya need to be punished and the Vasudevs have decided to meet out justice. And we can tell the Vayuputras, said Shiva, completing Sherizad's thought, that they may well have more reserves of Devi Astras. So we need the Brahmastra to encourage them to do the right thing. Sherizad smiled. Use the laws to achieve your objective. Once you have the Brahmastra, use it to threaten the Meluhans. Evil must be stopped. But I have been asked to tell you that you shouldn't. We will never use the Brahmastra, said Gopal, interrupting Sherazad. It's not just about the laws of Lord Rudra, added Shiva. Using a weapon of such horrifying power goes against the laws of humanity. Sherazad nodded. When you meet the council, insist on speaking with Lord Mitra in private. Tell them it is a matter of the Devi Astra law being broken. Say that the Vasudevs cannot allow those who broke Lord Rudra's law to go unpunished. That will be enough. It will then be a private conversation between Lord Mitra and the two of you. You will get what you want. Shiva smiled as he understood who among the Vayuputras was helping him. But he was still intrigued by Shahrazad or whatever her real name was. Why are you helping us? asked Shiva. Because I have been told to do so. I don't believe that. Something else is driving you. Why are you helping us? Shahrazad smiled sadly and looked at the carpet. Then she turned towards the balcony, staring into the dark night beyond. She wiped a tear from the corner of her eye and turned back towards Shiva. Because there was a man whom I had loved once, who had told me that the Somras was turning evil, and I didn't believe him at the time. Who is this man? asked Gopal. It doesn't matter anymore, said Sherizad. He is dead. He was killed, perhaps by those who had wanted to stop him. Ending the reign of the Somras is my way of apologizing. Shiva leaned towards her, looked straight into Shahrazad's eyes and whispered, Tara? A stunned Shahrazad pulled back. Nobody had called her by that name in years. Shiva continued to observe her eyes. By the holy lake, he whispered, it is you. Shahrazad did not say anything. Her relationship with Brahaspati had been kept a secret. Many amongst the Parihans believed that the Somras was still a force for good and that the former chief scientist of Maluha was deeply biased and misguided about it. Tara would have preferred not having to live in Pareha as Shahrizad, but her presence here had served a purpose for her guru, Lord Brigu. Believing Brahaspati was dead, she had found no reason to return to her homeland. But you are Lord Brigu's student, said Shiva. Why are you going against him? I'm not Tara. I know you are, said Shiva. Why are you going against your Guru? Do you believe that it was Lord Brigu who got Brahaspati killed at Mount Mandar? Sherizad stood up and turned to leave. Shiva rose quickly, stretched out and held her hand. Brahaspati is not dead. A dumbstruck Sherizad stopped dead in her tracks. Brahaspati is alive, said Shiva. He is with me. Tears poured from Shahrazad's eyes. She couldn't believe what she was hearing. Shiva stepped forward and repeated gently, He is with me. Your Brahaspati is alive. Shahrazad kept crying, tears of confused happiness flowing down her cheeks. Shiva gently held her hand in his own. Tara, you will come back with us when we are done here. I'll take you back. I'll take you back to your Brahaspati. Shahrazad collapsed into Shiva's arms, inconsolable in her tears. She would be Tara once again. Chapter 38 The Friend of God The strategy that Tara had suggested worked like a charm. The Amartya Shpan was taken genuinely by surprise when Gopal entered their audience chamber without Shiva. When he raised the issue of Maharishi Bhrigu's misuse of the Devi Astras, they knew that they had been cornered. They had no choice but to grant Gopal an audience with the Mitra. That was the law. The following day, 
Shiva and Gopal were led into the official audience hall and residence of the Mitra. It had been built at one end of the city, the last building abutting the Mountain of Mercy. Unlike the rest of Pareha, this structure was incredibly modest. It had a simple base made of stone, which covered the water channel that emerged from the mountain. On it were constructed austere pillars, which supported a wooden roof four meters high. On entry, one immediately stepped into a simple audience hall, furnished with basic chairs and somber carpets. The Mitra's personal quarters lay further inside, separated by stone walls and a wooden door. Shiva could sense that this was almost a stone replica of a large ceremonial tent, the wooden tent poles having been converted to stone pillars and the cloth canopy into a wooden roof. In a way, this was a link to the nomadic past of Lord Rudra's people, when everybody lived in simple, easily built tents that could be dismantled and moved at short notice. Like a tribal leader of the old code, the Mitra lived in penurious simplicity while his people lived in luxury. The only indulgence that the Mitra had allowed himself was a beautiful garden that surrounded his abode. It was bountiful in its design, precise in its symmetry, and extravagant in its colorful flora. Shiva and Gopal were left alone in the audience hall, and the doors were shut. Within a few moments, the Mitra entered. Shiva and Gopal immediately stood up. They greeted the Mitra with the ancient Parihan salute. The left hand was placed on the heart, fist open, as a mark of admiration. The right arm was held rigidly to the side of the body, bent upwards at the elbow. The open palm of the right hand faced outwards as a form of greeting. The Mitra smiled genially and folded his hands together into the traditional Indian Namaste. Shiva grinned, but remained silent, waiting for the Mitra to speak. The Mitra was a tall, fair-skinned man, dressed in a simple brown cloak. A white hat covered his long brownish hair with tiny beads wrapped around separated strands of his beard, much like all Parihans. Though the sack-like cloak made it difficult to judge, his body seemed strong and muscular. Of interest to Shiva were his delicate hands with long slender fingers, like those of a surgeon rather than a warrior. But Shiva was most intrigued by the Mitra's nose, sharp and long. It reminded him of his beloved mother. The Mitra walked up to Shiva and held the Nilkant by his shoulders. What a delight it is to finally see you. Shiva noted that the Mitra didn't even cursorily glance at his blue neck, something most people could not resist. The Mitra's attention was focused on Shiva's eyes. And then the Mitra said something even more intriguing. You have your father's eyes and your mother's nose. He knew my father and my mother. Before Shiva could react, the Mitra gently touched Shiva's back as he smiled at Gopal. Come, let's sit. As soon as they had seated themselves, the Mitra turned towards the Nilkant. I can see the questions that are running through your mind. How do I know your father and mother? Who am I? What was my name before I became the Mitra? Shiva smiled. This eye-reading business is very dangerous. It doesn't allow one to have any secrets. Sometimes it's important that there be no secrets said the Mitra, especially when such big decisions are being taken. How else can we be sure that we have taken the right step? You don't have to answer if you don't wish to. The questions running in my mind are not important to our mission. You're right. You have been trained well. These questions may trouble your mind, but they are not important. But then, can we really carry out our mission with troubled minds? A troubled mind makes one lose sight of the mission, admitted Shiva. And the world cannot afford to have you lose sight of your mission, great Nilkant. You are too important for us. So let me answer your personal questions first. Shiva noticed that the Mitra had called him the Nilkant, something which no Parihan had until now. My name is not important, said the Mitra. I don't hold that name anymore. My only identity is my title, the Mitra. Shiva nodded politely. Now, 
How do I know your mother? Simple. I grew up with her. She was my sister. Shiva's eyes opened wide in surprise. You are my uncle? Mitra nodded. I was your uncle before I became the Mitra. Why have I not met you before? It's complicated. But suffice it to say that your father's brother, Lord Monobu, and I were good friends. I held him in deep regard. We decided to seal our friendship with a marriage between our two families. My sister went to live with Lord Manubu's brother in Tibet after their wedding, and you were born from that union. But my uncle had rebellious ideas, said Shiva, trying to guess why the Mitra had been forced to keep his distance from their family. The Mitra shook his head. Manubu didn't have rebellious ideas. He had inspiring ideas. But an inspiration before its time appears like a rebellion. So you were not forced by the Vayuputras to stay away from my family? Oh, I was forced all right, but not by the Vayuputras. Shiva smiled. Uncle Monobu could be stubborn at times. The Mitra smiled. When did you know that I was your long-lost relative? asked Shiva. Did you have spies following me? I recognized you the moment I heard your name. Didn't you know my name? No. Monubo refused to tell me. Now I understand why. It was a clue he'd left for me. If you emerged at all, I would recognize you by your name. How so? asked Shiva, intrigued. Almost nobody, even from amongst the Vayuputras, knows that Lord Rudra's mother had had a special and personal name for him. Shiva. What? Yes, Lord Rudra's name means the one who roars. He was named so because when he was born, he cried so loudly that he drove the midwife away. I've heard that story, said Shiva. But I have not heard the one about Lord Rudra's mother calling him Shiva. It's a secret that only a few Vayuputras are aware of. Legend holds that Lord Rudra was actually stillborn. What? asked a genuinely surprised Gopal. Yes, said the Mitra. The midwife and Lord Rudra's mother tried very hard to revive him. Finally, the midwife tried something very unorthodox. She tried to breastfeed the stillborn Lord Rudra. Much to his mother's surprise, the baby actually started breathing and, as history recalls, roared loudly. By the holy lake! whispered Shiva. What a fascinating story! Yes, it is. The midwife walked away soon thereafter and was never heard of again. Lord Rudra's mother, who was an immigrant and a believer in the mother goddess Shakti, was convinced that the midwife had been sent by the goddess to save her son. She believed her son was born as a body without life, a Shava, whom goddess Shakti had infused with life. Therefore, she felt the goddess had converted a Shava to Shiva, or the auspicious one. So she started calling her son Shiva in honor of the mother goddess and in acknowledgement of the state in which her son was born. An enthralled Shiva listened in rapt attention to the Mitra. So, said the Mitra, the moment I heard your name, I knew that Manubu had left a clue for me about you being the one he had trained. So you knew that Lord Monobu was planning this? The Mitra smiled. Your uncle and I made the medicine together. You mean the medicine that is responsible for my throat turning blue? Yes. But didn't that have to be given to me at a specific time in my life? I am assuming that is what Lord Monobu did, for here you are. But Lord Mitra... This is not the way the system was supposed to work as an unfolding series of implausible coincidences. There are so many things that could have gone wrong. To begin with, I may not have been trained well, or the medicine may not have been given to me at the right time. I may never have been invited to Maluha, and worst of all, I may not have stumbled upon the Somras as the true evil. 
You're right. This is not the way our Vayuputra system was designed to work. But Manubhu and I had faith that this is the way the universe's system is supposed to work. And it did, didn't it? But is it right to leave such significant outcomes to a roll of the universe's dice? You make it sound as if it was all left to dumb luck. We didn't leave it only to chance Shiva. The Vayuputras were sure the Somras had not turned evil. Monobu and I felt otherwise. Had Monobu been alive, he would have guided you through this period. But in spite of his untimely death, good prevailed. Monobu always said, let us allow the universe to make the decision. And it did. We decided to set in motion a chain of events which would work out only if the universe willed it so. Frankly, I wasn't sure. But I didn't stop him. I just didn't think his plan would succeed. And when I saw the plan coming to fruition, I knew that it was my duty to do whatever I could to help. But what if I had failed? What if I hadn't identified the Somras as evil? Then evil would have won, right? Sometimes the universe decides that evil is supposed to win. Perhaps a race or species has become so harmful that it's better to allow evil to triumph and destroy that species. It has happened before, but this is not one of those times. Shiva was clearly overwhelmed by the number of things that could have gone wrong. You are still troubled by something, said the Mitra. I've talked to Pandaji as well about this, said Shiva, pointing to Kopal. So much of what I have achieved in my mission can be attributed to pure luck, just a random turn of the universe. The Mitra bent forward towards Shiva and whispered, One makes one's own luck, but you have to give the universe the opportunity to help you. Shiva remained stoic, not quite convinced by the Mitra's words. You had every reason to turn away after arriving in Meluha for the first time. You were in a strange new land. Peculiar people who were evidently so much more advanced than you insisted on looking upon you as a god. You were tasked with a mission, the enormity of which would have intimidated practically anyone in the world. I'm sure that at the time you didn't even think you could succeed. And yet, you didn't run away. You stood up and accepted a responsibility that was thrust upon you. That decision was the turning point in your journey against evil, which had nothing to do with the twists and blessings of fate. Shiva looked at Gopal, whose demeanor suggested he was in full agreement with the Mitra. You are giving me too much credit, Lord Mitra, said Shiva. I am not, said the Mitra. You are on course to fulfill my mission without having taken any help from me. But I will not allow you to do that. You must give me the privilege of offering some help. Otherwise, how will I face the Ahura Mazda and Lord Rudra when I meet with them? Shiva smiled. The Mitra looked directly into Shiva's eyes. But there are some things I must be sure of. What do you plan to do with the Devi Astra? I plan to use it to threaten... Shiva stopped speaking as the Mitra raised his hand. I have seen enough, said the Mitra. Shiva frowned. Thoughts move faster than the tongue, great Nilkant. I know you will not use these terrible weapons of destruction. I can also see that the reason you will not do so is not just because of the Vayuputra ban, but because you believe that these weapons are too horrifying to ever be used. I do believe that. But I cannot give you the Brahmastra. This was unexpected. Shiva had thought the discussion had been going his way. I cannot give you the Brahmastra because it is too uncontrollable. It destroys anything and everything. Most importantly, its effect spreads out in circles. The worst destruction is in the epicenter where every living thing is instantly incinerated into thin air. While there is less destruction in the outer circles, the damage 
is still significantly widespread in the vicinity. So even if those outside the primary impact zone are not immediately killed, they suffer from the immense radiation unleashed by the Astra. With Lord Brigu on the other side, he is sure to bet that you are using the weapon only as a threat because you would not want to hurt your own army, which would most certainly be in the zone of radiation exposure. So what is the way forward? The Pashupati Astra. It is a weapon designed by Lord Rudra. It has all the power of the Brahmastra, but with much greater control. Its destruction is concentrated in the inner circle. Life outside this zone is not impacted at all. In fact, with the Pashupati Astra, you can even focus the effect in only one direction, leaving everything else in the other directions safe. If you threaten to use this weapon, Lord Brigu will know that you can destroy Devagiri without endangering your people or the adjoining areas. Then the threat will be credible. This made sense. Shiva agreed. But you cannot actually use the weapon, Nilkant, reiterated the Mitra. It will poison the area for centuries. The devastation is unimaginable. I give you my word, Lord Mitra, said Shiva. I will never use these weapons. The Mitra smiled. Then I have no problems in offering the Pashupati Astra to you. I will give the orders immediately. Shiva raised his chin as a faint smile played on his lips. I think you had already made your decision about this, even before you met me, uncle. The Mitra laughed softly. I am just Mitra. But you didn't expect it to be so easy, right? No, I didn't. I have heard stories about you, especially about the way you have fought your battles. You have behaved in an exemplary manner until now. Even when you could have gained by doing something wrong, you refrained from doing so. You didn't fall prey to the logic of doing a small wrong for the sake of the greater good, of the ends justifying the means. That takes moral courage. So yes, I had already made up my mind. But I wanted to see you in any case. You will be remembered as the greatest man of our age. Generations will look up to you as their god. How could I not want to meet you? I am, am no god, Lord Mitra, said an embarrassed Shiva. Wasn't it you who had said, Har Har Mahadev? All of us are gods. Shiva laughed. You've got me there. We don't become gods because we think we are gods, said the Mitra. That is only a sign of ego. We become gods when we realize that a part of the universal divinity lives within us. When we understand our role in this great world and when we strive to fulfill that role. There is nobody striving harder than you, Lord Nilkant. That makes you a god. And remember, gods don't fail. You cannot fail. Remember what your duty is. You have to take evil out of the equation. You shouldn't destroy all traces of the Somras, for it may become good in times to come, when it may be required once again. You have to keep the knowledge of the Somras alive. You will also have to create a tribe which will manage the Somras till it is required once again. Once all this is done, your mission will be over. I will not fail, Lord Mitra, said Shiva. I promise. I know you will succeed, smiled the Mitra, before turning to Gopal. Great Chief Vasudev, once the Nilkant creates his own tribe, the Vayuputras will not remain in charge of fighting evil anymore. It will be the task of the Nilkant's tribe. Our relationship with the Vasudevs will become like one between distant relatives rather than the one which has entailed a joint duty towards a common cause. Your relationship with the Vasudevs and with my country will exist forever, Lord Mitra, said Gopal. You have helped us in our hour of need. I am sure that in turn, we will help Pariha if it ever needs us. Thank you, said the Mitra.
Chapter 39 He is one of us. The Mithra called the entire city to the town center the following morning. Shiva and Gopal stood next to him as he addressed the crowd. My fellow Vayuputras, I'm sure your minds are teeming with many questions and doubts. But this is not the time for that. This is the time for action. We trusted a man who had worked closely with us. We trusted him with our knowledge. But he betrayed us. Lord Brigu broke the laws of Lord Rudra. Lord Gopal, the chief of the Vasudevs and the representative of Lord Ram, has come here demanding justice. But in this moment, it is not just about retribution for what Lord Brigu has done. It's also about justice for India, justice to Lord Rudra's principles. There is a purpose that we all serve, Parihans. It is beyond laws. It is one that was defined by Lord Rudra himself. Pointing at Shiva, the Mitra continued, Behold this man. He may not be a Vayuputra, but he does bear the blue throat. He may not be a Parihan, but he fights like one with honor and integrity. We may not have recognized him, but the Vasudevs consider him the Nilkant. He may not have lived amongst us, but he respects and idolizes Lord Rudra as much as we do. Above all, he is fighting for Lord Rudra's cause. The Vayuputras listened with rapt attention. Yes, he is not a Vayuputra, and yet he is one of us. I am supporting him in his battle against evil. And so shall you. Many among the Vayuputras were swayed by the Mitra's words. Those who weren't were nevertheless aware that it was within the Mitra's legal rights to choose whom to support within India. So, while their reasons to do so may have differed, all the Vayuputras fell in line with the Mitra's decision. Shiva and Gopal received a large crate the following evening. An entire Parihan cavalry platoon had been arranged to transport this incredibly heavy trunk safely back to the sea. Never having seen the material of the Pashupati Astra, Shiva assumed from the size of the trunk that they were carrying a huge quantity, probably enough to threaten an entire city. He was therefore amazed by Gopal's clarification that they were carrying only a handful of the Pashupati Astra material. Are you serious? Yes, Lord Nilkant, said Gopal. Just a handful is enough to destroy entire cities. The trunk has massive insulation made of lead and wet clay, besides the leaves of imported bilva trees. Together, these will protect us from exposure to the Pashupati Astra radiation. By the holy lake, said Shiva. The more I learn about the Devi Astras, the more I'm convinced that they are the weapons of the demons. They are, my friend. That's why Lord Rudra called them evil and banned their use. That is also why we will not use the Pashupati Astra. We will only threaten to use it. But to make it a credible threat to the Maluhans, we will actually have to set up the weapon outside Devagiri. Do you know how to do that? No, I don't. Most of the Vayuputras are not privy to that knowledge either. Only a select few are authorized to be in the know. There is a combination of engineering construction, mantras and other preparations that we would have to follow in order to set up this weapon. We would have to do this properly so as to convey a credible threat to Lord Brigu since he does know how the Pashupati Astra is prepared for use. Lord Mitra and his people will commence our training from tomorrow morning. Parvateshwar moved his attention away from those sitting with him and cast a look outside the window of the Karachapa governor's residence. They were on the Dwitya or second platform of the city and from this height Parvateshwar had a clear view of the western sea which stretched far into the horizon. The sea is the only way we have, said Parvateshwar. Brigu and Dilipa turned towards Parvateshwar. Dilipa's Ayodhyan army had finally arrived in Maluha many months after the Battle of Devagiri. 
they had sailed on to Karachapa to join Parvateshwar's Surya Vanshi forces. But General, isn't that the entire idea behind coming to Karachapa? Asked Dilipa. To attack Lothal by sea? What's new about that idea? I'm not talking about attacking the city, Your Highness. While there were now 400,000 troops based in Karachapa under the command of Parvateshwar, he knew that it was not really enough to defeat a well-entrenched force of 250,000 in the well-designed citadel of Lothal. And despite all attempts at provocation, Sati had resolutely refused to step out of Lothal, thus giving Parvateshwar no opportunity to bring his numerical superiority into play in an open battlefield. The war had, for all practical purposes, ground to a stalemate. Please explain, General, said Brigu, hoping the Maluhan army chief had come up with some brilliant idea to end the stalemate. What is your plan? I think we should send forth a fleet towards the Narmada River, making sure that these ships are visible. Dilipa frowned. Have your spies discovered the route that Lord Shiva took? The Maluhans were aware that Shiva and Gopal had sailed to the Narmada, but they had lost track of them thereafter. They assumed that the duo may have used the Narmada route to steal into Panchavati or Ujjain. To what purpose was still a mystery to the Maluhans. No, answered Parvateshwar. Then what's the point of making our ships sail out in that direction? The Nilgan scouts and spies will surely get to know that our ships are sailing to the Narmada. We'll lose the element of surprise. That is precisely what I want, said Parvateshwar. We don't want to hide. By the great Lord Brahma, exclaimed an impressed Bhrigu. General Parvateshwar, have you discovered the Narmada route to Panchavati? No, my lord. Then I don't understand. Oh, right. Bhrigu stopped mid-sentence as he finally understood what Parvateshwar had in mind. I'm not aware of the Narmada route to Panchavati, said Parvateshwar. But the Lord Nilkan's army doesn't know that I don't know. They may assume that we have discovered this precious route and that the Lord's life is in danger. Furthermore, the Nagas are a substantial segment of the warriors in that army. Will they keep quiet in the face of an imminent danger to their capital Panchavati, the city established by their goddess Bhumidevi? They'll be forced to sail out of Lothal, said Dilipa. Exactly, said Parvateshwar. Since our contingent will be approximately 50 ships, they will have to match our numbers. We will make our ships wait in ambush in a lagoon far beyond the Narmada Delta. And once they've begun sailing up the Narmada, we'll charge in from behind and attack them, said Dilipa. No, said Parvateshwar. No? asked a surprised Dilipa. No, your highness. I intend to send out a crack team of commandos in advance to the Narmada. They will wait for the Naga ships to race up river till they have travelled a considerable distance away from the sea. Naval movements in a river are constricted no matter how large the river. Their fleet will be sailing close to each other. Our commandos will have devil boats with firewood and flints ready for our enemies. Our task will be to take out the first as well as the last line of ships simultaneously. Brilliant! They will lose their fleet, their soldiers will be adrift. Then our own fleet can charge in from the hidden lagoon and cut their soldiers down. No, Your Highness, said Parvateshwar, thinking he wouldn't have needed to explain all this to someone with the strategic brilliance of Shiva. Our fleet is not going to engage in battle at all. It's only a decoy. Our main attack will be carried out by the commandos. If the first and last line of the enemy ships are set on fire, there's a pretty good chance that all the ships in between too will eventually catch fire. But won't that take too long? asked Brigo. Many of their soldiers will be able to abandon ship and escape onto land. True, said Parvateshwar, but they will be stranded far from their base with no ships. I had learnt at Panchavati that there is no road between Maika Lothal and the Narmada. It will take them at least six months to march back to Lothal through those dense, impenetrable forests. I'm hoping that on seeing the size of our decoy fleet, Sati will commit at least 100,000 men to attack us. And with those 100,000 enemy soldiers stuck in the jungles of the Narmada, our army would become vastly superior numerically 
a ratio of almost 4 to 1. We could then attack and probably take Lothal. Dilipa still hadn't understood the entire plan. But many of our own soldiers will also be in the decoy fleet, right? So we'll have to wait for them to come back to Karachapa and then... I'm not planning on using our decoy fleet to engage in battle, said Parvateshwar. So we're not going to load them up with soldiers. We'll only keep a skeletal staff, enough to set sail. We will not commit more than 5,000 men. Imagine what we can achieve. Only 5,000 of our men, including the commandos, will leave Karachappa. But we would have removed nearly 100,000 of the enemy men, leaving them stranded in the jungles around the Narmada at least six months away from Lothal. And not a single arrow will have been fired. We can then go ahead and easily march in to capture Lothal. Brilliant, said Brigo. We will move towards Lothal as soon as our ships leave for the Narmada. No, my lord, said Parvateshwar. I'm sure Sati has scouts lurking in and around Karachappa. If they see 400,000 of our troops marching out of the city, they will know that our ships are thinly manned and will therefore understand our ruse. Our army will have to remain hidden within the walls of Karachappa to convince them that our attack on Panchavati is genuine. The customs officer at Karachappa frowned at the merchant ship manifest. Cotton from Egypt? Why would any Miluhan want cotton from Egypt? They're no match for our own cotton. The customs procedure in Meluha was based on a system of trust. Ship manifests would be accepted at face value and the relevant duty applied. It was also accepted that, on random occasions, a customs officer could cross-check the shipload if he so desired. This was possibly one of those random occasions. The officer turned to his assistant. Go down to the ship hold and check. The ship captain looked nervously to his right at the closed door of the deck cabin and turned back to the customs officer. What is the need for that, sir? Do you think that I would lie about this? You know that the amount of cotton I have declared matches the maximum carrying capacity of this ship. There is no way you can charge me a higher custom duty. Your search will serve no purpose. The Maluhan customs officer looked towards the cabin that the captain had surreptitiously glanced at. The door suddenly swung open and a tall, well-built man stepped out and stretched his arms as he lazily yawned. What's the delay, Captain? The customs officer held his breath as he recognized the man. He instantly executed a smart Maluhan military salute. Brigadier Vidun Mali, I didn't know you were on this ship. Now you know, said Vidun Mali, yawning once more. I'm sorry, my lord, said the customs officer, as he immediately handed the manifest back to the captain and ordered his assistant to issue the receipt for the duty payment. The paperwork was done in no time. The customs officer started to leave, but then turned back and hesitatingly asked Vidyan Mali, My lord, you are one of our greatest warriors. Why isn't our army deploying you at the battlefront? Vidyan Mali shook his head with a wry grin. I'm not a warrior now, officer. I'm a bodyguard. And also, as it now appears, a transporter of royal fashions. The customs officer smiled politely and then hurried off the ship. Why the delay? asked the Egyptian. Vidyan Mali had just entered the hold below the lowermost deck deep in the ship's belly. The only porthole, high in one corner, had been shut tight and it was unnaturally dark. As his eyes adjusted, he was able to see the countenance of about 300 assassins sitting with cat-like stillness in a huddle. Nothing important, Lord Swath, said Vidyan Mali to the Egyptian. A stupid customs officer got it in his head to check the ship's hold. It's been taken care of. We're sailing past Karachapa now. We will be in the heart of Maluha soon. There's no turning back. Swath nodded silently. My lord, said the captain, as he entered quietly with a shielded torch. Vidyan Mali took the torch from the captain, who was followed by two men carrying large jute bags. They left the bags next to Vidyan Mali. Wait outside, said Vidyan Mali. The captain and his men obeyed. Vidyan Mali turned towards the Egyptian. 
Swarth was the chief of the shadowy group of Egyptian assassins that Vidyun Mali was escorting back to Devagiri. The sweaty heat of the closed ship hold had made Swarth and his assassins strip down to their loincloths. Vidyun Mali could see the several battle scars that lined Swarth's body in the dim light of the flaming torch. But it was the numerous tattoos on him that drew his attention. The Maluhan brigadier was familiar with one of them, a black fireball on the bridge of his nose with rays streaming out in all directions. It was usually the last thing that his hapless victims saw before being butchered. The fireball represented the god that Swat and his assassins believed in, Aten, the sun god. I thought that Ra was a sun god for the Egyptians, said Vidyun Mali. Swat shook his head. Most people call him Ra, but they're wrong. Aten is a correct name. And this symbol, said Swat, pointing to the fireball on his nose, is his mark. And the jackal tattoo on your arm? asked Vidyan Mali. It's not a jackal. It's an animal that looks like a jackal. We call it Sha. This is the mark of the god I am named after. Vidyan Mali was about to move on to the other tattoos, but Swat raised his hand. I have too many tattoos on my body and too little interest in small talk, said Swat. You're paying me good money, Brigadier, so I will do your job. You don't need to build a relationship with me to motivate me. Let's talk about what you really want. Vidyan Mali smiled. It was always a pleasure to work with professionals. They focused all their attention on the work at hand. The mission that Emperor Daksh had tasked him with was difficult. Any brute could kill, but to kill with so many conditions attached required professionals. It needed artists who were dedicated to their dark art. My apologies, said Vidyan Mali. I'll get down to it right away. That would be good, said Swart sarcastically. We don't want anybody recognizing you. Swart narrowed his eyes as though he'd just been insulted. Nobody ever sees us killing Brigadier Vidyan Mali. More often than not, even our victims don't see us while they're being killed. Vidyan Mali shook his head. But I want you to be seen, only not recognized. Swat frowned. Vidyan Mali walked over to one of the jute bags, opened it and pulled out a large black cloak and a mask. I need all of you to wear this, and I want you to be seen as you kill. Swat picked up the cloak and recognized it instantly. It was a garment that the Nagas wore whenever they traveled abroad. He stared at the mask. He was aware that these were worn during holy celebrations. Swat looked at Vidyan Mali, his eyes two narrow slits. You want people to think the Nagas did it? Vidyan Mali nodded. These cloaks will constrain our movements, said Swat, and the masks will restrict our vision. We're not trained with these accoutrements. Are you telling me that the warriors of Aten can't do this? Swat took a deep breath. Please leave. Vidyan Mali stared at Swat, stunned by his insolence. Leave, clarified Swat, so that we can wear these cloaks and practice. Vidyan Mali smiled and rose. Brigadier, said Swat, please leave the torch here. Of course said Vidyan Mali, fixing the torch on its clutch before walking out of the ship's hold. Chapter 40 Ambush on the Narmada They aren't coming here? exclaimed a surprised Sati. Together with Kali, Ganesh and Karthik, she had been enjoying a family moment, accompanied by rounds of sweet saffron milk. They were soon joined by Bhagirath, Chandraketu, Matali, Brahaspati and Chinardhwaj with some fresh news. The information received earlier from the Vasudevs had suggested that a fleet of nearly 50 ships had sailed out of Karachapa a few weeks back. They had expected them to head for Lothal, but the latest news was that the ships had turned south. 
It looks like they're heading towards the Narmada, said the Vasudev Pandit, who had just walked in with the information. That can't be! A panic-stricken Kali looked at Ganesh. Kali had not agreed with Shiva's tactic of misleading the Maluhans by pretending to go to the Narmada and from there sailing on to Pareha. She was afraid that this would give the Maluhans a clue as to the possible route to Panchavati. Shiva had dismissed her concerns, saying that Bhrigu knew that the river near the Panchavati flowed from west to east, whereas the Narmada flowed east to west. Clearly, Panchavati was not on the Narmada itself. The Maluhans would know that, even if they sailed up the Narmada, they would have to pass the dense Dandak forests to be able to reach Panchavati. And doing so was fraught with danger without a Naga guide. Therefore, the news of the Maluhan navy sailing towards the Narmada left Kali with only one logical conclusion. They had discovered the route to Panchavati. How would they know the Narmada path to Panchavati? asked a bewildered Ganesh. Kali turned on Sati. Your husband did not listen to me and stupidly insisted on sailing towards the Narmada. Kali, the Maluhans are in the know of all our goings and comings on the Narmada, said Sati calmly. It's no secret. But they would have no idea how to travel from the Narmada to Panchavati. Shiva has not given anything away. Bullshit! shouted Kali. And it's not just Shiva's fault, it's yours as well. I had told you to kill that traitor Didi. You and your misplaced sense of honor will lead to the destruction of my people. Mossi, said Ganesh to Kali, immediately springing to his mother's defense. I don't think we should blame Ma for this. It's entirely possible that it's not General Parvateshwar, but Lord Bhrigu who has discovered the Narmada route. After all, he did know the Godavari route, right? Of course, Ganesh, said Kali sarcastically. It's not General Parvateshwar. And it obviously cannot be your beloved mother's fault either. Why would the most devoted son in the history of mankind think that his mother could make a mistake? Kali, whispered Sati. Kali continued her rant. Have you forgotten that you're a Naga? That you're a lord of the people, sworn to protect your tribe to the last drop of your blood? Bhagirat decided to step in before things got out of hand. Queen Kali, there is no point in going on about how the Maluhans discovered the Narmada route. What we should be discussing is, what are we going to do next? How do we save Panchavati? Kali turned to Bhagirath and snapped. We don't need to be Maharishis to know what needs to be done. Fifty ships will set sail tomorrow with all the Naga warriors on it. The Meluhans will regret the day they decided to attack my people. Kali, Ganesh and Karthik had assembled at Lothal's circular port along with a hundred thousand men comprising all the Nagas and many Branga warriors clambering aboard their ships rapidly. They knew that time was at a premium. Sati had come to the port to see her family off. She was going to stay in Lothal. She suspected the Maluhans might mount a siege on their city at the same time to try and take advantage of her divided army. Kali approached Sati softly. Kali gave her a withering look and then turned her back on her sister, screaming instructions to her soldiers. Board quickly! Hurry up! Ganesh and Karthik stepped forward, bent to touch her feet and take their mother's blessings. We'll be back soon, Ma, said Ganesh, smiling awkwardly. Sati nodded. I'll be waiting. Do you have any instructions for us, Ma? asked Karthik. Sati looked at her sister, who still had her back turned stiffly towards her. Take care of your Mossi. Kali heard what Sati said, but refused to respond. Sati stepped up and touched Kali on her shoulder. I'm sorry about General Parvateshwar. I only did what I thought was right. Kali stiffened her shoulders. Didi, one who clings to moral arrogance, even at the cost of the lives of others, is not necessarily the most moral person. Sati remained quiet, staring sadly at Kali's back. She could see Kali's two extra arms on top of her shoulders quivering, a sure sign that the Naga queen was deeply agitated. Kali turned and glared at her sister. My people will not suffer for your addiction to moral glory, Didi. Saying this, Kali stormed off, verbally lashing out at her soldiers to board the ship quickly.
Ganakla couldn't believe what she was hearing. A real shot at peace. This is the best news that I've heard in a long time, Your Highness, said Ganakla. Daksha smiled genially. I hope you understand this has to be kept secret. There are many people who do not want peace. They think that the only way to end this is an all-out war. Kanakla looked at Vidyanmali, standing next to Daksh. She had always assumed he was a warmonger. She was surprised to see him agreeing with the Emperor. Perhaps, thought Kanakla, the Emperor is referring to Lord Brigu as the one who doesn't want peace with the Nilkant. We've seen the loss of life and devastation caused by minor battle that was staged outside Devagiri, said Daksh. It was only Sati's wisdom that stopped it from descending into a massacre that would have hurt both Meluha and the Lord Nilkant. Maybe it's his love for Sati that is forcing the Emperor's hand. He would never allow any harm to come to his daughter. Whatever the reason, I will support him in his peace initiative. What are you thinking, Kanakla? Nothing important, my lord. I'm just happy that you're willing to discuss peace. You have your work cut out, said Daksh. An entire peace conference has to be organized at short notice. We will name it, in keeping with tradition, after our Prime Minister, the Yagna of Kanakla. An embarrassed Kanakla smiled. You're most kind, my lord, but the name doesn't matter. What matters is peace. Yes, peace is paramount. That is why you must take my instruction of secrecy seriously. Under no circumstances should the news of the peace conference reach Karachapa. Karachapa was where Lord Brigu had stationed himself, along with King Dilipa of Ayodhya and General Parvateshwar. Yes, my lord, said Kanakla. A happy Kanakla rushed to her office to get down to immediate work. Daksh waited for the door of his private office to shut before turning to Vidyanmali. I hope Swat and his people will not fail me. They will not, my lord, said Vidyanmali. Have faith in me. This will be the end of that barbarian from Tibet. Everyone will blame the Nagas. They are perceived as bloodthirsty, irrational killers in any case. No reasonable citizen here has been able to swallow that fraud Nilkant's championing of the Nagas. Just like they didn't accept the freeing of the Vikarmas, regardless of the greatness of Drapaku. The people will readily believe that the Nagas killed him. And my daughter will return to me, said Daksh. She'll have no choice. We'll be a family again. Delusions create the most compelling of beliefs. Shiva, Gopal and Tara stood on the foredeck of their merchant ship. The Parihans had helped in loading their precious merchandise onto the vessel. With everyone having said their goodbyes, the Nilkant had just ordered his ship to set sail on the Jam Sea. Shahrizad, said Gopal. How long? Tara, please, she interrupted the Chief Vasudev. Sorry? My name is Tara now, Great Vasudev, said Tara. Shahrizad was left behind in Pareha. Gopal smiled. Of course, my apologies. Tara it is. What was your question? I was wondering how long you lived in Pareha. Too long, said Tara. Initially, I had gone on an assignment that Lord Brigu had given me. I thought that it would be a short stay. He had assigned me to work on the Devi Astras with the Vayu Putras and said I could return only when he gave his permission. But after I heard of Braspati's death, I saw no reason to return. Well, Braspati is not too far off now, said Gopal kindly. Just a couple of weeks more on the Jam Sea and then we will be sailing east on the Western Sea to Lothal and to Braspati. Tara smiled happily. Yes, said Shiva, playfully cracking a joke on the meaning of jam. But it's all very confusing. The sea that you come to will be the sea that we go from now. And then we have to travel east on the western sea. Only the holy lake knows where we'll finally land up. Tara raised her eyebrows. I know, said Shiva. It's a terrible joke. I guess the law of averages catches up with everyone. Tara burst out laughing. It's not your joke that astonished me. Though I agree, it really was a terrible joke. Thank you, <laughs> laughed Shiva softly. But what exactly were you surprised by? 
I'm assuming you think Jam means to come to. Shiva turned to Gopal with a raised eyebrow, for it was the chief Vasudev who had told him the meaning. Doesn't Jam mean to come to? asked Gopal. That is what everyone thinks, said Tara, except for the Parehans. What do they believe? asked Shiva. Jam is a lord of Dharm. So, this sea is actually the sea of the lord of Dharm. Shiva smiled. But in India, the lord of Dharm is Yam, said Tara, completing Shiva's statement. Also, the lord of death. Exactly. Is there a relationship between the two names, Yam and Jam? Was there a great leader or god called Jam in Pareha? I don't know about any relationship between the names. But in ancient times, there was a shepherd called Jam, who, blessed by the Ahura Mazda, went on to become a great king, one of the earliest in this area. He spread prosperity and happiness throughout the land. When a great catastrophe was to strike that would have destroyed the entire world, he is believed to have built an underground city which saved many of his people. The citizens of his realm later began to call him Jamshed. Why Shade? Shade means radiant. So Jamshed means a radiant lord of Dharm. Chapter 41 An Invitation for Peace Sati, Bhagirath, Chandraketu, Mathali and Brahaspati had collected in the Lothal governor Chinardhwaj's private office. They had just received a visitor from Devagiri with a message from Kanakla, a message that had left them stunned. Peace conference? asked Bhagirath. What deception are they planning? Prince Bhagirath, rebuked the Lothal governor, Chinardhwaj. This is Meluha. Laws are not broken here. And the laws of a peace conference are very clear. They were designed by Lord Ram himself. There is no question of there being any deception. But what about the attack on Panchavati? Asked Madhali, the king of Vishali. They have clearly found the Narmada route to the Naga capital and have sent their ships on an attack mission, even as they try to sidetrack us. How is that subterfuge, King Madhali? Asked Chinadhaj. They are at war with us. They found a weak spot and decided to attack. That is how wars are conducted. I don't have a problem with the Meluhans choosing to attack Governor Janadhwaj, said Chandraketu, the king of Branga. What is worrying is that they chose to attack Panchavati and call a peace conference at the same time. That sounds fishy to me. I agree, said Bhagirath. Maybe it is a ruse to draw us out of the city with a call for a peace conference and then attack us. Without the protective defenses of the Lothal fort, we may well be beaten by the Meluhans. Prince Bhagirath, said Brahaspati, we have also received word that the Meluhan army has still not marched out of Karachapa. If their plan was to trick us out of Lothal, why wouldn't they mobilize their army at the same time? Chandraketu nodded. That is confusing. Maybe there are divisions within Meluha, suggested Brahaspati. Maybe some people want peace while others want war. We cannot trust this initiative blindly, said Sati, but we cannot ignore it either. If there's a possibility that the Somras can be stopped without any more killing, it is worth grabbing, right? But the message is for Lord Shiva, said Bhagirath. Shouldn't we await his return? Sati shook her head. That may take months. We don't even know if he has succeeded in convincing the Vayuputras. What if he hasn't? We would then be in a very weak position to negotiate a ban on the Somras. It's a stalemate right now. Even the Maluhans know that. Who knows? We might be able to negotiate good terms at the conference. We could, said Chandraketu. Or we might just march straight into a trap and have our entire army destroyed. Sati knew that this was a difficult decision. It couldn't be made in a hurry. I need to think about this some more. She said, ending the discussion. Sati walked into the heavily guarded room. The visitor from Devagiri, who had carried Kanakra's message, 
had been detained in a comfortable section of the Lothal governor's office. While the messenger had been treated well, the windows of his room had been boarded up and the doors kept locked at all times, as abundant caution. He had been blindfolded while being allowed into the city and was led straight to this room. His men had been made to wait outside the city. Sati did not want the peace envoy to take note of the defensive arrangements within the city. Your Highness, said the Maluhan, as he rose and saluted Sati. She was still the princess of Maluha for him. Brigadier Maya Shrenik, said Sati with a formal namaste. She had always thought well of the Arishtanemi Brigadier. Maya Shrenik looked towards the door with a frown. Isn't the Nilkant joining us? Riku had decided against sharing intelligence with Daksh at Devagiri. It would only cause Daksha's unwelcome interference in war strategies to continue, which Parvateshwar, being a disciplined Maluhan, would find very difficult to constantly withstand. Therefore, Maya Shranik, like every Maluhan in Devagiri, did not know what Parvateshwar in Karachapa suspected. That Shiva may have sailed up the Narmada and then marched on to Panchavati. Sati obviously didn't want to reveal to Maya Shrenik that Shiva was not in Lothal. But she didn't want to lie either. No. But when you speak with me, said Sati, interrupting him, it's as good as speaking with him. Maya Shrenik frowned. Is it that the Lord Nilkant doesn't want to meet me? Doesn't he want peace? Does he think that destroying Meluha is the only way forward? Shiva does not think that Maluha is evil. Only the Somras is evil. And of course, he is very willing to sue for peace if Maluha meets just one simple demand. Abandon the Somras. Then he must come for the peace conference. That's where the problem lies. How can we believe that Kanakla's invitation is genuine? Your Highness, said a stunned Maya Shrenik, surely you do don't think Maluha would lie about a peace conference. How can we? Lord Ram's laws forbid it. Maluhans may always follow the law, Brigadier. My father doesn't. Your Highness, the Emperor's efforts are genuine. And why should I believe that? I'm sure your spies have already told you that Maharishi Brigu is in Karachappa. So? Maharishi Brigu is the one who doesn't want any compromise, Your Highness. Your father wants peace. He has an opportunity for it while the Maharishi is away. You know that once your father signs a peace treaty, it will be very difficult for the Maharishi Brigu to overrule it. Meluha recognizes only the Emperor's orders. Even now, while Maharishi Brigu may give the orders, they are all issued in the name of the Emperor. You want me to believe that my father has suddenly developed enough character to stand up for what he thinks is right? You're being unfair. Really? Don't you know that he killed my first husband? He has no respect for the law. But he loves you. Sati rolled her eyes in disgust. Please, Maya Shrenik. Do you really expect me to believe that he's pushing for peace because he loves me? He saved your life, Your Highness. What utter nonsense! Have you also fallen for that ridiculous explanation? Do you really believe that my father threw out my Naga child and kept him hidden from me for nearly 90 years so he could save my life? No, he didn't. He did it because he wanted to protect his own name. He didn't want people to know that Emperor Daksh has had a Naga grandchild. That is the reason why he broke the law. I'm not talking about what happened 90 years ago, Your Highness. I'm talking about what happened just a few years ago. What? How do you think the alarm went off at Panchavati? Sati remained silent, stunned by the revelation. The timely triggering of that alarm saved your life. How do you know about that? Lord Brigo had sent the ships to destroy Panchavati. But your father sent me to sabotage that operation. I triggered the alarm that saved all of you. I did it on your father's orders. He harmed his empire and his interests in order to protect you. Sati stared at Maya Shrenik, gobsmacked. I don't believe you. 
It is the truth, Your Highness, said Maya Shanik. You know I don't lie. Sati took a deep breath and looked away. Even if His Highness is thinking of peace only because of his love for you and not because of his duty towards Meluha, wouldn't our country benefit all the same? Do we really want this war to continue till Meluha is destroyed? Sati held her counsel as she turned towards Maya Shrenik. Please speak to the Nilkant, my lady. He listens to you. The peace offer is genuine. Sati didn't say anything. May I please have an audience with the Nilkant, Your Highness? Asked Maya Shrenik, still unsure of whether Sati had committed herself to peace. No, you may not, said Sati. One of my guards will guide you to the city gates. Go back to Devagiri. I will give serious thought to what you have said. We should consider attending the peace conference, said Sati. She was in conference with Bhagirath, Brahaspati, Janardhwaj, Chandraketu and Mathali at the governor's residence. That is not a wise idea, my lady, said Bhagirath. Only Lord Ram can know what traps they may have set for us. On the contrary, I think it may be very wise. Is there a good possibility that the army in Karachapa doesn't know what my father is doing in Devagiri? It's possible, said Brahaspati. But do you actually think your father is driving the peace conference? Does he have the strength to push his way through? Perhaps it's not him alone. Prime Minister Kanakla is certainly involved for one, said Sati. The invitation is in her name. Kanakla has influence over the emperor, no doubt, agreed Janadhwaj. And she is certainly not a warmonger. Her instincts are usually towards peace. Also, she is a devoted follower of the Nilkant. Does she have the capability to enforce the peace accord? Asked Bhagirath. Yes, she does, said Sati. The Maluhan system works on the principle of written orders. The supreme written order is the one that comes from the Emperor. Lord Briku does not issue orders himself. He asks my father to ratify what he deems fit. If my father issues an order on peace before Lord Briku gets to know of it, all Maluhans will be forced to honor it. So, if Prime Minister Kanakla can get my father to issue the order, she can enforce the peace accord. If we can achieve the objective of removing the Somras without any further bloodshed, it will be a deed that Lord Rudra would be proud of, said Matari. But we should respond carefully, persisted a cautious Bhagirath. If it is true that the peace is being pursued only by Emperor Daksh and Prime Minister Kanakla, we will put our army at risk if we march out. Karachapa is not very far. Right, said Sati, with healthy respect for the tactical brilliance of General Parvateshwar. If Pitratulya in Karachapa hears about our army moving out, he'll assume that we're attacking Devagiri. He'll race out of Karachapa to intercept us at the Saraswati River. Damned if we respond and damned if we don't, said Chandraketu. So what do we do? asked Janardhwaj. I'll go, said Sati. The rest of you, including the army, should stay within the walls of Lothal. My lady, said Matali, that is most unwise. You will need the army's protection to prevent any possible harm to your person in Devagiri. The Miluhans may fight with my army outside Devagiri said Sati. But they'll not fight me alone. It's my father's house. Bhagirath shook his head. My apologies, my lady, but your father has not proved himself to be a paragon of virtue so far. I would be wary of your travelling to Devagiri without protection. We cannot discount the remote possibility that the peace conference is a ruse to draw our leaders to Devagiri and then assassinate them. Chinadvaj was genuinely offended now. Prince Bhagirath, I say this for the last time. These things do not happen in Meluha. Arms cannot be used at a peace conference under any circumstances. Those are the rules of Lord Ram. No Meluhan will break the laws of the seventh Vishnu. Sita raised her hand, signaling a call for calm, and then turned towards Bhagirath. Prince, trust me. My father will never harm me. He loves me. In his own twisted way, he really does care for me. 
I'm going to Devagiri. This is our best shot at peace. It is my duty not to let it slip by. Bhagirath could not shake off his sense of foreboding. My lady, I insist you allow me and an Ayodhyan brigade to travel with you. Your men will be put to better use here, Prince Bhagirath, said Sadi. Also, you and your soldiers are Chandravanshis. Please don't misunderstand me, but I would much rather take some Suryavanshis along. After all, I'm going to the Suryavanshi capital. I'll go with Nandi and my personal bodyguards. But my child, said Braspati, that is only 100 soldiers. Are you sure? It is a peace conference, Braspati ji, said Sati. Not a battle. But the invitation was for the Lord Nilkant, said Chandraketu. The Lord Nilkant has appointed me as his representative, Your Highness, said Sati. I can negotiate on his behalf. I have made up my mind. I am going to Devagiri. I have a bad feeling about this, my lady, pleaded Virbhadra. Please don't go. Also assembled in Sati's private chamber were Parshuram and Nandi, whose expressions were equally anguished. Virbhadra, don't worry, said Sati. I will return with a peace treaty that will end the war as well as the reign of the Somras. But why aren't you allowing Veer Bhadra and me to accompany you, my lady? asked Parshuram. Why is only Nandi being given the privilege of travelling with you? Sati smiled. I would have loved to have the both of you with me. It's just that I'm only taking Surya Vanshis, that's all. They're familiar with the Maluhan customs and ways. This is going to be a sensitive conference anyway. I wouldn't want anything going wrong inadvertently, even before it begins. But, my lady, continued Parshuram, we have sworn to protect you. How can we just let you go without us? I'll be with her, Parshuram, said Nandi. Don't worry, I won't let anything happen to Lady Sati. There is absolutely no reason why anything untoward should happen, Nandi. It's a peace conference. And if we don't arrive at a peaceful settlement, the Maluhans will have to allow us to return unharmed. That is Lord Ram's law. Veerbhadra continued to brood silently, clearly unconvinced. Sati reached out and patted Veerbhadra on his shoulder. He must make an attempt at peace, you know that. We can save the lives of so many. I have no choice, I must go. You do have a choice, argued Veerbhadra. Don't go yourself. I'm sure you can nominate someone to attend the conference on your behalf. Sati shook her head. No, I must go. I must, because it was my fault. What? It was my fault that so many of our soldiers died in Devagiri and our elephant corps was destroyed. I am to blame for the loss of almost our entire cavalry. It is because of me that we do not have enough strength to beat them in an open battle now. Since it is my fault, it is now my responsibility to set it right. The loss in Devagiri was not your fault, my lady, said Parshuram. Circumstances were aligned against us. In fact, you salvaged a lot from a terrible situation. Sati narrowed her eyes. If an army loses, it is always because of the general's poor planning. Circumstance is just an excuse for the weak to rationalize their failures. However, I have been given another chance to make up for my blunder. I cannot ignore it. I will not. My lady, said Virbhadra, please listen to me. Bhadra, said Sati, using the name her husband did for his best friend. I am going. I will return unharmed and with a peace treaty. Chapter 42 Kanakla's Choice The invitation for the peace conference had been accepted. Kanakla rushed to Daksha's private office the minute she received a bird courier from Lothal. The door attendant tried to stop her, saying the emperor had asked him not to let anyone enter. Kanakla brushed him aside. That order would not have included me. He asked me to meet him as soon as I received this, said Kanakla pointing to a folded letter. The door attendant moved aside and Kanakla heard whispers as soon as she opened the door. 
Vidyan Malay and Daksh were speaking softly with each other. She gently shut the door behind her. Are you sure they're ready? asked Daksh. Yes, my lord. Swart's men have been practicing in Naga attire. That fraud Nirkant can't know what hit him, said Vidyan Malay. The world will blame the terrorist Nagas for their beloved Nilkant's assassination. Daksh suddenly stopped him as he noticed a shocked Kanakla rooted at the entrance. Vidyanmali drew his sword. Daksh raised his hand. Vidyanmali, calm down. Prime Minister Kanakla knows where her loyalties lie. Your Highness, whispered Kanakla, her eyes wide with terror. Kanakla, said Daksh with an eerie calm walking up and placing his hands on her shoulders. Sometimes an emperor has got to do what has to be done. But we cannot break Lord Ram's laws, said Kanakla, her breathing quickening with nervousness. Lord Ram's laws on a peace conference apply to a king, not to his prime minister, said Daksh. But, no buts, said Daksh. Remember your oath. This is wartime. You have to do whatever your emperor asks of you. If you reveal his secrets without his permission, the punishment is death. But, your highness, this is wrong. What will be wrong is for you, Kanakla, to break your vow. Your highness, said Vidyanmari, this is too risky. I think the prime minister should be... Daksh interrupted Vidyanmari. We're doing no such thing, Vidyanmari. If we don't have her here to organize the conference, Shiva's men will get suspicious the moment they arrive. It is, after all, the conference of Kanakla. Kanakla was speechless with horror. You have been loyal to me for decades, Kanakla, said Daksh. Remember your vows and you will live. You can continue to be Prime Minister. But if you break them, not only will you be given the death sentence, you will also be damned by the Paramatma. Kanakla couldn't utter a word. She knew that the Prime Ministerial Oath also said that if she betrayed her liege, no funeral ceremonies would be conducted for her. According to ancient superstitions, this was a fate worse than death. Without funeral rituals, her soul would not be able to cross the mythical Vetarni River to Pitralok, the land of one's ancestors. The onward journey of her soul, either towards liberation or to return to earth in another body would be interrupted. She would exist in the land of the living as a pishach, a ghost. Remember your vows and do your duty, said Daksh. Focus on the conference. Kanakla stood quietly on the terrace outside her home office. She loved the sound of trickling water from the small fountain in the center of the chamber. This sound was wafting gently towards her, all the way to the open balcony. It kept her mind focused and calm. She looked up. The sun was already on its way down. She took a deep breath and looked towards the street. The soldiers weren't even trying to hide. Kanakla did not feel any anger towards the men who kept watch outside her house. They were good soldiers. They were simply following orders given to them by their commander. Kanakla knew it was pointless to try and send a message to Lothal and warn the Nilkant. She was sure Vidyanmali would have positioned expert archers along the route to bring down any bird courier. Furthermore, it was very possible that the Nilkant's convoy had already left Lothal. Her only recourse was Parvateshwar. If Lord Brigu and he managed to reach Devagiri in time, this travesty that her emperor and Brigadier Vidyanmali were planning could be stopped. But getting a message to Karachapa wouldn't be easy. Kanakla looked at the small message in her hand. She had personally addressed it to the Nilkant. She rolled the message tightly and slipped it into a small canister attached to a pigeon's leg. She shut the canister, closed her eyes and whispered, Forgive me, noble bird. Your sacrifice will aid a greater cause. Om Brahmyanama. Then she threw the bird into the air. She could immediately sense the soldiers below go into a tizzy. She saw an archer emerging from the rooftop of a building some distance away. He quickly loaded an arrow onto his bow and shot at the pigeon, hitting the bird unerringly. 
the stricken pigeon dropped like a stone with the arrow pierced through its body. The soldiers quickly scattered to find the pigeon. The message would be taken to Vidyan Mali instantly. It would appear genuine since it was in Kanakhla's handwriting and had been addressed to the Nilkant. Kanakhla looked towards the street once again. From the corner of her eye, she saw her servant slip quietly out of the side door, using the temporary distraction of the soldiers with the fallen bird. The servant would release a pigeon outside the city walls, a homing bird set for Karachappa. Kanakhla hoped Brigu and Parvateshwar would be able to arrive in Devagiri in time to stop this madness, to prevent this subversion of Lord Ram's laws. Subsequently, the servant had been instructed to ride hard southwards towards Lothal to attempt to stop the Nilkant and his peace negotiators from walking into a trap. Kanakhla had done all that she possibly could. The Prime Minister sighed. She had broken her vow of loyalty to the Emperor, but she sought solace from an ancient scriptural verse. Dharma Matehi Udgrita Dharma is that which is well judged by your mind. Think deeply about dharma and your mind will tell you what is right. In this case, it appeared to Kanakla that breaking her vows was the right thing to do, for that was the only way to stop an even bigger crime from being committed. But she was no fool. She knew her punishment. She would not give Daksha that pleasure though. Kanakla smiled sadly and walked back into her office. She stopped at her writing desk and picked up a bowl which contained a clear greenish medicine that had been prepared recently. She swallowed it quickly. It would numb her pain and make her feel drowsy. Exactly what she needed. She ambled up to the fountain. The small pool at the base of the fountain was perfect. Deep enough to keep her hand submerged. Clotting would be arrested if the wound was continually washed by flowing water. She picked up the sharp ceremonial knife that she carried on her person. One brief moment, she wondered whether she would roam the earth forever as a ghost if a funeral ceremony was not conducted in accordance with the prescribed rituals. Then she shook her head and dismissed her fears. Dharma Rakshati Rakshitaha Dharma protects those who protect it. She shut her eyes, balled her left hand into a fist and submerged it into the water. She then took a deep breath and whispered softly, Jai Shri Ram. In a swift move, she slashed deep, slicing through the veins and arteries on her wrist. Blood burst out in a rapid flood. She rested her head on the side of the fountain and waited for death to take her away. It doesn't change the plans at all, your highness, said Vidyan Mali. A stunned Daksha was sitting in his private office, having just received word of Kanakhla's suicide. Your Highness, said Vidyan Mali, when he didn't get a response. Yes, said Daksh, still reeling from shock, looking distracted. Listen to me, said Vidyan Mali. We will go ahead with the plans as before. Swat's men are ready. Yes, Your Highness, said Vidyan Mali loudly. Daksh's face suddenly showed some focus as he stared at Vidyan Mali. Did you hear me, Your Highness? asked Vidyan Mali. Yes. Everyone will be told that Kanakhla died in an accident. The peace conference will continue in her memory. Yes. Also, I have to go. What? Daksha seemed to panic. I told you, Your Highness, said Vidyan Mali patiently, as if he was talking to a child. One of Kanakhla's servants is missing. I fear he may have set out to warn the fraud Nilkant. He has to be stopped. I'm going to ride out myself towards the south with a platoon. But how will I manage all this? You don't have to do anything. Everything is under control. My soldiers will find a way to bring Princess Sati into the palace. Nobody else from her party will be allowed to accompany her. The moment she is with you, signal my man who will wait at your window. He will shoot a fire arrow high in the air, which will signal to Swat's assassins that the coast is clear. They will then quickly move in and kill the fraud Nilkant. They will also leave a few of Shiva's people alive, so that they can testify that they were attacked by Nagas. Daksh still looked nervous. 
Vidyanmali stepped up and spoke gently. You don't have to worry. I have planned everything in detail. There will be no mistakes made. All you have to do is signal my man when Princess Sati enters your room. That's it. That's it? Yes, that's it. Now, I really need to go, Your Highness. If Kanakla's man manages to reach the fraud Nilkant, it will be the end of our plans. Of course, go. Those sons of bitches, scowled Kali. Jadavrana, the ruler of Umbargao, had just rowed up to the Naga fleet in a fast cutter. His small kingdom lay to the south of the Narpada. The Nagas had helped him on many occasions, and Jadavrana was not an ungrateful man. When the fisherman and his kingdom informed him of a large Miluhan fleet stationed in a hidden lagoon nearby, he had gone personally to investigate. Keeping himself concealed, Jadav had seen the massive fleet and immediately surmised that this had something to do with a war raging in the north between the Nilkan's forces and the Maluhans. He had also received news that the Nagas themselves were racing down the western coast towards the mouth of the Narmada. He'd immediately got into a fast cutter to intercept the Nagas before they entered the river that marked the southern boundary of the Sub Sindhu. He was convinced the Maluhans intended to take the Nagas by surprise and attack them from the rear. Your Highness, said Jadavrana, I assume the Maluhans would enter the Narmada after you and assault your rear guard. They could devastate your entire fleet before you even realized what had been happening. I wouldn't be surprised if they have a forward ambush planned for us as well, said Karthik. We'll attack them in their hidden lagoon, said Kali. We'll burn their ships down and hang their rotten carcasses on the coastal trees. Ganesh had remained silent till now. Something was amiss. Your Highness, how many Maluhans are there? Fifty ships, Lord Ganesh, said Jadavrana. It's a reasonably large force, but you have more than enough ships to take them on. I didn't ask about the ships, Your Highness, said Ganesh. I asked how many men... Jadavrana frowned. I don't know, Lord Ganesh. He then turned to his man. Do you people have any idea? It's difficult to be sure, my lord, since they have largely remained on ship, said one of Jadavrana's lieutenants. But judging by the amount of food that they have been foraging, I don't think there will be more than 5,000. You have many more men, Lord Ganesh. You can win very easily. Ganesh held his head. Bhumi Devi, be merciful. A stunned Kali stared at Jadavrana's lieutenant. Are you sure? Just 5,000? Jadavrana was surprised. He didn't understand why the Nagas looked so upset. Logically, they should have been happy. They outnumbered the Maluhans dramatically. My men are well acquainted with these coasts, Your Highness, said Jadavrana. If they are saying that the Maluhans number only 5,000, I would go with that number. We've been taken for a ride, said Ganesh. There's no attack planned on Panchavati. They were trying to divide our forces. And they succeeded. A worried Karthik looked at his elder brother. They're probably attacking Lothal even as we speak. And we took a hundred thousand men away from Ma, said a distraught Ganesh. Kali turned and yelled the order at her Prime Minister Karkotak. Turn around now. We're going back to Lothal. Double rowing till we get there. Move! Chapter 43 A Civil Revolt Bhagirath and Brahaspati had come to the Lothal port having been informed by an advance boat that Shiva's ship would be arriving soon. They could now see Shiva's merchant ship sailing in from the east from the vantage position of the port walls. To the south, they could also see the naval contingent that had left under Kali's command steaming forward. All the ships would probably dock at Lothal at the same time. Rasbati took a sharp intake of breath as he saw a woman on the foredeck of Shiva's ship. Bhagirath couldn't help notice the dramatic transformation in Brahaspati. He turned towards Shiva's ship. They were still quite far, 
but he could make out the countenance of Shiva and Gopal. Standing next to them was a woman, an Indian-looking woman, but the Ayodhyan prince didn't have the foggiest clue about her identity. Who is she, Brahaspati ji? asked Bhagirath. Brahaspati was crying, Oh Lord Brahma! Oh Lord Brahma! Who is she? Brahaspati seemed to be delirious now, delirious but happy. He turned round, rushing down the steps towards the docks. He was rambling in pure delight. They let her go. Shiva freed her. Lord Ram be praised, he freed her. Isn't that Shiva's ship? said Kali, pointing ahead. Kali, Ganesh and Karthik had rushed back to Lothal and were surprised to discover that there was no siege on the city at all. They saw the merchant ship just ahead, pulling into the circular port. Fifteen minutes later, Kali's ship docked at a berth as well. Shiva's ship was anchored just ahead of theirs. As soon as they got off the gangway plank, they rushed towards Shiva. They could see that Bhagirath and Brahaspati had come to receive the Nilkant and Gopal. A stunned Brahaspati had just embraced a woman. Both of them were crying profusely. Shiva! shouted Kali from a distance, sprinting towards him. Shiva turned and smiled at Kali. I saw the Naga ships behind us. Where had you gone? We were led on a wild goose chase, said Kali. We were led to believe that Panchavati was under attack. The Meluhan ships were a decoy? asked Bhagirath. Yes, Prince Bhagirath, said Karthik. The ships only had 5,000 men. They had no intention of attacking Panchavati. That is good news, said Bhagirath. Where's Sati? asked Shiva, looking around. There's some good news regarding her as well, said Bhagirath. Good news? asked Ganesh. Yes, we may have found a solution to end the war, said Bhagirath. We've come back with a solution as well, said Gopal, pointing to the large trunk that was being lowered carefully onto the docks from their ship. Shiva looked again at an obviously delighted Brahaspati, who was refusing to let go of Tara. She was crying inconsolably. Her head gently nestled against Brahaspati's chest. They appeared like teenagers in the first heady flush of love. Looks like there's good news all around, said Shiva, smiling. How in the Holy Lake's name can this be good news? Bhagirath maintained a nervous silence, fearful of Shiva's wrath. But my lord, said Chandraketu, Lady Sati believed this was our best chance at peace. And it looks like Emperor Daksha himself wants it. If he signs a peace treaty, then the war is over. And we do not want to destroy Meluha, do we? All we want is the end of the Somras. I don't trust that goat of a man, said Kali. If he hurts my sister, I will burn his entire city to a cinder with him in it. He won't hurt her, Kali, said Shiva, shaking his head. But I'm afraid he may make her a prisoner and use that to negotiate with us. But my lord, said Chinardhvaj, that is impossible. The rules governing a peace conference are very clear. Both parties are free to return unharmed if a solution or compromise is not found. What's to stop my grandfather from not following the laws? asked Ganesh. It will not be the first time he's broken a law. My lord, said a Vasudev Pandit, entering the chamber and addressing Gopal. I have urgent news. I think we can talk later, Panditji, said Gopal. No, my lord, insisted the Pandit in charge of the Lothal temple. We must speak now. Gopal was surprised, but he knew his Vasudev Pandits did not panic unnecessarily. It had to be something important. He rose and walked up to the Pandit. Lord Ganesh, said Chinadwaj, resuming his conversation with Ganesh. The peace conference rules were laid down by Lord Ram himself. They are amongst the fundamental rules that can never be amended. They have to be rigorously followed on pain of a punishment worse than death. Even a man like Emperor Daksh will never break these rules. I pray to the Paramatma that you are right, Chinadwaj, snarled Kali. I have no doubt, Your Highness, said Chinadwaj. The worst that can happen is that no deal will be struck. 
then Lady Sati will return to us. Lord Ram, be merciful, exclaimed Gopal loudly. Everyone turned sharply to look at the chief Vasudev. Gopal was still standing close to the door, along with the Lothal Vasudev Pandit. What happened, Panditji? asked Shiva. An ashen-faced Gopal turned to Shiva. Great Nilkant, the news is disturbing. What is it? Parvateshwar's army finally mobilized and marched out of Karachappa three days back. A loud murmur erupted in the chamber. They would have to prepare for battle. Silence! snapped Shiva before turning to Gopal. And? Surprisingly, they turned back within a few hours, said Gopal. Turned back? Why? I don't know, said Gopal. My Vasudev Pandit tells me the army has been sent back to the barracks. But Lord Parvateshwar and Lord Brigu have pressed on. They set sail up the Indus in a lone fast ship with just their personal bodyguards. Where are they going? asked an alarmed Shiva. I have been told that they are rushing towards Devagiri. Shiva felt a chill run up his spine. And a flurry of birds have been flying out of Karachappa, said Gopal. All of them towards Devagiri. My pundit at Karachappa doesn't know the contents of those messages, but he says he has never seen so much communication between Karachappa and Devagiri. There was a deathly silence in the chamber. All those present were aware of Parvateshwar's spotless reputation for honorable conduct. If he was rushing to Devagiri without a large army that would slow him down, it only meant that something terrible was going on in the Meluhan capital and he was rushing to stop it. Shiva was the first to recover. Get the army mobilized immediately. We're marching out. Yes, my lord, said Bhagirath, rising quickly. And Bhagirath, I want to leave within hours, not days, said Shiva. Yes, my lord, said Bhagirath, hurrying out. Chandraketu, Chinadvaj, Matali, Ganesh and Kartik hastily followed the Ayodhyan prince. Ma will be all right, Baba, said Kartik, allowing hope to triumph over confidence. Shiva and his entourage had stopped for a quick meal just a few hours outside of Lothal. The Nilkant had marched out immediately with Kartik, Ganesh, Kali, Gopal, Virbhadra, Parshuram, Ayurvati and an entire brigade. Their main army, led by Bhagirath, would move out the next morning. Shiva's entire being was racked with worry. He couldn't wait till the entire army was mobilized. He had taken the Pashupati Astra with him as insurance. Karthik is right, great Nilkant, said Gopal. It is possible that Emperor Daksh may break the rules of a peace conference, but he will not hurt Princess Sati. He may try to imprison her to improve his negotiating position, but we have the Pashupati Astra. That changes everything. Shiva nodded silently. Kali listened intently to Gopal, but the words did not give her any solace. She did not trust her father. She was deeply troubled about the safety of her sister. She was consumed with guilt about the petulant way in which she had parted with Sati. The two extra arms on her shoulders were in a constant quiver. Shiva held Kali's hand and smiled faintly. Relax, Kali. Nothing will happen to her. The Padmatma will not allow such an injustice. Kali was too pained to respond. Finish your food, said Shiva. We have to leave in the next few minutes. As Kali began gulping down her food, Shiva turned towards Ganesh. The Nilkant's elder son was staring into the forest, his eyes moist. Ganesh had not touched the food in front of him. Shiva could see he was praying under his breath, his hands clasped tightly repeating a chant in rapid succession. Ganesh, said Shiva, eat. Ganesh was pulled back from his trance. I'm not hungry, Baba. Ganesh, said Shiva firmly. We may have to engage in battle the moment we reach Devagiri. I will require all of you to be strong. And for that, you need to eat. So, if you love your mother and want to protect her, keep yourself strong. Eat. Ganesh nodded and looked at his banana leaf plate. 
he had to eat. Shiva turned towards Virbhadra, who had already finished and was wiping his hands on a piece of cloth that Kritika had handed to him. Bhadra, order the heralds to make an announcement, said Shiva. We leave in ten minutes. Yes, Shiva, said Virbhadra and rose up immediately. Shiva pushed his empty banana leaf plate aside and walked away. He reached the wooden drum where the water was stored, scooped some water out with his hands and gargled. A chill ran up his spine again. He looked up at the sky towards the north, about to make a prayer to the holy lake. Then he shook his head. It wasn't required. He'll not hurt her. He cannot hurt her. If there's one person in this world that fool loves, it is my sati. He'll not hurt her. You are behaving like traitors, shouted Vaka. Brigadier Vraka had been ordered by Parvateshwar to mobilize the army quickly and leave for Devagiri. Parvateshwar hadn't told them anything about why they were required in the Maluhan capital and the general himself had rushed out earlier with Maharishi Brigu. It had taken Vraka two days to get his soldiers boarded onto ships and begin their journey up the Indus. However, they had been waylaid at Mohenjo-daro by a non-violent protest. The governor of the city remained loyal to the emperor, but his people worshipped the Nilkant. When they heard that their army was sailing up the Indus to battle with the Nilkant, they decided to rebel. Almost the entire population of Mohanjodaro had marched out of the city, boarded their boats and anchored all across the river. The line of boats extended across the massive breadth of the Indus and covered nearly a kilometer in length. It was impossible for Vraka to ram his ships through such an effective blockade. We will be traitors to Emperor Daksh, said the leader of the protesters, but we will not be traitors to the Nilkant. Vraka drew his sword. I will kill you all if you don't move, he warned. Go ahead, kill us all. We will not raise our hands. We will not fight against our own army. But I swear by the great Lord Ram, we will not move. Vraka snorted in anger. By not fighting with them, the citizens were not giving him a legal reason to attack them. He had been stymied. Slowly regaining consciousness, Vidyanmali saw that he was lying on a cart that was ambling along on the riverside road. He raised his head. The fresh stitches on his stomach hurt. Lie back down, my lord, said the soldier. You need to rest. Is that traitor dead? asked Vidyanmali. Yes, said the soldier. Vidyanmali and his platoon had raced down the riverside road leading from Devagiri to Lothal. They had managed to waylay Kanakala's servant who was rushing to Lothal to warn Shiva of the planned perfidy at Devagiri. The servant had been killed but not before he had managed to stab Vidyanmali viciously in his stomach. How far are we from Devagiri? asked Vidyanmali. At the pace we're going, another five days, my lord. That's too long. You cannot ride a horse, my lord. The stitches may burst open. You have to travel by bullock cart. Vidyanmali cursed under his breath. Chapter 44 A Princess Returns Sati and her entourage surveyed the scene from the docked ship in Devagiri. They had commandeered a fast merchant ship and sailed up the Saraswati speedily to reach in time for the peace conference. Nandi stood beside Sati and gestured at the sky. Look, he said, pointing to a small bird winging its way overhead. Another homing pigeon. It was not the first that they had spotted. Sati's warriors had seen more than a few pigeons flying in the direction of Devagiri. Lord Ganesh believes that eavesdropping can give us good intelligence on the enemy's plan, said Nandi. Shall we shoot one of them and see what's being discussed? Sati shook her head. We will obey the laws Lord Ram set for us, Nandi, and negotiate in good faith. Lord Ram said that there is no such thing as a small wrong. Understanding your opponent's strategy prior to peace negotiations 
through the use of subterfuge will give us only a small advantage but to behave without honor is against Lord Ram's way. Nandi bowed his head in Sati's direction. I'm Lord Ram's servant, princess. Sati turned away and Nandi glanced one last time at the tiny speck of a bird disappearing into Devagiri. The docks of the port had been completely cleared out with no sign of commerce or any other activity. From the vantage point of her ship deck, Sati could see the walls of Devagiri in the distance. She remembered that there were those who lovingly called the city Tripura in honor of its three platforms named after gold, silver and bronze. But the name had never really caught on. The citizens of Devagiri couldn't imagine tampering with the name that Lord Ram himself had given it. With a loud thud, the gangway plank was lowered onto the dock. Sati signaled to Nandi and whispered, Let's go. As she began leading her men out, a Meluhan protocol officer walked up to her, a broad smile plastered on his face. The Meluhan noticed Sati's disfigured left cheek, but wisely refrained from commenting on it. My lady, it's an honor to meet you once again. It's a pleasure to be back in my city, Major, and in better circumstances this time. The Meluhan acknowledged the reference with a solemn nod. I hope you will succeed in negotiating a lasting peace, my lady, said the Maluhan. You can't imagine how distressed we Maluhans are that our country is at war with our living God. With Lord Ram's blessings, the war will end and we shall have lasting peace. The Maluhan joined his hands together and looked up at the sky. With Lord Ram's blessing. Sati stepped out of the port area to find a large circular building that had been quickly constructed for the proceedings of the peace conference. One of the rules laid down for a peace conference was that it couldn't take place within the host city itself. The current venue was at a healthy distance from the city walls, almost adjacent to the port. The peace conference building had been constructed on a large rectangular base of standard Maluhan bricks, almost a meter high. Tall wooden columns had been hammered into holes on top of this base. The columns served as a skeleton for the structure. Smaller bamboo sticks had been tied together and stretched across these poles, creating an enclosed circular wooden building that was surprisingly strong despite no mortar having been used in its construction. Sati looked up at the high ceiling as soon as she entered the structure and spoke loudly to check the acoustics. Good construction! The sound did not reverberate. Sati smiled. Meluhan engineers had not lost their talent. A large idol of Lord Ram and Lady Sita had been placed near the entrance of this cavernous chamber. From the flowers and other oblations scattered around the idols, Sati knew that the chief priest of Devagiri had conducted the Pran Pratishta ceremony. The life force of the two deities had been infused into the idols. A true Hindu would, therefore, believe that Lord Ram and Lady Sita themselves were residing in the idols and were supervising their proceedings. Nobody would dare to break the law in their presence. A separate enclosure had been walled off at one end. There was a large wooden door in the middle. The room within had been completely soundproofed so that even the most raucous sounds would not be able to travel beyond its walls. It had been set aside for private internal discussions for either party during the course of the conference. Sati nodded. The arrangements are precisely in keeping with the ancient laws. Thank you, my lady, said the Maluhan. Now the armory, said Sati. Of course, my lady, we can leave right away. As she stepped out of the conference hall, she saw her horse tethered outside. It had been unloaded from her ship and was saddled up and ready. The horses of her companions had been similarly saddled, girthed and groomed. My lady, said the Maluhan, you do know that according to the laws, the animals will also need to be locked up next to the armory. All your horses will be taken away. All except mine, said Sati. Very few were more well versed with the laws of Lord Ram than her. The leader of the visitors was allowed to keep his or her horse. My horse remains with me. Of course, my lady. 
and the horses of my men will be returned as soon as the conference is over. That is the law, my lady. And the animals within Devagiri would also be locked up. Of course, my lady, said the Maluhan. That has already been done. All right, said Sati. Let's go. The temporary armory had been built outside the city walls under the connecting bridge between the Svarna and the Tamra platforms, once again to exact specifications. A massive door with a double lock had been built at the entryway, making it almost impossible to break into. One of the keys was handed over to Sati, who personally checked that the door was locked. The Maluhan protocol officer used his key to double lock the door, allowing Sati to check it again, and then fixed a seal on top of the lock. All the weapons in Devagiri had been effectively put out of reach. Sati handed over her key to Nandi. Keep this carefully. Bowing and turning to leave, the officer hesitated, as if remembering something. My lady, your weapons? Aren't they supposed to be locked in here as well? No, said Sati. Um, my lady, but the rules state that what the rules say, Major, interrupted Sati, is that the armies have to be disarmed, but the personal bodyguards and the leaders at the peace conference are allowed to retain their weapons. I'm sure my father's bodyguards have not been disarmed, have they? No, my lady, replied the Maluhan protocol officer. They still hold their weapons. As will my bodyguards, said Sati, pointing to Nandi and her other soldiers. But, my lady, why don't you check? with Prime Minister Kanakla. I'm sure she will know the law." The Maluhan protocol officer didn't say anything further. He knew that Sati was legally correct. He also knew that Prime Minister Kanakla could not be called upon for any clarifications. Meanwhile, Sati was looking at the giant animal enclosure a few hundred meters away. The horses of her men were being led in there for a temporary sequester. Also, my lady, said the protocol officer, Emperor Daksh has made a request for your presence at his palace for lunch. Sati turned towards Nandi. I'll ride ahead. You check the lock on the animal enclosures and then join me in... My lady, said the officer, interrupting Sati. The instructions were very clear. He wanted you to come alone. Sati frowned. This was unorthodox. She was about to reject the suggestion when the officer spoke up again. My lady... I don't think this has anything to do with the conference. You are His Highness's daughter. A father has the right to expect that he can have a meal with his daughter. Sati took a deep breath. She was in no mood to break bread with her father. But she would dearly like to meet her mother. In any case, the conference was scheduled for the following day. There was nothing much to do today. Nandi, once you have checked the enclosure, go back to the conference building and wait for me. I'll be back soon. As you command, my lady, said Nandi. But may I have a word with you before you leave? Of course, said Sati. In private, my lady, said Nandi. Sati frowned, but left the reins of her horse in the hands of a soldier standing discreetly at the back, and then walked aside. When they were out of earshot, Nandi whispered, If I may be so bold as to make a suggestion, my lady, Please don't think you are going to meet your father. Think instead that you are going to meet the emperor with whom you will be negotiating. Please use this lunch as an opportunity to set the right atmosphere for the peace conference tomorrow. Sati smiled. You are right, Nandi. Sati tied her horse at the stables near the palace steps, refusing the proffered assistance of the attendant. Owing to the peace conference, there were no animals in Devagiri, so Sati's was the only horse present. As she approached the main steps of her father's palace, the guards in attendance executed a smart military salute. Sati saluted back politely and continued walking. She had grown up in this palace, sauntered around its attached gardens, run up and down the steps a million times, practiced the fine art of swordsmanship on its grounds. Yet, the building felt alien to her now. Maybe it was because she had been away for so many years. Or, more likely, it was because 
she didn't feel any kinship with her father anymore. She knew her way around the palace and did not need the aid of the various soldiers who kept emerging to guide her onwards. She was surprised though that she couldn't recognize any of them. Perhaps Vidyanmali had changed the troops after taking over her father's security. She waved the soldiers away repeatedly, walking unerringly towards her father's chamber. Her Highness Princess Sati, announced the chief doorman loudly as one of his lieutenants opened the door to the royal chamber. Sati walked in to find Daksh, Virini and a man she didn't recognize who stood at the far end of the chamber. Judging by his armband, he was a colonel in the Maluhan army. As she turned towards her parents, the Maluhan colonel looked out of the window and imperceptibly nodded at someone standing outside. By the great Lord Ram, what happened to your face? exclaimed Daksh. Sati folded her hands together into a namaste and bowed low, showing respect, as she must, to her father. It's nothing, father. Just a mark of war. A warrior bears her scars with pride, said the Meluhan colonel congenially, his hands held together in a respectful namaste. Sati looked at the Maluhan quizzically as she returned his namaste. I'm afraid I don't know you, Colonel. I've been newly assigned, my lady, said the Maluhan Colonel. I have served as second in command to Brigadier Vidyanmali. My name is Kamalaksh. Sati had never really liked Vidyanmali, but that was no reason to dislike Kamalaksh. She nodded politely at the Maluhan Colonel before turning to her mother with a warm smile. How are you, Ma? Sati had never addressed Virini by the more affectionate Ma. She'd always used the formal term Mother, but Virini liked this change. She walked up and embraced her daughter. My child. Sati held her mother tight. Years spent with Shiva had broken the mold. She could now freely express her pent-up feelings. I've missed you, my child, whispered Virini. I've missed you too, Ma, said Sati, her eyes moist. Virini touched Sati's scar and bit her lip. It's all right, said Sati. It doesn't hurt. Why don't you get Ayurvati to remove it? asked Virini. I will, Ma, said Sati. But the beauty of my face is not important. What is important is to find a way towards peace. I hope Lord Ram helps your father and the Nilkant to do so, said Virini. Daksha smiled broadly. I have already found a way, Sati, and we'll all be together once again, a happy family like before. By the way, I hope that Nilkan didn't mind waiting in the camp outside. After all, it would not be considered a good omen for us to meet before the peace conference. Sati frowned at her father's strange suggestion that all of them would be living together as a family once again. She was about to clarify that Shiva had not come with her to Devagiri, but Daksh turned towards Kamalaksh. Order the attendants to bring in lunch. I'm famished, as I'm sure are the women in my family, said Daksh. Of course, my lord. Virini was still holding Sati's hand. It is sad that Ayurvati wasn't here last week. Why? asked Sati. Had she been here, she would certainly have saved Kanakla. Nobody has the medical skills that she possesses. From the corner of her eye, Sati could see Daksh's body stiffen. Virini, you talk too much. We need to eat and... One moment, father, said Sati, turning back towards her mother. What happened to Kanakla? Didn't you know? asked a surprised Virini. She died suddenly. I believe there was some kind of accident in her house. Accident? asked a suspicious Sati, whirling around to face Daksh. What happened to her father? It was an accident, Sati, said Daksh. You don't need to make a mountain of every molehill. On seeing Daksh's evasive reaction to Sati's question, Virini got suspicious as well. What's going on, Daksh? Will you two please give it a rest? We've come together for a meal after a very long time. Let's just enjoy this moment. Everything will be fine soon, princess, said Kamalaksh in a soft voice. 
Sadi did not turn her attention to Kamalaksh, but there was something creepy in his voice. Her instinct kicked in. Father, what are you hiding? Oh, for Lord Ram's sake, said Daksh. If you are so worried about your husband, I'll have some special food sent out for him as well. I did not mention Shiva, said Sati. You are avoiding my question. What happened to Kanakla? Daksha cursed in frustration, slamming his fist on a desk. Will you trust your father for once? My blood runs in your veins. Would I ever do anything that is not in your interest? If I say Kanakla died in an accident, then that is what happened. Sati stared into her father's eyes. You're lying. Kanakla got what she deserved, princess, said Kamalaksh from directly behind her. As will everyone who dares to oppose the true Lord of Meluha. But you don't need to worry. You are safe because your father adores you. A stunned Sati glanced back briefly towards Kamalaksh and then turned to her father. Daksh's eyes were moist as he spoke with a wry smile. If only you'd understand how much I love you, my child. Just trust me. I will make everything all right once again. Almost imperceptibly, Sati tensed her muscular frame and shot her right elbow back into Kamalaksha's solar plexus. The surprised colonel staggered back as he bent over with pain, thus bringing his head within her range. Losing no time, Sati sprung onto her left foot and swung her right leg in a great arc, a lethal strike that she had learned from the Nagas. Her right heel crashed with brutal force into Kamalaksha's head, right between his ear and temple. It burst his eardrum and rendered him unconscious. The giant frame of the colonel came crashing down onto the floor. Sati swung full circle in the same smooth motion and faced Daksh again. Quick as lightning, she drew her sword and pointed it at her father. It all happened so quickly that Daksh had had no time to react. What have you done, father? screamed Sati, her anger at boiling point. It's for your own good, shrieked Daksh. Your husband will not trouble us anymore. Sati finally understood. Lord Ram, be merciful. Nandi and my soldiers. My God, cried Virini, moving towards him. What have you done, Daksh? Shut up, Virini, screamed Daksh as he shoved her aside and rushed towards Sati. Virini was in shock. How could you break the laws of a peace conference? You have damned your soul forever. You can't go out, shouted Daksh, trying to get a hold of Sati. Sati pushed Daksh hard, causing the emperor to fall on the floor. She turned and ran towards the door, her sword held tight in her hand, ready for battle. Stop her, yelled Daksh. Guards, stop her. The doorman opened the door, stunned to see the princess sprinting towards him. The guards at the door were immobilized by shock. Stop her, bellowed Daksh. Before the guards could react, Sati crashed into them, pushing them aside and burst through the door. She raced down the main corridor. She could still hear her father screaming repeatedly for his guards to stop her. She had to get to her horse. No one else was in possession of one in Devagiri at this time. Were she able to do so, she could easily speed past all the guards and ride out of the city. Stop the princess! screamed a guard from behind. Sati saw a platoon of guards taking position up ahead. They held their spears out, blocking the way. She looked behind her without slowing down. Another platoon of soldiers was running towards her from the other end. She was trapped. Lord Ram, give me strength! Sati heard Daksha's distant voice. Don't hurt her! The window to the left was open up ahead. She was on the third floor. It would be foolish to jump. But she knew this palace well. It had been home. She knew that there was a thin ledge above the window. A short jump from there would land her on the palace terrace. Thereafter, she could race away from a side entrance towards the palace gate before anyone would be able to reach her. Sati sheathed her sword and raised her hands as if in surrender. The soldiers thought they had her and moved forward, slowing their gait so as to calm the princess's nerves. Sati suddenly jumped to her side and was out of the window in a flash. The soldiers gasped, 
thinking the princess had fallen to a certain death onto the courtyard below. But Sati had stretched her hands out simultaneously and used the momentum to jump up, grab the edge of the protruding ledge, swing upwards and then land safely on top of the ledge in a half flip. She took a moment to balance herself. She then took a couple of quick steps and leapt onto the terrace. She's on the terrace! screamed a soldier. Sati knew the path the soldiers would take. She quickly ran the other way, towards the far end of the terrace, jumping onto another ledge. She crept along the ledge till she reached another terrace, leapt onto it and sprinted towards a staircase on the far side. She charged down the stairs, three steps at a time, till she reached the landing above the first floor, which led to a side entrance. While this entrance was usually not guarded, she didn't want to take a chance. She leapt out of the balcony into the small garden at the side. There was a tree right next to the wall. She clambered onto the tree, reached its highest branch and used the elevation to jump over the boundary wall. She landed right next to a horse. In one leap, she mounted her horse, freed its reins and kicked the animal into motion. There she is! shouted a guard. Twenty guards rushed towards Sati, but she pushed through, refusing to slow down. Her horse galloped out of the palace enclosure, and within seconds she was out into the city. She could hear the distant shouts of the guards, screaming and swearing behind her. Stop her! Stop the princess! Startled Maluhans scrambled out of the way to escape the flaying hooves of Sati's steed. She turned into a small lane to avoid a big crowd of citizens up ahead and came out of a different access road, which led straight to the city's main gates. She rode hard, pushing her horse to its limit, and was through the iron gates in no time. As soon as she crossed to the other side, her horse reared ferociously onto its hind legs, disturbed by the loud noises of battle in the distance. From the vantage point of the Devagiri city platform, Sati had a clear view of the venue of the peace conference, right next to the Saraswati, nearly four kilometers away. Her people were under attack. A large number of cloaked and hooded men were battling Nandi and his vastly outnumbered soldiers, many of whom already lay on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Sati kicked her horse hard, goading it into a swift gallop. She raced down the central steps of the Swarna platform of Devagiri, straight towards the battling men, screaming the war cry of those loyal to the Nilkant. Har Har Mahadev! Chapter 45 The Final Kill As she sped towards the battleground, Sati could estimate that there were almost 300 cloaked assassins. They wore masks, just like the Nagas, but their battle style was nothing like the warriors from Panchavati. They were obviously some other group, being made to look like the Nagas. Nearly half of Sati's 100 bodyguards were already on the ground, either grievously injured or dead. Since the assassins and her soldiers were completely locked in combat, there was no clear line of enemies who she could ride her horse into and mow down. She knew that she'd have to dismount and fight. As she neared the battle scene, she rode towards the area where Nandi was combating three assassins simultaneously. She heard Nandi's loud scream as he brutally drove his sword into his enemy's heart. He turned to his left, easily lifted the diminutive assassin impaled on his sword and flung the hapless soul's body onto an oncoming attacker. Another assassin had moved up to Nandi, ready to slash him from behind. Sati pulled her feet out of the stirrups, jumped up and leveraged herself to crouch on top of her saddle even as she drew her sword out. As she neared the assassin, who was about to slash Nandi from the rear, she flung herself from her horse and swung her sword viciously at the same time, decapitating the assassin in one fell swoop. Sati landed on her side and smoothly rolled over to stand behind Nandi as the quivering body of the beheaded assassin collapsed to the ground, blood bursting through, his adrenalized heart pumping the life-giving fluid furiously out of his gaping neck. My lady! yelled Nandi over the din, slashing hard at another assassin in front. Run! Sati stood steadfast, 
defensively back to back with Nandi, covering all angles. Not without all of you! An assassin leapt at Sati from the side as she pulled her shield forward. He reached into the folds of his robe and threw something at her eyes. Instinctively, she pulled her shield up. A black egg splattered against her shield, deflecting its contents, shards of metal, safely away from her eyes. Some of the shrapnel cut through her left arm. Sati had heard of this combat maneuver. It was Egyptian. Eggs were drained of their contents through a small hole and then filled with bits and pieces of sharp metal. These were flung at the eyes of enemies, thus blinding them. Usually, the next move was a low sword thrust. Though her vision was blocked by her shield, Sati moved instinctively and swerved to her side to avoid the expected low blow. Then she pressed a lever on her shield, extending a short blade, which she rammed into her opponent's neck, ferociously driving the blade through his windpipe. As the assassin began to choke on his own blood, Sati ran her sword through his heart. Nandi, meanwhile, was effortlessly killing all those in front of him. He was a big man, and he towered over the diminutive Egyptians like a giant. Not one of the assassins could even come close as he hacked through anyone who dared to challenge him. They threw knives and the modified eggs at him, but nothing got through to any vital part of his body. With a knife buried in his shoulder and numerous metallic shrapnel pierced all over his body, a bloody Nandi fought relentlessly against his enemies. But both Nandi and Sati could see that the odds were stacked heavily against them. Most of their soldiers were falling, overwhelmed by the surprise attack and the sheer numbers. Escape wasn't an option either, as they were now surrounded on all sides. Their only hope was that other Suryavanshis in Devagiri who were not part of Daksha's conspiracy, would come to their aid. An assassin swung at Sati from a high angle on the right. She swung back with vicious force, blocking his blow. The man turned and swerved from the left this time, hoping to push Sati on her back foot. Sati met his strike with equal ferocity. The assassin then attempted to drop low and stab Sati through her abdomen, but he was unaware of her special technique. Most warriors can only swing their sword in the natural direction, away from their body. Very few can swing it towards their own body because of a lack of strength and skill. Sati could. Hence, both the inner and the outer sides of her sword were sharpened, unlike the vast majority of swords which only have sharpened outer edges. Sati swung back and with a near impossible stroke, masterfully pulled her sword arm towards herself with tremendous force. Surprised assassin had his throat cut cleanly before he could respond. The wound was deep, almost beheading the man. The Egyptian's head fell backwards, dangling tenuously from his body by a shred of tissue, his eyes still rolling in his head. Sati kicked his body away as it collapsed. She saw movement on her left and realized her mistake too late. She tried to block the sword stroke from the second assassin, but it glanced off her sword and went up into her scarred left cheek cutting through her eye and grating off her skull. Her left eye collapsed in its socket and blood poured from the wound, obscuring the vision in her other eye. Blinded, she executed a desperate defensive block, hoping to ward off any blows while she tried to wipe the blood from her face. She heard a woman panting, almost sobbing, and realized that it was she herself. She braced as the man moved forward for a second attack. She detected a movement from the right and through her pinkish blurred vision, she saw Nandi swing from his massive height, beheading the assassin in one fell swoop. My lady! screamed Nandi, pulling his shield forward to protect himself from another assassin's blow. Run! The world had slowed around her, and his voice came to her as if from a great distance. She could hear her own heart beating, hear her breath gasping as she gazed at the carnage. The bodies of her guards lay bloodied and broken at her feet. Some of the fallen still lived, reaching and clawing at the legs of the attackers in desperation, until they were kicked aside in annoyance, their lives finished with half-distracted sword strokes of irritation. My arrogance, a voice whispered in her head. I have failed them. Again. Her brain had blocked out the throbbing in her mutilated eye. She spat out the blood streaking down her face and into her mouth. Using her good right eye, 
she swung back into battle. Stepping back to avoid a brutal stab from another assassin, she slashed her sword from the right and sliced through his hand. As the Egyptian howled in pain, she rammed her shield into his head, cracking open his skull. She stabbed the staggering assassin in his eye, pulled her sword back quickly and turned to face another. The assassin flung a knife across the distance. It cut through Sati's upper arm, getting stuck in her biceps, restricting the movement of her defensive limb. Sati snarled in fury and swung her sword viciously across the assassin's body, cutting through the cloak and slashing deep into his chest. As the man staggered back, Sati delivered the killer blow, a stab straight through his heart. But the flow of assassins was unrelenting. Another one ran into battle Sati. Using sheer will to overpower her tiring body, Sati raised her blood-drenched sword once again. Swat was observing the battle from a short distance away. His orders had been to ensure the death of the one they called Nilgant. Surely he was the tall one, the powerful warrior, cutting down all his opponents with such ease. Swat moved into the fray, striding towards the embattled Nandi. Nandi looked up, and turned to face his new opponent, swinging his sword fiercely at Swat's blade. The Egyptian stepped back, his hand stinging with the force of Nandi's blow. Swat dropped his sword and drew out two curved blades, something he kept for special occasions. Nandi had never seen swords such as these. They were short, a little less than two-thirds the length of his own sword. They curved in sharply at their edges, almost like hooks. The hilts of the swords were also peculiar, since most of it was made of uncovered metal instead of being enveloped in leather or wood. A sword fighter would have to be very skilled not to cut himself while holding such swords, for the handles were also unsheathed sharp metal. Swart was no amateur. He swung both swords in a circular motion skillfully and with frightening speeds. Nandi, never having seen swords in a battle style such as this, was naturally cautious and kept his shield held high. He waited for the Egyptian to move in while keeping a safe distance at the same time. Using the attention that Nandi had focused on Swat and Sati's distraction with battling the assassin on her side, an Egyptian moved in suddenly and slashed Nandi's back viciously with his sword. Nandi roared with fury as his body lurched forward in reaction to the excruciatingly painful wound. Swat used this moment to suddenly hook his left sword into his right blade, thus extending its reach twofold, and swung hard from a low angle, aiming a little below Nandi's defensive shield. The sharp edge on the metallic hilt sliced through Nandi's left arm, severing it cleanly a few inches above his wrist. The Suryavanshi bellowed in pain as blood burst from his slashed limb, the shock of the massive blow causing his heart to pump furiously. Swat stepped close to a paralyzed Nandi and slashed at his right arm, hacking the sword-bearing limb just below the elbow. The mighty Suryavanshi, with blood bursting forth from both his severed limbs, collapsed on the ground. Swat spat as he kicked both of Nandi's hacked hands away. Damn! cursed Swat as he wiped some of his spittle that had got stuck on the Naga mask that he wasn't used to wearing. But he was careful enough to curse in Sanskrit. He had strictly forbidden his people from speaking in their native Egyptian tongue. The charade of their being Nagas had to be strictly maintained. Nandi! screamed Sati as she swirled around and thrust her sword at Swat. Swat moved aside, easily avoiding her attack. Another assassin swung his sword from behind Sati, cutting through her upper back and left shoulder. Wait! said Swat as two of his men were about to plunge their swords into her heart. The assassins immediately held Sati's arms, awaiting Swat's instructions. The leader did not want to sully his tongue by speaking to a woman, a sex that he believed was far beneath men, only a little better than animals. Ask her who the blue-throated lord is. One of his assistants looked at Sati and repeated Swat's question. A shocked Sati did not hear them. She continued to stare at Nandi, lying prone on the ground, losing blood at an alarming rate from his severed limbs. But the unconscious Suryavanshi was still breathing. She knew that since the wounds were only on the limbs, 
the blood loss would not be so severe as to cause immediate death. If she managed to keep him alive for some more time, expert medical help could still save him. Is this the blue-throated lord? asked Swat, pointing at Nandi. Swat's assistant repeated his question to Sati. But Sati was looking towards the gates of Devagiri from the corner of her eye. She could see people at the top of the platform running towards her. They would probably reach in another 10 to 15 minutes. She had to keep Nandi alive for that much time. Swat shook his head when he did not get any response from Sati. A curse of Aten on these stupid baby producing machines. Sati stared at Swat, catching on to his mistake in swearing in his own god's name, sure at last of his identity. He was an Egyptian, an assassin of the cult of Aten. She had learned about their culture in her youth. She knew immediately what she had to do. Swat pointed at Nandi and turned to his men. Behead this fat giant. He must be the blue-throated lord. Leave the other injured alive. They will bear witness that they were attacked by the Nagas and collect our dead. We leave immediately. He's not the blue-throated one, spat Sati. Can't you see his neck, you Egyptian idiot? The Egyptian holding Sati hit her hard across her face. Swat sniggered. Leave the giant alive, said Swat, before turning to one of his fighters. Ka, torture this hag before you kill her. With pleasure, my lord, smiled Ka, who was not the best of assassins, but an expert in the fine art of torture. Swat turned to his other man. How many times do I have to repeat myself, you putrid remains of a camel's dung? Start gathering our dead. We leave in a few moments. As Swat's assassin started implementing his order, Ka moved towards Sati, returning his blood-streaked sword to its scabbard. He then pulled out a knife. A smaller blade always made torture much easier. Sati suddenly straightened up and shouted loudly, The duel of Aten! Ka stopped in his track, stunned. Swat stared at Sati, surprised beyond measure. The duel of Aten was an ancient code of the Egyptian assassins, wherein anyone could challenge them to a duel. They were honor bound to engage in the duel. It could only be a one on one fight. Multiple assassins could not attack, or they would suffer the wrath of their fiery sun god, an everlasting curse from Aten. Ka turned towards Swat, unsure. Swat stared at Ka. You know the law. Ka nodded, throwing his knife away. He drew his sword, pulled his shield forward and waited. Sati wrenched herself free from the assassins who were holding her. She bent down and ripped out some cloth from a fallen assassin's cloak, tying the strip of cloth across her face, covering her mutilated eye in an effort to stem the blood from flowing across her face. She hoped this would give her unimpeded vision and did not disturb the good eye. Then she slowly pulled out the knife buried in her upper arm and tied another strip of cloth around the injury, using her teeth to tighten the bind. She then drew her sword and held her shield high, ready, waiting. Ka suddenly threw his shield away. All the assassins standing around burst out laughing and began to clap. Clearly, Ka was taunting Sati, suggesting that he didn't even need his shield to combat a stupid woman. Much to Ka's surprise, Sati threw her shield away as well. Ka bellowed loudly and charged, swinging his sword at a high angle. Sati smoothly leaned back and swerved to the left as she avoided the strike. Ka turned swiftly and swung his sword high again, catching Sati by surprise. The Egyptian sword cut through Sati's left hand, slicing off four fingers. Much to his surprise, Sati didn't flinch from the injury, but swung her sword from height at Ka. Ka swerved and defended Sati's blow with an elevated strike. Sati, meanwhile, had surmised that the swinging strike was Ka's standard attack. She played to that as she kept swinging at Ka from a high angle and the Egyptian kept striking back. Both of them kept changing the direction repeatedly to surprise the other, but the strikes were almost typical and therefore 
no serious injury was caused. Suddenly, Sati dropped to one knee and swung hard. The strike hit home. Her blade hacked brutally through Ka's abdomen, cutting deep. He collapsed as his intestines spilled onto the ground. Sati stood up, towering over a kneeling Ka, who had been paralyzed by the intense pain. She held her sword high, vertically, and thrust it through Ka's neck, straight down, deep into his body, right up to his heart, killing him instantly. Swat stared at Sati, dumbfounded. It wasn't just her skill with the sword that had surprised him. It was also her character. She hadn't beheaded Ka when she could easily have done so. She let him keep his head. She gave him an honorable death, a soldier's death. She had followed the rules of the duel of Aten, even though the rules were not her own. Sati pulled aside and ran her bloodied sword into the soft, muddied ground. She bent over and ripped another piece of cloth from the now-dead Ka's cloak and tied it around her left palm, covering the area where her fingers had been amputated. She stood tall, pulled up her sword from the ground and held it aloft, careful not to look at Nandi. Just a few more minutes. Who's next? Another assassin stepped forward, reached for his sword and then hesitated. He had seen Sati battle brilliantly with a long blade. He drew out a knife from his shoulder belt instead. I don't have a knife, said Sati, putting the sword back in its scabbard, wanting to fight fair. Swoth pulled out his knife and flung it high in Sati's direction. She reached out and caught the beautifully balanced weapon easily. In the meantime, the assassin had removed his mask and pulled back his hood. He didn't want to suffer the disadvantage of a restricted vision against a skilled warrior. Having lost four fingers of her left hand, Sati couldn't battle this assassin the way she had battled Tarak in Karachappa many years ago, where she had hidden the knife behind her back with the aim of confusing her opponent about the direction of attack. So, she held the knife in front in her right hand, but she kept the hilt forward with the blade pointing back towards herself, much to the surprise of the gathered assassins. The Egyptian adopted the traditional fighting stance and pointed the knife directly at Sati. He moved forward and slashed hard. Sati jumped back to avoid the blow, but the blade sliced her shoulder, drawing some blood. This emboldened the assassin to move in further, swinging the knife left and then right as he charged in. Sati kept stepping back, allowing the assassin to draw closer into the trap. The assassin suddenly changed tack and thrust forward with a jabbing motion. Sati swerved right to avoid the blow, raising her right hand. She now held her knife high above her left shoulder, but she hadn't moved back far enough. The assassin's knife sliced through the left side of her abdomen, lodging deep within her, right up to the hilt. Without flinching at the horrifying pain, Sati brought her hand down hard from its height, stabbing the Egyptian straight through his neck. The blow had so much force that the knife cut all the way through, its point sticking out at the other end of the hapless Egyptian's throat blood burst forth from the assassin's mouth and neck. Sati stepped back as the Egyptian drowned in his own blood. Swath was staring at this strange woman, the sneer wiped off his face. She had killed two of his assassins one on one in a free and fair fight. She was bleeding desperately and yet she stood tall and proud. Sati, meanwhile, was breathing slowly, trying to calm her rapidly beating heart. She had been cut up in too many places. A pulsating heart would work against her, pumping more blood out of her body. She also needed to conserve her energy for the duels that were to come. She looked at the knife buried deep in her abdomen. It hadn't penetrated any vital organ. The only danger was the continuous bleeding. She spread out her feet, took a deep breath, held the knife's handle and yanked it out. She didn't flinch or make any sound of pain while doing so. Who is this woman? asked a stunned assassin standing next to Swat. Sati bent down, ripped a part of the bloodied cloak of the assassin she had just killed and bandaged it tightly around her abdomen. It staunched the blood flow. While doing so, she'd seen from the corner of her eye that the Maluhans who were running towards her were probably a third of the way through. She knew she couldn't stop the duels now. She had seen the killers. They couldn't leave her alive. Her only chance was to continue dueling and hope 
that she would still be breathing when the Maluhans reached her. Sati drew her sword. Who's next? Another assassin stepped forward. No, said Swat. The assassin stepped back. She's mine, said Swat, drawing one of his curved swords. Swat didn't approach Sati with both his curved swords. That would have been unfair, according to the rules of Aten, since Sati had only one sword hand. He held the sword forward in his right hand. As he neared Sati, he started swinging the sword around, building it into a stunning circle of death just ahead of him, moving inexorably towards her. Even as Swat's sword whirred closer, Sati began to step back slowly. She suddenly thrust her sword forward quickly, deep into the ring of the circling blade of Swat, inflicting a serious cut on the Egyptian's shoulder. She pulled her sword back just as rapidly, before Swat's circling blade could come back to deflect her sword. The wound must have hurt, but Swat didn't flinch. He smiled. He'd never met anyone with the ability to penetrate his sword's circle of death. This woman is talented. Swat stopped circling his sword and held it in a traditional sword fighter stance. He stepped forward, swinging viciously from the right. Sati bent low to avoid the blow and thrust her blade at Swat's arm, causing a superficial cut. But Swat suddenly reversed the direction of his blade, slashing hard across Sati's shoulder. Sati swerved back just in time, reducing the threat of what could have been a devastating blow. Swat's sword grazed her right arm and shoulder. Sati growled in fury and stabbed with such rapid force that a surprised Swat had to jump back. Swat stepped back even further. This woman was a very skilled warrior. His standard tactics would not work. He decided to keep his distance, pointing his sword forward, thinking of what could be a good move against her. Sati remained stationary, conserving her strength. She couldn't afford to move too much for fear of increasing the blood loss from her numerous wounds. Also, she was playing for time. She didn't mind a few moments of reprieve. An idea struck Swat. Sati was primarily injured on her left side. This would impair her movements in that direction. He quickly took a giant step forward and swung viciously from his right. Sati twisted to the left and swung her blade up to block Swat's strike. The Egyptian could see that the movement had made blood spurt out of her wounded abdomen. As Sati stabbed at Swat again, she stepped a little to the left to improve her angle. But Swat had anticipated her move. He stepped further to his right and kept on swinging again and again from that awkward angle. The intense pain of continuously turning leftwards forced Sati to take a gamble. She pirouetted suddenly and swung her sword in a great arc from her right, hoping to decapitate him. But this was exactly what Swat had expected. He ducked low and stepped forward rapidly, easily avoiding Sati's strike. At the same time, he brought his sword up in a low, brutal jab. His curved sword with its serrated edges went right through Sati's abdomen, ripping almost every single vital organ. Her intestines, stomach, kidney and liver were slashed through viciously. A paralyzed Sati, her face twisted in agony, lay impaled on Swoot's curved sword. Her own blade fell from her hand. The Egyptian bent back, used the leverage and rammed his sword in even further, till its point burst through to the other side, piercing her shattered back. Not bad, said Swat, twisting his blade as he pulled it out of Sati, ripping her organs to ribbons. Not bad for a woman. Sati collapsed to the ground, her body shivering as dark blood began to pool on the ground around her. She knew she was going to die. It was only a matter of time. The blood flow couldn't be staunched now. Her vital internal organs and the massive numbers of blood vessels in them had been mortally damaged. But she also knew something else very clearly. She wouldn't die lying on the ground, slowly bleeding to death. She would die like a Maluhan. She would die with her head held high. She lifted her quivering right hand and reached for her sword. Swat stared at Sati in awe, transfixed as he watched her struggling to reach her blade. He knew that she must know she was going to die soon. And yet, her spirit 
hadn't been broken. Could she be the final kill? The cult of Aten had a belief that every assassin would one day meet a victim so magnificent, so worthy, that it would be impossible for the man to kill ever again. His duty would then be to give his victim an honorable death and give up his profession to spend the rest of his life worshipping that last victim. As Sati's arm flopped to her side after another vain attempt to reach her sword, Swat shook his head. It can't be a woman. This cannot be the moment. The final kill cannot be a woman. Swat turned around and screamed at his people. Move out, you filthy cockroaches! We're leaving! The man standing next to Swat didn't obey his order. He continued to stare beyond Swat, stupefied by the awe-inspiring sight. Swat whirled around, stunned. Sati was up on one knee. She was breathing rapidly, forcing some strength into her debilitated body. She had dug her sword into the ground and her right hand was on its hilt as she tried to use the leverage to push herself up. She failed, took quick breaths, fired more energy into her body and tried once more. She failed again. Then she stopped suddenly. She felt eyes boring into her. She looked up and locked eyes with Swath. Swath stared at Sati, dumbstruck. She was completely soaked in her own blood. There were cavernous wounds all over her body and her hands were shivering with the tremendous pain she was in. Her soul must know that death was just minutes away. And yet, her eyes did not exhibit even the slightest hint of fear. She stared directly at Swath with only one expression. An expression of pure, raw, unadulterated defiance. Tears sprang into Swath's eyes as his heart felt immeasurably heavy. His mind grasped his heart's message instantly. This was indeed his final kill. He would never ever kill again. Swoot knew what he had to do. He drew both his curved swords, held them high by the hilt and thrust them in a downward motion. In a flash, the swords were buried in the ground. For the last time, he looked at both the half-buried, bloodied swords that had served him so well. He would never use them again. He went down on one knee, pulled his shoulders back to give himself leverage and then slammed the hilts with his palms in an outward motion snapping both blades in two. He then got up, pulled back his hood and removed his mask. Sati could see the tattoo of a black fireball with rays streaming out on the bridge of his nose. Swat reached behind him and pulled out a sword from a scabbard tied across his back. Unlike all his other weapons, this sword was marked. It was marked with the name of their god, Aten. Below that had been inscribed the name of the devotee, Swat. The blade had never been used before. It had but one purpose alone, to taste the blood of the final victim. Thereafter, the sword would never be used again. It would be worshipped by Swat and his descendants. Swat bowed low before Sati, pointed at the black tattoo on the bridge of his nose and repeated an ancient vow. The fire of Aten shall consume you, and the honor of putting out your fire shall purify me. Sati didn't move. She didn't flinch. She continued to stare silently at Swat. Swat went down on one knee. He had to give Sati an honorable death. Beheading her was out of the question. He pointed his sword at her heart, holding the hilt with his thumb facing up. He pressed his other hand into the back of the hilt to provide support. Ready in every way, Swat stared back at Sati at a face that he knew would haunt him for the rest of his life, and whispered, Killing you shall be my life's honor, my lady. No! A loud scream came wafting in from the distance. An arrow whizzed past and pierced Swat's hand. As his sword dropped to the ground, a surprised Swat turned to find another arrow flying straight into his shoulder. Run! screamed the assassins. One of them picked up Swath and started dragging him along. No! roared Swath, struggling against his people who were bodily carrying him back. Not killing the final victim 
was one of the greatest sins for the followers of Aten, but his people wouldn't leave him behind. Nearly a thousand Maluhans had reached Sati, a desperately distraught Daksh and Virani in the lead. Sati! screamed Daksh, his voice twisted in agony. Don't touch me! bellowed Sati as she collapsed to the ground. Daksh buckled, crying inconsolably, digging his nails into his face. Sati! screamed Virini as she lifted her daughter into her arms. Ma! whispered Sati. Don't talk, relax! cried Virini before frantically looking back. Get the doctors, now! Ma! Be quiet, my child. Ma, my time has come. No, no, we'll save you, we'll save you. Ma, listen to me, said Sati. My child, my body will be handed over to Shiva. Nothing will happen to you, sobbed Virini. The Queen of Maluha turned around once again. Will someone get the doctors now? Sati held her mother's face with surprising strength. Promise me. Only to Shiva. Sati, promise me. Yes, my child, I promise. And both Ganesh and Kartik will light my pyre. You're not going to die. Both Ganesh and Kartik, promise me. Yes, yes, I promise. Sati slowed her breathing down. She had heard what she needed to. She blocked out the weeping she could hear all around her. She rested her head in her mother's lap and looked towards the peace conference building. The doors were open. Lord Ram and Lady Sita's idols were clearly visible. She could feel their kind and welcoming eyes upon her. She would be back with them soon. A sudden wind picked up, swirling dust particles and leaves lying around her on the ground. So they gazed at the swirl. The particles appeared to form a figure. She stared hard as Shiva's image seemed to emerge. She remembered the promise she had made to him, that she would see him when he returned. I'm so sorry. The wind died down just as suddenly. Sati could feel her vision blurring. Blackness appeared to be taking over. Her vision seemed to recede into a slowly reducing circle with darkness all around it. The wind burst into life once again. The dust particles and leaves rose in an encore and showed Sati the vision she wanted to die with. The love of her life, a Shiva. I'll be waiting for you, my love. Thinking of her Shiva, Sati let her last breath slip quietly out of her body. Chapter 46 Lament of the Blue Lord To reach the Maluhan capital as quickly as possible, Shiva had commandeered a merchant ship, which docked at Devagiri a little more than a week later. That must be the ship Sati commandeered, said Shiva, pointing towards an anchored, empty vessel. It means she's still in Devagiri, said Ganesh. Bhumi Devi be praised! Kali clenched her fist. If they've imprisoned her and hope to negotiate, I will personally destroy everything that moves in this city. Let's not assume the worst, Kali, said Shiva. We all know that whatever may be his faults, the Emperor will not harm Sati. I agree, said Karthik. And don't forget, Queen Kali, said Gopal. We have the fearsome Pashupati Astra. Nobody can stand up to it. Nobody. The mere threat of this terrifying weapon would be enough to achieve our purpose. Their conversation came to a stop with the sound of the gangplank crashing onto the deck. Where is everyone? asked Shiva, frowning as he stepped onto the gangplank. How can the port be left abandoned? asked a surprised Ayurvadi, who had never seen something like this in all the years she had lived in Maluha. Let's go, said Shiva, unease trickling down his spine. The entire brigade marched out in step with the Nilkant. As Shiva's men stepped out of the port area, their eyes fell on the large peace conference building. Inexplicably, a colony of tents had been set up outside the building. This area has been thoroughly cleaned recently, said Gopal. Even the grass has been dug out. Of course, it would be. 
said Shiva, quietening his fears. They would need a pure area for the conference. A phalanx of Brahmins was conducting a puja next to the closed door of the peace conference hall. What are they praying for, Panditji? asked Shiva. They are praying for peace, said Gopal. Shiva found nothing amiss in that. But they're praying for peace for the souls, said a surprised Gopal. The souls of the dead. Shiva instinctively reached to his side and pulled out his sword. His entire brigade did the same. As they approached the colony, Parvateshwar and Anandamai stepped out from one of the tents. Behind them was a short man in a simple white dhoti and angavastram, his head shaven clean except for a traditional tuft of hair at the crown signifying his Brahmin lineage and sporting a long, flowing white beard. Lord Prigu, whispered Gopal, immediately folding his hands together in a namaste. Namaste, great Vasudev, said Brigu politely, walking up to Gopal. Shiva held his breath as he stared at his real adversary, a man he was meeting for the first time. Great Nilkant, said Brigu. Great Maharishi, returned Shiva, his grip over his sword tightening. Brigu opened his mouth to say something, hesitated, and then looked at Parvateshwar, who had now walked up to stand next to him. Parvateshwar and Anandamai bent low in respect to their living god. As Parvateshwar rose, Shiva got his first close look at his friend-turned-foe's face. He was stunned. The Maluhan general's eyes were red and swollen, like he hadn't slept in weeks. Isn't the emperor allowing you into the city? asked Shiva. We have chosen not to enter, my lord, said Parvateshwar. Why? We don't recognize him as our emperor anymore. Is it because you don't agree with what the peace conference is trying to achieve? Is that why you are waiting here for us, with your Brahmins chanting death hymns? Parvateshwar could not speak. If you want a battle, Parvateshwar, you shall have it, announced Shiva. The battle is over, my lord. The entire war is over, great Nilkant, added Brigu. Shiva frowned, astonished. He turned towards Gopal. Has Princess Sati managed to convince the Emperor? asked Gopal. We want nothing but the end of the Somras. So long as Maluha agrees to those terms, the Nilkant is happy to declare peace. My lord, said Parvateshwar, as he touched Shiva's elbow, his eyes brimming with tears. Come with me. Where? Parvateshwar glanced at Shiva briefly, then looked at the ground again. Please, come. Shiva sheathed his sword in its scabbard and followed Parvateshwar as he walked towards the peace conference building. He in turn was followed by the others, Brigu, Kali, Ganesh, Karthik, Gopal, Virbhadra, Kritika, Ayurvati, Brahaspati and Tara. Anandamai remained outside her tent. She couldn't bear to see what was about to happen. The Brahmins continued their drone of Sanskrit shlokas as Parvateshwar came up to the building's entrance. The general took a deep breath and pushed the large doors open. As Shiva walked in, he was stunned by what he saw. Twenty beds had been laid out in the massive hall. Each bed was occupied by an injured soldier being tended to by a Brahmin doctor. On the first bed, lay one of Shiva's most ardent devotees, the one who had found him in Tibet. Nandi! screamed Shiva, racing to the bed in a few giant strides. Shiva went down on his knees and touched Nandi's face. He was unconscious. Both his arms had been severed, the left one close to his wrist and the right close to the elbow. There were numerous tiny scars all over his body, perhaps the result of small projectiles. His face was pockmarked with wounds, the bed had been specially designed to keep a part of Nandi's back untouched. He'd probably suffered a serious injury on his back as well. Shiva could see that the wounds were healing, but it was equally obvious that the injuries were grave and his body would take a long time to recover. The wounds have been left open so they can be aired, great Nilkant, said the Brahmin doctor, avoiding his eyes. We will put in a fresh dressing soon. Major Nandi will heal completely, as will all the other soldiers here. 
Shiva continued to stare at Nandi, gently touching his face, anger rising within him. He got up suddenly, drew his sword out and pointed it straight at Parvateshwar. I should murder the emperor for this, growled Shiva. Parvateshwar stood paralyzed, staring at the ground. If the emperor thinks he can force my hand by doing this and capturing Sati, said Shiva, he is living in a fool's paradise. Once Didi knows we're here, hissed Kali to Parvateshwar, she will escape, and believe me, our wrath will then be terrible. Tell that goat who rules your emperor to release my sister now! But Parvateshwar remained still, silent. Then he started shaking imperceptibly. General, said Gopal, trying to sound reasonable. There doesn't have to be any violence. Just let the princess go. Brigu attempted to speak to Gopal, but was unable to find the strength to say what he had to. Lord Brigu, said Gopal, keeping his voice low but stern, we have the Pashupatiastra. We will not hesitate to use it if our demands are not met. Release Princess Sati at once. Destroy the Somras factory in Devagiri. Do it now, and we shall leave. Brigu seemed stunned by the news of the Pashupatiastra. He turned briefly towards Parvateshwar, but the general had failed to even register the risk from the terrible Devi Astra. He was crying now, his whole body shaking with misery. He cried for the loss of the woman he had loved like the daughter he'd never had. Parvateshwar, snarled Shiva, moving his sword even closer. Don't test my patience. Where is Sati? Parvateshwar finally looked at Shiva as tears streamed down his face. Shiva stared at him, a horrific foreboding entering his heart. The space between his brows began to throb frantically. My lord, sobbed Parvateshwar, I'm so sorry. Shiva's sword slipped from his weakened grip as an excruciatingly painful thought entered his mind. With terror-struck eyes, Shiva stepped towards the general. Parvateshwar, where is she? My lord, I did not reach in time. Shiva pulled Parvateshwar by his angvastram and grabbed his neck hard. Parvateshwar, where is Sati? But Parvateshwar could not speak. He continued to cry helplessly. Shiva noticed that Brigu had glanced for one brief moment at a direction behind him. He let go of Parvateshwar and spun around instantly. He saw a large wooden door at the far end of the hall. Sati! screamed Shiva as he ran towards the room. The Brahmin doctors immediately stepped out of the raging Shiva's path. Sati! Shiva banged on the door. It was locked. He stepped back, gave himself room and rammed his shoulder into the door. It yielded an inch before the strong lock snapped it back into place. In that instant, through the crack, Shiva saw a tower made of massive blocks of ice before the door slammed back. His brow was burning now, a pain impossible for most mortals to tolerate. One of the Maluhans went running for the keys to the room. Sati! cried Shiva and slammed into the door again, splinters sticking into his shoulder, drawing blood. The door held strong. Shiva stepped back and kicked hard. It finally fell open with a thundering crash. The breath was sucked out of the Nilkant. At the center of the room, within the Tower of Ice, lay the mutilated body of the finest person he had ever known. His Sati. Sati! The Nilkant stormed into the room. His brow felt like something had exploded within. Fire was consuming the area between his eyes. He banged his fists repeatedly against a large ice block covering Sati's body, desperately trying to push it away. Blood burst forth from Shiva's shattered knuckles as he pounded against the immovable block. He kept hammering against the ice, breaking bits of it, trying to shove it away, trying to reach his Sati. His blood started seeping into the frozen water. Sati! Some Maluhans came running in from the other side of the room, sinking hooks into the block of ice covering Sati. 
They pulled hard. The block gave way and started sliding back. Shiva continued to hit hard, desperately pushing against it. The block was barely halfway out when Shiva leapt onto the tower. A small depression had been carved in the ice like a tomb. Within that icy coffin lay Sati's body, her hands folded across her chest. Shiva jumped into the tomb and pulled her body up, holding it tight in his arms. She was frozen stiff, her skin dull to a grayish blue. There was a deep cut across her face, and her left eye had been gouged out. Her left hand had been partially sliced off. There were two gaping holes in her abdomen. Frozen blood, which had seeped out of her multiple injuries, lay congealed all across her mutilated body. Shiva pulled Sati close as he looked up, crying desperately, screaming incoherently, his heart inundated, his soul shattered. Sati! It was a wail that would haunt the world for millennia. Chapter 47 A Mother's Message The setting sun infused the sky with a profusion of colors, casting a dull glow on the Peace Conference building. Parvateshwar's camp had been cleared out. A raging Karthik had threatened to kill every single man present. Not wanting to further excite the justified fury of the Nilkant son, Brigu had ordered the retreat of Parvateshwar, Anandamai, and their men into Devagiri, a city they had refused to enter thus far. Gopal was outside the Peace Conference building, in the temporary camp that had been set up for Shiva's brigade. The Vasudev chief was in discussion with the brigade commander on the best course of action. Everyone wanted vengeance, but attacking Devagiri with just one brigade was unwise. Though the main Maluhan army and its allies were waylaid in faraway Mohenjo-daro by its citizens, Devagiri still had enough troops to defend itself. The defensive features of the capital, moreover, could not be scaled with an offensive force as small as the one under Shiva's command. Some of them suggested using the Pashupati Astra. Gobal immediately rejected it. There was no question of using the weapon. Both Shiva and he had given their word. Ayurvati had busied herself in the outer room of the Peace Conference building, supervising the recovery of Sati's injured bodyguards. As she attended to the medical infusions being administered to a patient, her eyes strayed towards the locked door of the inner room. Sati's dead body lay there, with her family mourning quietly behind closed doors. Ayurvati wiped a tear and got back to work. Keeping herself busy was the only way in which she could cope with her grief. The inner room, where Sati's body had been kept temporarily, had been built by the Maluhans to fulfill the princess's last wish of preserving her body till Shiva arrived. Tiny holes had been drilled high in the inner chamber walls, with many huge blacksmith's bellows fitted into them, push in air regularly. A massive wooden circular gear had been constructed outside the Peace Conference building, with twenty bulls harnessed to it. The non-stop circular movement of the beasts made the gear move constantly. This, in turn, powered the steady squeezing and releasing of the blacksmith bellows, through a system of smaller gears and pulleys, thus pushing in air regularly into the inner room that stored Sati's body. A screen of jute, cotton and a special cooling material had been hung in front of the bellows. Through a system of pipes and capillaries, water dripped down the screen in a constant stream. The air pushed through the bellows would pass through the screen and cool down rapidly before flowing into the room. The integrity of the ice tower had been maintained with this classic Meluhan technology, but now the ice within the heart of the tower had begun to gradually melt due to the heat emanating from Shiva's body and his rapid breathing. This had caused Sati's corpse to thaw slowly, making her frozen blood melt. A pale colorless fluid oozed out, appearing almost to weep from her wounds ever so gently. Shiva sat there, immobile, shivering due to the cold and his grief, stunned into absolute silence, staring into nothingness, holding Sati's lifeless body in his arms. 
Despite sitting on ice, Shiva's brow throbbed desperately, as if a great fire raged within. An angry, blackish-red blotch had formed between his brows. He had been sitting thus for many hours. He hadn't moved. He hadn't eaten. He had stopped crying. It was almost as if he had chosen to be as lifeless as the love of his life. Kali sat near the door of the inner room, sobbing loudly, cursing herself for her behavior during her last meeting with Sati. It was a guilt that she would carry for the rest of her life. Uncontrollable rage was rising within her slowly but steadily. At this point, though, it was still swamped by her grief. Kritika sat next to the Tower of Ice, shaking uncontrollably. She had cried till she had no tears left. She kept touching the ice tower every few seconds. Virbhadra, his eyes swollen red, sat quietly next to her. One arm was around his wife Kritika, drawing as well as giving comfort. But his other arm was stiff, its fist clenched tight. He wanted vengeance. He wanted to torture and annihilate every single person who'd done this to Sati, who had done this to his friend Shiva. Brahaspati and Tara sat quietly at another end of the room. The former Meluhan chief scientist's face was soaked with tears. He respected Sati as an icon of the Meluhan way of life. He also knew that Shiva would never be the same again, ever. Tara kept staring at Shiva as her heart went out to the unfortunate Nilkant. He was a mere shadow of the confident and friendly man she had met at Pareha. Karthik and Ganesh sat impassively next to each other on the icy floor, their backs resting against the wall. Their eyes were fixed on the tower, on their father's paralyzed figure on top, holding their mother's mutilated body. The tears had almost blinded their eyes. The deluge of sorrow had stunned their hearts. They sat quietly, holding hands, desperately trying to make sense of what had happened. Ganesh thought he saw some movement on top of the ice tower. He looked up to a bewildering sight. His mother seemed to have risen from her body and floated high up in the air. Ganesh moved his gaze back to his father to see another body of his mother, lying still in his father's arms. Ganesh looked up again at his mother's apparition, his mouth agape. Sati flew in a great arc and landed softly in front of Ganesh. Her feet didn't touch the ground, remaining suspended in the air, just like those of mythical goddesses. She wore a garland of fresh flowers, again like mythical goddesses. But mythical goddesses didn't bleed. Sati, on the other hand, was bleeding profusely. Ganesh could see her mutilated body as she stood in front of him, her left eye gouged out with a deep cut across her face, leaking blood slowly. The burn scar on her face was flaming red, as though still burning. Her left hand had been sliced through brutally, blood spurting out of the wound in sudden jerks, timed with the heartbeat. There were two massive wounds in her abdomen from which blood was streaming out with the ferocity of a young mountain river. There were several small serrations all across her body, each of them seeping out even more blood. Sati's right fist was clenched tight, her body shaking with fury. Her right eye was bloodshot, focused directly on Ganesh. Her blood-soaked hair was loose, fluttering, as if a great wind had been assaulting it. It was a fearsome sight. Ma! Ma! Avenge me! hissed Sati. Ma! Avenge me! Ganesh pulled his hand away from Karthik's and clenched it tight. He gritted his teeth and whispered within the confines of his mind, I will, Ma! Remember how I died! snarled Sati. I will, I will. Promise me, you will always remember how I died. I promise, Ma, I will always remember. Sati suddenly vanished. Ganesh reached out with his hand, weeping desperately. Ma! At exactly the same time as Ganesh, Karthik too saw his mother's apparition. Sati's spirit appeared to escape from her body and hovered for some time before landing in front of Karthik. Her feet were suspended a little above the ground, a garland of fresh flowers around her neck. But unlike the vision that Ganesh had seen, the apparition in front of Karthik was whole and complete. There was no wound, 
She looked exactly the way Karthik remembered seeing her last. Tall of stature and bronze-skinned, she wore a beautiful smile, which formed dimples on both her cheeks. Her bright blue eyes shone with gentle radiance. Her black hair was tied demurely in a bun. Her erect posture and calm expression reminded Karthik of what she'd symbolized. An uncompromising Maluhan who always put the law and the welfare of others before herself. Karthik burst out crying. Ma! I son, whispered Sati. Ma, I will torture everyone. I will kill every single one of them. I will drink their blood. I will burn down this entire city. I will avenge you. No, said Sati softly. A dumbfounded Karthik fell silent. Don't you remember anything? I will remember you forever, Ma. And I will make all of Devagiri pay for what they did to you. Sati's face became stern. Don't you remember anything I've taught you? Karthik remained silent. Vengeance is a waste of time, said Sati. I am not important. The only thing that matters is dharm. Do you want to prove your love for me? Do so by doing the right thing. Don't surrender to anger. Surrender only to dharm. Ma! Forget how I died, said Sati. Remember how I lived. Ma! Promise me you will remember how I lived. I promise, Ma. I will always remember. Chapter 48 The Great Debate The ones amongst Shiva's brigade who were seeking vengeance got a boost the next morning. Against all expectations, Bhagirath sailed in at the head of the entire army of 250,000 troops. The Ayodhyan prince had been worried about what would happen to his lord if the Maluhans tried some trickery at Devagiri. He had marched the troops all the way from Lothal to Saraswati through the broad Maluhan highways without a halt, breaking only for brief food breaks and minuscule rest sessions. At the Saraswati, he had commandeered as many merchant ships as possible and raced up the great river to Devagiri. Oh Lord Ram! whispered a stunned Bhagirath. Gopal had just told Bhagirath about what had occurred at Devagiri and the brutal manner in which Sati had been killed. Where is the princess's body? asked Jinnadvaj, tears welling up in his eyes. In the peace conference building, said Gopal. The Lord Nilkant is with her. He hasn't moved from there in the last twenty-four hours. He hasn't eaten, he hasn't spoken. He is just sitting there, holding Princess Sati's body. Chandragetu looked up at the sky. He turned around and wiped away a tear. Those pearls of emotion were signs of weakness in a Kshatriya. We'll kill every single one of those bastards, growled Bhagirath his knuckles whitening on his clenched fists. We'll obliterate this entire city. There will be no trace left of this place. They have hurt our living God. Prince Bhagirath, said Gopal, his palms open in supplication. We cannot punish the entire city. We must keep a clear head. We should only punish those who are responsible for this assassination. We should destroy the Sombra's factory. We must leave the rest unharmed. That is the right thing to do. Forgive me, great Vasudev, interrupted Chandraketu. But some crimes are so terrible that the entire community must be made to pay. They have killed Lady Sati and in such a brutal manner. But not everyone came out to kill her. A vast majority was not even aware of what the emperor was up to, argued Gopal. They could have come out to stop the killing once it had begun, couldn't they? asked Chandraketu. Standing by and watching a sin being committed is as bad as committing it oneself. Don't the Vasudev say this? This is an entirely different context, King Chandraketu, said Gopal. I disagree, Pandaji, said Mathali, the king of Vaishali. Devagiri must pay. I think Lord Gopal is right, King Mathali, said Janadvaj, the Lothal governor. We cannot punish everyone in Devagiri for the sins of a few. 
Why am I not surprised to hear this? asked Mathali. What is that supposed to mean? asked Chinardwaj, stung to the quick. You are a Maluhan, said Mathali. You will stand up for your people. We are Chandravanshis. We are the ones who are truly loyal to the Lord Nilkant. Chinardwaj stepped up close to Mathali threateningly. I rebelled against my own people against my country's laws, against my vows of loyalty to Meluha because I am a follower of the Nilkant. I am loyal to Lord Shiva and I don't need to prove anything to you. Calm down everyone, said Chandraketu, the Branga king. Let's not forget who the real enemy is. The real enemy is Devagiri, said Matali. They did this to Lady Sati. They must be punished. It's as simple as that. I agree, said Bhagirath. We should use the Pashupati Astra. Gopal flared with anger. The Pashupati Astra is not some random arrow that can be fired without any thought, Prince Bhagirath. It will leave total death and devastation behind in this area for centuries to come. Maybe that is what this place deserves, said Chandraketu. These are Devi Astras, said an agitated Gopal. They cannot be used casually to settle disputes among men. Lord Shiva is not just another man, said Bhagirath. He is divine. We must use the weapon too. We cannot use the Pashupati Astra. That is final, said Gopal. I don't think so, Panditji, said Chandraketu. Lady Sati was a great leader and warrior with the highest moral standards. The Lord Nilkant loved Lady Sati more than I have seen any man love his wife. I am sure Lord Shiva wants vengeance and frankly, so do we. It's not vengeance that we need, King Chandraketu, said Gopal, but justice. The people who did this to Lady Sati must face justice, but only those who were responsible for this perfidy. Nobody else should be punished, for that would be an even bigger injustice. Yours is the voice of reason, Pandaji, said Matali. But this is not the time for reason. This is the time for anger. I don't think the Nilkant will make a decision in anger, said Gopal. Then why don't we ask Lord Shiva, said Bhagirath. Let him decide. Kill them all, growled Kali. I want this entire city to burn with every one of its citizens in it. All the commanders of Shiva, including his family members, were seated in a secluded area on the peace conference platform outside the main building. Brahaspati and Tara had also joined in, but remained mostly silent. The area had been cordoned off by soldiers to prevent anyone from listening in on the deliberations. Gopal had tried to get Shiva to attend. The Nilkant did not respond to any of his entreaties. He remained alone within the freezing inner chamber, holding Sati. Queen Kali, argued Gopal, my apologies for disagreeing with you, but we cannot do this. This is morally wrong. Didn't the Meluhans give their word that this is a peace conference? Nobody is supposed to use arms at a peace conference, right? They did something that is very morally wrong. How come you don't notice that, Panditji? Two wrongs don't make a right. I don't care, said Kali waving a hand dismissively. Devagiri will be destroyed. They will pay for what they did to my sister. Queen Kali, said Chinadhwaj carefully, I respect you immensely. You are a great woman. You have always fought for justice. But does punishing entire city for the crimes of a few serve justice? Kali cast him a withering look. I saved your life, Chinadhwaj. I know, your highness. How can I forget that that is the reason you will do what I tell you to do? Interrupted Kali. My sister will be avenged. Chinadwaj tried to argue, but my sister will be avenged. Chinadwaj fell silent. Bhagirath was carefully avoiding this discussion. While walking towards the peace conference building, he had learnt that his sister Anandamai was in Devagiri. The city would be destroyed, but he had to save his sister first. I agree with Queen Kali said Chandraketu. Devagiri must be destroyed. We must use the Pashupati Astra. At the mention of the devastating Devi Astra, Karthik spoke up for the first time. The Astra cannot be used. Gopal looked at Karthik, grateful to have at least one member of the Nilkant's family on his side. Justice will be done, 
said Kartik. Ma's blood will be avenged, but not with the Pashupati Astra. It cannot be done with that terrible weapon. It must not, agreed Gopal immediately. The Nilkant has given his word to the Vayuputras that he will not use the Pashupati Astra. If that is the case, then we cannot use it, said Bhagirath. Gopal breathed easy, glad to have pulled at least some of them back from the brink. The question remains, how do we give justice to Princess Sati? By killing them all, roared Kali. But is it fair to kill children who had nothing to do with this? asked Bhagirath. You are assuming, Prince Bhagirath, said Kali, that Meluhans care for their children. Your Highness, said Bhagirath, please try to understand that children who had nothing to do with this crime should not be punished. Fine, said Kali. We we'll let their children out. And non-combatants as well, said Kartik. Particularly the women, said Bhagirath. We must let them go. But once they are out, we should destroy the entire city. Is there anyone else you'd like to save? asked Kali sarcastically. What about the dogs in Devagiri? Should we lead them out too? Maybe the cockroaches as well? Bhagirath did not respond. Anything he said would only inflame Kali further. Kali cursed. All right! Children and non-combatants will be allowed out. Everyone else will remain prisoner in the city. And they will all be killed. Agreed, said Bhagirath. All I'm saying is, we should be fair. That is not all there is to it, Prince Bhagirath, erupted Karthik. The Somras is not to be destroyed. My father had been very clear about that. It is only supposed to be taken out of the equation. We do have to destroy the Somras factory. But we also have to ensure that the knowledge of the Somras is not lost. We have to save the scientists and take them to a secret location. They will be part of the tribe that my father will leave behind. These people will keep the knowledge of the Somras alive. Today it is evil, but there may come a time in the future when the Somras may be good again. Gopal nodded. Karthik has spoken wisely. This means that even if some of the scientists had something to do with my mother's death, said Karthik, we have to set aside our pain and save them. We have to save them for the sake of India's future. Ganesh glared at Karthik with dagger eyes. Set aside our pain? Karthik became silent. Ganesh was breathing heavily, barely able to keep a hold on his emotions. Don't you feel any anger about Ma's death? Any rage? Any fury? Tata, what I was trying to say... You always received Ma's love on a platter from the day you were born. That's why you don't value it. Tata, ask me about the value of a mother's love. Ask me how much you hanker for it when you don't have it. Tada, I loved her too. You know I... Did you see her body, Kartik? Tada, did you? Have you looked at her body? Tada, of course I have. There are 51 wounds on her. I counted them, Kartik. 51! I know. Furious tears were pouring down Ganesha's face. Those... Bastards must have continued hacking at her, even after she was dead. Dada, listen. Ganesha's body was shaking with anger now. Didn't you feel any rage when you saw your mother's mutilated body? Of course I did, Dada, but... But? But? What but can there be? She was attacked by many of those sombras worshipping demons simultaneously. It is our duty to avenge her. Our duty... It is the least we can do for the best mother in the world. Dada, she was the best mother. But she taught us to always put the world before ourselves. Ganesh didn't say anything. His long floppy nose had stiffened like it did on the rare occasions when he was enraged. Karthik spoke softly. Dada, if we were any other family I would give in to my rage, but, but we are not. Ganesh looked away too livid to even respond. We are the family of the Nilkant, said Karthik. We have a responsibility to the world. Responsibility to the world? My parents are my world! Karthik fell silent. Ganesh pointed his finger threateningly towards Karthik. Not one of those Somras worshipping bastards will get out of here alive! Dada? Every single one of them will be killed. 
even if I have to kill them myself. Kartik fell silent. Gopal sighed as he looked at Kali, Ganesh and Kartik. There was too much anger. He couldn't figure out a way to save the Somra scientists from Ganesh and Kali's rage. But at least he had managed to take the conversation away from the dangerous talk of using the Pashupati Astra. And maybe there was still hope that over the next few hours he would convince the Nirkant's family of the necessity of saving the Somra scientists. Shiva had been sitting quietly in the icy tomb, holding Sati's body. His eyes were sunken and expressionless, with no light of hope in them, with no reason to even exist. The blackish-red blotch on his brow was visibly throbbing. He was shivering due to the cold. A single droplet of fluid had escaped from Sati's good eye, now closed, and ran down her face like a tear. There was an unearthly silence in the room, except for the soft hissing of the cold air being pumped in at regular intervals. A sudden sharp noise startled Shiva, perhaps from the bulls harnessed to the Maluhan cooling system. He looked around with cold, expressionless eyes. There was nobody in the chamber. He looked down at his dead wife. He pulled her body close and kissed her gently on her forehead. Then he carefully placed her back on the ice. Caressing her face tenderly, Shiva whispered, Stay here, Sati. I'll be back soon. Shiva jumped off the ice tower and walked up to the door of the inner chamber. As soon as he opened it, Ayurvati stood up. Accompanied by her medical team, she had been tending to Nandi and the other soldiers for the last twenty-four hours. My lord, said Ayurvati, her eyes red and swollen from accumulated misery and lack of sleep. Shiva ignored her and continued walking. Ayurvati looked at Shiva with foreboding and terror. She had never seen the Nilkant's eyes look so hard and remote. He looked like he had gone beyond rage, beyond ruthlessness, beyond insanity. Shiva opened the main door. He heard voices to his right. He turned to see his commanders in deep discussion. Tara was the first to notice him. Lord Nilkant, said Tara, immediately rising to her feet. Shiva stared at her blankly for a few seconds, then took a deep breath and spoke evenly. Tara, the Pashupati Astra trunk is in my ship. Bring it here. A panic-stricken Gopal rushed towards Shiva. He knew that Shiva hadn't eaten in twenty-four hours. He hadn't slept. He had been sitting on top of an inhumanly cold tower. Grief had practically unhinged him. He knew the Nilkant wasn't himself. My friend, listen to me. Don't make a decision like this in haste. Shiva looked at Gopal, his face frozen. I know you're angry, Nilkant, but don't do this. I know your good heart. You will repent it. Shiva turned around to walk back into the conference building. Gopal reached out and held Shiva's arm, trying to pull him back. Shiva! pleaded Gopal. You've given your word to the Vayuputras. You've given your word to your uncle, Lord Mitra. Shiva gripped Gopal's hand tightly and removed it from his arm. Shiva, the power of this weapon is terrible and unpredictable, pleaded Gopal, grasping at any argument to stop this tragedy. Even if the Pashupati Astra's destruction is restricted to the inner circle, any attempt to destroy all three platforms of Devagiri will widen this circle. It will not just destroy Devagiri, it will also destroy all of us. Do you really want to kill your entire army, your family and your friends? Tell them to leave. Shiva's voice was soft, barely audible. His eyes remained remote and unfocused, staring into space. Gopal paused for a moment, watching Shiva with a glimmer of hope. Should I tell our people to leave? With the Pashupati Astra? Shiva did not move. There was no reaction on his face. No. Tell the people of this city to leave. All except those who have protected or made the Somras, and those directly responsible for Sati's death. For when I am done, there will be no more Daksh. There will be no more Somras. There will be no more evil. It will be as if this place, this evil, never existed. Nothing will live here. 
Nothing will grow here, and no two stones will be left standing upon each other to show that there was ever a Devagiri. It all ends now. Gopal was grateful that at least the innocent people of Devagiri would be saved. But what about Lord Rudra's law banning the use of Devi Astras? Shiva, the Pashupati Astra? whispered Gopal with hope. Shiva stared at Gopal unemotionally and spoke in a voice that was eerily composed. I will burn down this entire world. Gopal stared at Shiva with foreboding. The Nilkant turned around and walked back into the building to his sati. Tara rose. Where are you going? whispered Rasbati. To get the Pashupati Astra, answered Tara softly. You cannot. It will destroy us all. No, it won't. These weapons can be triangulated in such a way that the devastation will remain confined within the city. We will not be affected if we remain more than five kilometers away. Tara began to walk away. Braspati pulled her back and whispered urgently, What are you doing? You know this is wrong. I feel for Shiva, but the Pashupati Astra... Tara stared at Braspati without a hint of doubt in her eyes. Lord Ram's sacred laws have been shamelessly broken. The Nilkant deserves his vengeance. Of course he does, said Braspati, meeting her gaze without flinching, but not with the Pashupati Astra. Don't you feel his pain? What kind of a friend are you? Tara, I had once considered doing something wrong. I had wanted to assassinate a man who was to duel Sati. Shiva stopped me. He stopped me from taking a sin upon my soul. If I have to be a true friend to him, I have to stop him from tarnishing his soul. I can't let him use the Pashupati Astra. His soul is already dead, Prahaspati. It's lying on top of that ice tower, said Tara. I know, but... Tara pulled a hand away from Prahaspati. You expect him to fight in accordance with the laws when his enemies have not. They have taken everything from him, his life, his soul, his entire reason for existence. He deserves his vengeance. Chapter 49 Debt to the Nilgant Shiva's army had been divided into three groups, led by Bhagirath, Chandraketu and Matali. Each group was stationed outside the gates of the three platforms of Devagiri. Matali's troops blocked the Svarna platform. Chandraketu's forces guarded the exit from the Rajat platform. And Bhagirath's troops were at the steps of the Tamra platform. Shiva's instructions had been followed. Ignoring Kali's protests, Shiva's forces informed those within the city that they would be allowed to leave all except those Kshatriyas who had fought to protect the Somras and those Brahmins who had worked to create the Somras. Daksha and his personal bodyguards, including Vidyunmali, had also been specifically excluded from the amnesty. An evacuation had begun. What amazed the Chandravanshis among Shiva's troops was the number of citizens who chose to stay on and die with Devagiri. There were many who came in a disciplined line to the city gates, said a dignified goodbye to their families, and walked silently back to their homes to await death. There was no acrimony, no fighting at the gates or attempt to save the city, not even melodramatic farewells. Gopal and Karthik had stationed themselves at the Thamra platform along with Bhagirat's troops. The soldiers on this side were primarily Brangas. A tired Bhagirath, having just supervised the construction of the perimeter barricades, rejoined them. The Ayodhyan prince nodded towards the odd movements of citizens at the gate, half of them leaving and the other half returning to the city. What's going on here? Karthik dropped his eyes and said nothing, while Gopal's eyes welled up. It is becoming a movement amongst the Meluhans, said the chief of the Vasudevs. An act of honor, a cause that demands your life. Stay and die with your city. Have your soul purified by allowing yourself to be killed by the Nilkant. He stopped himself, obviously overcome with emotion. Bhagirath raised his eyebrows. What do you mean? Gopal gestured towards the crowd, where yet another woman had said goodbye to a couple before calmly turning back towards the city. See for yourself. He said, 
Bhagirath paused for a moment, brows knitted, to study Gopal's face before turning back to the woman. Excuse me, madam, Bhagirath called out to her and she stopped, turning to face him. Why are you returning to the city? Why are you not evacuating with the others? The folds of her angvastram wafted gently in the breeze around her. She had a kind face, with dark quiet eyes and a soft voice. She spoke calmly, as if she was discussing the weather. I am a Maluhan. To be Maluhan is not about the country you live in. It is about how you live, what you believe in. What is the purpose of a long life, if not to strive for something higher? Lord Ram's most sacred law has been broken. We have fallen. All that we are has already been destroyed. What can we now hope to strive for in this life, if this is our karam? Bhagirath couldn't believe his ears. The Maluhan woman continued, I believe in the Nilkant. I have waited for him for so many years, worshipped him. And this is what Maluha has done to him, to our princess, the most exemplary Maluhan of us all, who lived every breath of her life strictly according to Lord Ram's code. This is what Maluha has done to our laws that make us who we are. She was quiet for a moment, her eyes searching his. I am guilty. I took the Somras. I followed the Emperor and, through my complacency and silence, was party to everything that conspired to bring this about. If this is Maluha's evil, then it is my evil too. My karma. I will pay my debt to the Nilkant this day and pray that it may allow me to be reborn with a little less sin upon my soul. Bhagirath was stunned. What logic was this? She inclined her head in a half nod towards him and again began walking with perfect composure back into the city. Gopal's voice came from behind him. I know. They all say the same thing. I am a Luhan. The law has been broken. It is my karma. They stood in silence together and watched the woman go. Prince Bhagirath, the two of them started slightly, pulled out of their silent contemplation. Yes, Karthik, said Bhagirath, turning to face him. I want you to call General Parvateshwar. I have already sent in a messenger to get Anandamai, said Bhagirath. But neither she nor her husband has come as yet. She will not leave without Parvateshwar. I am still trying to convince the both of them. Tell them, said Gopal, Lord Karthik and I have invited them here. We need to talk about something that is important for India's future. Bhagirath frowned. He knew that what Gopal and Karthik were suggesting was the only way to get his sister and her husband out of Devagiri, tenuous though it may be. I will go into the city myself, said Bhagirath. And Prince Bhagirath? Gopal hesitated. I understand, Panditji. I will not breathe a word of this to anyone. They stood in silence together looking at a city that would no longer exist tomorrow. Excuse me, said a voice. They turned around to see a small group of Maluhans. Yes, said Karthik. We left the city this morning, but have changed our minds now. We would like to stay. May we go back in? Gopal stared at them in disbelief, and Bhagirath dropped his eyes, praying that he would be able to convince his sister to leave. It was late into the third prahar and the sun was on its way down. This would be the last time that the sun would set on Devagiri. Virani looked up at the sky as she walked out of the Devagiri royal palace. Your Highness, saluted a guard smartly, falling into step behind her. Virani absently waved her hand and walked towards the gate. Your Highness, are you leaving? asked a shocked guard. He seemed genuinely stunned that the Maluhan queen was abandoning them and taking up the Nilkant's offer of amnesty. Virani didn't bother with a reply, but continued walking down the road towards the Svarna platform gate. Has this been ordered by the Nilkant? asked Anandamai before looking at her husband. Parvateshwar and she were in a secluded section outside the Tamra platform, speaking with Gopal, Karthik and Bhagirath. It's what he would want, said Gopal. He just doesn't know it at this point of time. Parvateshwar frowned. If the Nilkant has said no, then it means no. General, 
I appreciate your loyalty, said Gopal. But there is also the larger picture. The Somras is evil now, but it's not supposed to be completely destroyed. You know as well as I do. It's only supposed to be taken out of the equation. We have to keep the knowledge of the Somras alive, for it may well be required again. It's the future of India that we are talking about. Are you suggesting that the Lord Nilkant doesn't care about India? Asked Parvadeshwar. I am saying no such thing, General, said Gopal. But Karthik suddenly stepped in. I appreciate your loyalty to my father. And I'm sure you're aware of my love for him as well. Parvateshwar nodded, not saying anything. My father is distraught at this point in time, said Karthik. You know of his devotion to my mother. The grief of her death has clouded his mind. He is furious and rightly so. But you also know that his heart is pure. He would not want to do anything that is against his dharma. I only intend to keep the technology of the Somras alive till my father's rage subsides. If, after calm reflection, he still decides that everything associated with the Somras should be destroyed, I will personally see to it. Parvateshwar stared into space, his eyes brooding and dark. And in order to do that, you must ensure the survival of the Brahmins, together with their Somras libraries, he sighed. Many of those Somras worshipping intellectuals would grab the opportunity to live. But there are some who have heard the call of honor. Karthik, you cannot coerce a man to forsake his honor. You cannot force him to live, particularly if it is to continue the Somras which his Nilkant has declared evil and which is causing the destruction of his homeland. Karthik held Parvateshwar's hand. General, my mother appeared in a dream to me. She told me to do the right thing. She told me to remember how she lived and not how she died. Even you know she would have done exactly what I am trying to do. Parvateshwar looked up at the sky and quickly wiped a tear. He was quiet for a long time. All right, Karthik, he said at last. I will bring those people out. I will talk them out where I can and force them out where I cannot. But remember, they are your responsibility. They cannot be allowed to propagate evil any longer. Only the Lord Nilkant can decide the fate of the Sombras. Not you, not Lord Gopal, nor anyone else. Virani rapidly walked down the Svarna platform steps as all the assembled people made way for their queen. Mathali's forces were in charge here, checking the papers and antecedents of everyone who sought to leave the city. The soldiers saluted Virani. She acknowledged them distractedly, but kept walking towards the massive wooden tower being constructed a good four kilometers from the city. That was the base from which the Pashupati Astra missile would be launched. As she neared the tower, Virini could see Shiva issuing instructions. She immediately recognized the woman who stood next to him, Braspati's love, Tara. Ganesh was working with Tara, his brilliant engineering skills coming in handy in building the solid tower. Kali sat a little distance away on a rock, seemingly lost in thought. Kali was the first to see her. Ma! Virini walked up to Shiva as Kali and Ganesh stepped up. Shiva looked at Virini with glazed eyes, the now constant throbbing pain in his brow making it difficult for him to focus. Virini had always been struck by Shiva's eyes, the intelligence, focus and mirth that resided in them. She believed it was his eyes rather than his blue throat that were the foundation of his charisma. But they now reflected nothing but pain and grief, giving a glimpse into a soul that had lost its reason to live. Shiva had not for a moment suspected that Virini was involved with Sati's assassination in any way. He bowed his head and brought his hands together in a respectful namaste. Virini held Shiva's hand, her eyes drawn to the throbbing blackish-red blotch on his brow. My son, I can't even imagine the pain that you are going through. Shiva was quiet, looking lost and broken. I gave my word to Sati. A promise she extracted from me just before her death. I am here to fulfill it. Shiva's eyes suddenly found their focus. He looked up at Virini. 
she insisted that she be cremated by both her sons. Ganesh, who was standing next to Virini, sucked in his breath as tears slipped from his eyes. Tradition held that while the eldest child cremated the father, it was the youngest who conducted the funeral proceedings of the mother. Also, it was considered inauspicious for Nagas to be involved in any funeral ceremony. So Ganesh had not expected the honor of lighting his mother's pyre. Kali turned and held Ganesh. But traditionally, only the youngest child can perform the mother's last rites, said Virini to Shiva. If there is anyone who can challenge that tradition, it is you. I don't give a damn about that tradition, said Shiva. If Sati wanted it, then it will be done. I'll tell Karthik as well, said Virini. I've been told he's at the Tamra platform. Shiva nodded silently before looking back towards the building where Sati's body lay entombed in ice. Virini stepped forward to embrace Shiva. He held his mother-in-law lightly. Try to find some peace, Shiva, said Virini. It's what Sati would have wanted. Have you been able to find peace? Virini smiled wanly. We will only find peace now, when we meet Sati again, said Shiva. She was a great woman. Any mother would be proud to have a daughter like her. Shiva kept quiet, wiping a tear from the corner of his eye. Virini held Shiva's hand. I have to tell you this. She could have been alive. When she found out about the conspiracy, she was in Devagiri, in our palace. She could have chosen to stay out of it. But she fought her way out of the city and rushed into the battle to save Nandi and her other bodyguards. And she did save many. She died a brave, honorable warrior's death, fighting and challenging her opponents till her last breath. It was the kind of death she always wished for herself, that any warrior wishes for himself. Shiva's eyes welled up again. Sati set very high standards for herself. Virini smiled sadly. Shiva took a deep breath. He needed to focus on the Pashupati Astra. He folded his hands together in a polite namaste. I should. Of course, said Virini. I understand. Shiva bent and touched his mother-in-law's feet. She touched his head gently and blessed him. He turned and walked back to supervise the work on the weapon. This was the only thing that stopped his spirit from imploding. Virini turned and embraced her daughter Kali and grandson Ganesh. I have been unfair to the both of you, said Virini. No, you haven't, Ma, said Kali. It was father who committed the sins, not you. But I failed in my duty as a mother. I should have abandoned my husband when he refused to accept you. Kali shook her head. You had your duty as a wife as well. It is not a wife's duty to support her husband in his misdeeds. In fact, a good wife corrects her husband when he is wrong, even if she has to ram it down his throat. I don't think you would have listened, Nani, said Ganesh to his grandmother. No matter how hard you tried, that man is... Virini looked at her grandson as Ganesh checked himself from insulting his grandfather to her face. She noticed his eyes. They weren't calm and detached like they had been the last time she had met him. They were full of rage, repressed fury over his mother's death. Nani, if you will excuse me, I need to work on the tower. Of course, my child. Ganesh bent down, touched his grandmother's feet and walked back to Thara. Ma, wait a bit and Ganesh will take you to our ship, said Kali. You can stay there till this is over and then return with us to Panchavati. It would be so wonderful to have you in my home, even if it is a hundred years after it was meant to be. Having you with us will help us all cope with our grief and the vacuum left behind by Sati. Virini smiled and embraced Kali. I'll have to wait for my next birth to live in your home, my child. Kali was taken aback. Ma, you don't have to be punished for that old goat's crimes. You will not return to Devagiri. Don't be ridiculous, Kali. I'm the queen of Meluha. When Devagiri dies, so shall I. 
Of course not, cried Kali. There's no reason. Would you leave Panchavati on the day of its destruction? Kali was stumped, but the Naga queen was not one who gave in easily. That's a hypothetical question, Ma. What is important is that... What is important, my child, interrupted Virani, is the identity of the man who helped your father execute the conspiracy. Many of the conspirators have escaped, as have the assassins. They will not die here tomorrow. You need to find them. You need to punish them. Chapter 50 Saving a Legacy The sun had long set across the western horizon. Karthik, Gopal and Bhagirath were stationed at the far corner of the Tamra platform. Neither the other two Devagiri platforms nor Shiva's army encampment had a clear view of this area. It was the best place for Karthik to carry out his mission. Twenty Branga soldiers from the command of Devadas who had become fanatically loyal to Karthik after the battle of Bal Atibal Kund were with him. These soldiers held on tightly to a rope gently allowing it to roll away from them at a gradual pace. Devadas worked along with them. The rope was attached to a pulley that had been rigged on top of the Tamra platform wall. Circling the pulley, the rope went down to where it had been tied to a wooden cage which could carry ten Brahmins at a time. Ten of them, together with their books and essential equipment, were descending towards Karthik's refuge. Secrecy was essential for it was forbidden to remove any knowledge of the Somras from the city, the penalty being death. As a failsafe, another rope had been tied to the wooden cage. This particular rope was also circled around a pulley that was rigged onto the fort wall, but the grasping end of this rope was in the hands of the Surya Vanshi soldiers at the top of the platform. They were being supervised by Parvateshwar. Both groups of soldiers worked in tandem to release their ends of the rope at the same pace so that the cage could descend gently to the ground. The angle of the wall made it impossible for Parvateshwar to look over and judge the movement of the wooden cage as well as its distance from the ground. And if the Surya Vanshis holding the rope on top did not synchronize their movement with Devadas's team below, it could lead to the cage becoming unbalanced, resulting in a possible accident. To prevent this from happening, Bhagirath had been made to stand at a distance far enough to be able to view both Devadas's team as well as the Surya Vanshis above. The new moon helped aid Bhagirath's vision. His task was to keep whistling the way the birds do, but in a steady rhythm till a wooden cage touched the ground. He played the role of a timekeeper, setting the pace for the movements of the soldiers. Karthik whirled around when Bhagirath's whistling stopped. Devadas and his team had not paused but continued releasing the rope at the same pace. The Surya Vanshis on top of the fort walls, however, used to following orders, had instantly come to a halt when Bhagirath stopped whistling. Immediately, the wooden cage became unbalanced and tilted heavily to one side. Stop! hissed Karthik. Devadas and his team stopped. The cage containing ten Brahmins of the Somras factory remained suspended dangerously in the air. To the admiration of Gopal, the Brahmins in the cage remained quiet despite the possibility of falling to their death. Any sharp noise would have alerted others to what was going on. Karthik rushed towards Bhagirath, who seemed lost in his own world. Prince Bhagirath? Bhagirath immediately came out of his stupor and began to whistle. The Surya Vanshi started releasing the rope at a steady pace and the wooden cage descended softly to the ground. The Brahmins caged within stepped out quickly in an orderly fashion. As the two teams began pulling the empty cage back up, the whistling was no longer required. In the upward movement, what was necessary was speed and not steadiness. Prince Bhagirath, please pay attention. The lives of many people are at stake. Karthik was aware of the reason behind Bhagirath's distress. Parvateshwar had refused to leave Devagiri. The Maluhan general had decided he would perish along with his beloved city. And to Bhagirat's utter dismay, Anandamai had decided to stay with her husband. Bhagirat had fought passionately with her 
over her decision. He had pleaded with her, had begged her to reconsider. Do you think Parvateshwar wants you to die? And what about me? Why are you trying to hurt me? Do you hate me so much? I am your brother. What have I done to deserve this? Anandamai had only smiled, her eyes glistening with love and tears. Bhagirath, you love me and want to live with every fibre of your soul. So let me live. Let me live every last second of my life in the way that I believe life should be lived. Let me go. Bhagirath shook his head as if to clear his mind. My apologies, Karthik. Karthik stepped forward and held Bhagirath's arm. Prince, your sister was right about you. You will make a far better king than your father. Bhagirath snorted. He already knew the Chandravanshi army that had been ordered to march to Devagiri under the command of the Maluhan brigadier Vraka had rebelled against his father, Emperor Dilipa. The soldiers believed that the Ayodhyan emperor had led them into an ill-conceived battle where they were fighting on the side of their former enemies, the Maluhans, against the Nilkant. Bhagirat knew that a section of the troops had already set out for Devagiri to convince him to ascend the throne. But he didn't care. He was tormented by the impending loss of his beloved sister. But do you know what the mark of a great king is? asked Karthik. Bhagirat looked at Karthik. It's the ability to remain focused, regardless of personal tragedy. You will have time to mourn your sister and brother-in-law, Prince Bhagirath, but not now. You are the only one here who can whistle like a night bird and make it sound natural. You cannot fail. Yes, Lord Karthik, said Bhagirath, addressing the young man as his lord for the first time. Karthik turned around. Come here. A Branga soldier marched up. Prince Bhagirath, said Karthik, this man will remain here to support you in your task. Bhagirat didn't object. Karthik quickly walked back to Gopal. Seeing the pensive look of the Vasudev chief, Karthik asked, What happened, Panditji? Gopal pointed to the Surya Vanshi soldier. Lord Parvateshwar has sent a message. Maharishi Bhrigu has refused to leave the city. Karthik shook his head. Why are the Meluhans so bloody eager to die? What do I do, Lord Karthik? asked the Surya Vanshi. Take me to Maharishi Bhrigu. A flickering sacrificial flame spread its light as best as it could in the night. Its reflection on the nearby Saraswati river aided its cause. Ganesh sat quietly on a patla, a low stool. With his legs crossed and his fleshy hands placed on his knees, his long fingers extended out delicately. He wore a white dhoti. A barber was shearing Ganesh's hair while Ganesh kept chanting a mantra softly and dropping some ghee into the sacrificial flame. Having removed all of Ganesh's hair, the barber put his implement down and wiped his head with a cloth. Then he picked up a small bottle he had taken from Ayurvati, poured the disinfectant into his hands and spread it on Ganesh's head. It's done, my lord. Ganesh didn't reply. He looked directly at the sacrificial flame and spoke softly. She was the purest among them all, Lord Agni. Remember that as you consume her. Take care of her and carry her straight to heaven. For that is where she came from. She was, is and forever will be a goddess. She will be the mother goddess. It was late in the night. When a tired Shiva trudged back to his sati, the Pashupati Astra was ready. There were just a few more tests that needed to be conducted. Tara was at it. The peace conference area was within the external blast radius of the Pashupati Astra, so sati's body would be moved from her icy tomb the next morning. What nobody dared verbalize was that, without the Meluhan cooling mechanism, her body would start decomposing and she would need to be cremated. That was something Shiva refused to contemplate. Shiva opened the door of the inner chamber in the building, shivering at the sudden blast of cold air. He could see Ganesh, his son, standing next to the ice tower, holding his dead mother's hand. His head had been shaven clean. The lord of the Nagas was on his toes, his mouth close to his mother's ear. Following an ancient tradition, 
he was whispering hymns from the Rig Veda into her ear. Shiva walked up to Ganesh and touched his shoulder lightly. Ganesh immediately pulled up his white Angavastram and wiped his eyes before turning to face his father. Shiva embraced his son. I miss her, Baba. Ganesh held Shiva tightly. I miss her too. Ganesh began to cry. I abandoned her in her hour of need. You weren't the only one, my son. I wasn't there either. But we will avenge her. Ganesh kept sobbing helplessly. I want to kill them all. I want to kill every single one of those bastards. We will kill the evil that took her life. Shiva held his son quietly while he sobbed. He closed his eyes and pulled Ganesh in tighter and whispered hoarsely, Whatever the cost. Virbhadra and Kritika had come to the Rajat platform. Kritika had lived in Devagiri for a long time and knew most people, so she had been trying to speak to those who were choosing to stay back, convincing them to leave. Virbhadra, I need to talk to you. Virbhadra turned around to see Kali and Pashuram standing behind him. Yes, Your Highness, said Virbhadra. In private, said Kali. Of course, said Virbhadra, touching Kritika lightly before walking away. Vidyan Mali, spat out Virbhadra, his face hardening with fury. He's the main conspirator, said Kali. He's hidden in the city, badly injured from some recent skirmish. Parshuram touched Virbhadra's shoulders. We have to enter the city in a small group and locate him. Kali touched her knife, a serrated blade that delivered particularly painful wounds. We need to encourage him to talk. We need to know the identity of the assassins who escaped. That son of a bitch deserves a slow, painful death, growled Virbhadra. That he does, said Kali, but not before we've made him talk. Parshuram stretched his hand out, palm facing ground. For the Lord Nilkant. Virbhadra placed his hand on Parshuram. For Shiva. Kali placed her hand on top. For Sati. Chapter 51 Live on to your karma. You want to enter Devagiri? screeched Kritika. Are you mad? I'll be back soon, Kritika, argued Virbhadra. There is no lawlessness in the city. You've seen the way the Meluhans are behaving. That may be so, but Vidyan Mali's men will surely be prowling the streets. What do you think they're going to do? Welcome you with flowers? They will not notice me, Kritika. Nonsense! Most people in Devagiri recognize you as the Lord Nilkant's friend. They will recognize me only if they see me. It's late at night. I'm going to be hidden from view. Nobody will notice me. Why can't you send someone else? Because this is the least I can do for my friend. We need to find out who Princess Sati's actual killers are. Vidyan Mali knows. He is the one who organized and implemented this peace farce. But we are destroying the entire city. All the conspirators will be dead in any case. Kritika, many of the killers got away, said Virbhadra. Except for Vidyanwali, nobody knows who they are. If we don't get to know their identities now, we will never know. Kritika looked away, having run out of arguments, but still deeply troubled. I'm as angry as you are about Princess Sati's death. But the killing has to stop sometime. I have to go, Kritika. Virbhadra tried to kiss her goodbye, but she turned her face away. He could understand her anger. She had lost the woman she had idolized all her life. Her hometown, Devagiri, was about to be destroyed. She did not want to risk losing her husband as well. But Virbhadra had to do this. Sati's killers had to be punished. Panditji, said Karthik his hands folded in a namaste and his head bowed low. Brigu opened his eyes. The Maharishi had been meditating 
in the grand Indra temple next to the public bath. Lord Karthik, said Brigo, surprised to see Karthik in Devagiri at this time of night. I am too young for you to address me as Lord Great Maharishi, said Karthik. Noble deeds make a man a lord, not merely his age. I have heard about your efforts to ensure the Somras is not completely destroyed. History will thank you for it. Your glory will be recounted for ages. I am not working for my own glory, Panditji. My task is to be true to my father's mission. My task is to do what my mother would have wanted me to do. Brigu smiled. I don't think your mother would have wanted you to come here. I don't think she would have wanted you to save me. I disagree, said Karthik. You are a good man. You just picked the wrong side. I didn't just pick this side. I led it into battle, and the dictates of Dharm demand that I perish with it. Why? If the side I led committed such crimes, I must pay for it. If fate has determined that those that supported the Somras have sinned, then the Somras must be evil. I was wrong, and my punishment is death. Isn't that taking the easy way out? Brigu stared at Karthik, angered by the implied insult. So you think you've done something wrong, Panditji, said Karthik. What is the way out? Escaping through death? Or actually working to set things right by balancing your karma? What can I do? I have conceded that the Somras is evil. There is nothing left for me to do now. You have a vast storehouse of knowledge within you, Panditji, said Karthik. The Somras is not the only subject you excel at. Should the world be deprived of Lord Brigu's Samhita? I don't think anyone is interested in my knowledge. That is for posterity to determine. You should only do your duty. Brigu fell silent. Panditji, your karm is to spread your knowledge throughout the world, said Karthik. Whether others choose to listen or not is their karm. Brigu shook his head as a wry smile softened his expression. You speak well, son of the Nilkant, but I chose to support something that turned out to be evil. For this sin, I must die. There is no karm left for me in this life. I will have to wait to be born again. One cannot allow a bad deed to arrest the wheel of karm. Don't banish yourself from this world as a punishment for your sin. Instead, stay here and do some good so that you can cleanse your karm. Brigu stared at Karthik silently. One cannot undo what has happened, but the inexorable march of time offers the wise opportunities for redemption. I entreat you, do not escape. Stay in this world and do your karm. Brigu smiled. You are very intelligent for such a young boy. I am the son of Shiva and Sati, smiled Karthik. I am the younger brother of Ganesh. When the gardeners are good, the flower will bloom. Brigu turned towards the idol of Lord Indra within the Sanctum Sanctorum. The great god, the killer of the primal demon Vritra, stood resplendent as he held his favorite weapon, Vajra, the thunderbolt. Brigu folded his hands into a namaste and bowed, praying for the god's blessing. The Maharishi then turned back to Karthik and whispered, Samita. The Brigu Samita, said Karthik. The world will benefit from your vast knowledge, Panditji. Come with me. Don't sit here and wait for death. The sun rose on the day that would be Devagiri's last. The Pashupati Astra was ready. After barring the gates, Shiva's soldiers had been asked to retreat beyond the safety line, out of the range of the expected radius of exposure. The relatives of those remaining within Devagiri, too, waited patiently as they were herded back by Chandraketu's brangas. They kept up a constant prayer for the souls of their loved ones who were left behind in the city. Maharishi Brigu and another 300 people who knew the secrets of the Somras 
had been successfully spirited out of Devagiri the previous night. They were now kept imprisoned in a temporary stockade 10 kilometers north of Devagiri under the watchful eye of Devadas and his soldiers. Karthik intended to wait for his father's anger to subside before talking to him about Brigu and the others. The peace conference building had been abandoned. Nandi and the other surviving bodyguards had been carefully evacuated onto Shiva's ship where a medical team under the supervision of Ayurvati maintained a constant vigil. Ayurvati was worried about the blackish red mark on Shiva's brow. It had made its appearance many times before, especially when Shiva was angry, but very rarely had it stayed for so long. Shiva had brushed aside Ayurvati's concerns. Shiva, Kali, Ganesh and Karthik carried Sati's body gently to a specially prepared cabin on the ship. Her corpse was laid with great care within another tomb of ice. Shiva gently ran his hand across Sati's face and whispered, Devagiri will pay for its crimes, my love. You will be avenged. As Shiva stepped back, the soldiers placed another block of ice on top, enveloping Sati's body completely. Shiva, Kali, Ganesh and Kartik took one last look at Sati before turning around and walking out of the ship. Gopal and the kings in Shiva's army waited at the port. Shiva turned and nodded towards the ship captain. Soldiers marched into the rowing deck of the ship to row it back a fair distance down the Saraswati River, far away from the external blast radius of the Pashupati Astra. The weapon is armed, Lord Nilkant, said Tara. Shiva cast an expressionless look at an unhappy Gopal and then turned back towards Tara. Let's go. It was a fourth hour of the second Prahar, just a couple of hours before Devagiri was to be destroyed. Virini knocked on Parvateshwar's door. There was no answer. Parvateshwar and Anandamai were probably alone at home. Virini pushed open the door and stepped into the house. She walked past the lobby into the central courtyard. General! called out Virini. No response. General! said Virini again, a little louder this time. It is I! The Queen of Meluha. Your Highness. Virini glanced up to see a surprised Parvateshwar looking down from the balcony on the top floor. His hair was disheveled and an Angavastram had been hastily thrown over his shoulders. My apologies if I have come at a bad time, General. Not at all, Your Highness, said Parvateshwar. It's just that we don't have much time left, said Virini. There is something I needed to tell you. Please give me a moment, Your Highness. I'll be down shortly. Of course, said Virini. Virini walked into the large waiting room next to the courtyard, settled on a comfortable chair and waited. A few minutes later, Parvateshwar, clad in a spotless white dhoti and angavastram, his hair neatly in place, walked into the room. Behind him was his wife, Anandamai, also clad in white, the color of purity. Virini rose. Please accept my apologies for disturbing you. Not at all, Your Highness, said Parvateshwar. Please be seated. Virini resumed her seat as Parvateshwar and Anandamai sat next to her. What did you want to talk about, Your Highness? asked Parvateshwar. Virini seemed to hesitate. Then she looked at Anandamai and Parvateshwar with a smile. I wanted to thank you. Thank us? asked a surprised Parvateshwar, casting a look at Anandamai before turning back to Virini. Thank us for what, Your Highness? For keeping the legacy of Devagiri alive, said Virini. Parvateshwar and Anandamai remained silent, their expressions reflecting their confusion. Devagiri is not just a physical manifestation, said Virini, waving a hand around. Devagiri exists in its knowledge, its philosophies and its ideologies. You have managed to keep that alive by saving our intellectuals. An embarrassed Parvateshwar didn't know how to react. How could he openly acknowledge having broken the law to save the scientists who worked at the Somras factory? Your Highness, I didn't... Virani raised her hand. Your conduct has been exemplary all your life, Lord Parvateshwar. Don't spoil it by lying on your last day. Parvateshwar smiled. 
The people you saved are not merely the repositories of the knowledge of Somras, but also the accumulated knowledge of our great land. They are the custodians of our philosophies, of our ideologies. They will keep our legacy alive. For that, Devagiri and Meluha will forever be grateful to you. Thank you, Your Highness, said Anandamai, accepting the gratitude on behalf of her discomforted husband. It's bad enough that the both of you are dying for my husband's sins, said Virini. It would have been really terrible had Maharishi Bhrigu and our intellectuals suffered for it as well. I think what's really unfair is your suffering for your husband's sins, Your Highness, said Anandamai. Your husband may not have been a good emperor, but you have been an excellent queen. No, that's not true. If it were, I would have stood up to my husband instead of standing by him. They sat quietly together for a moment, then Virini straightened her shoulders and rose to leave. Time grows short, she said, and there are preparations we still have to make for our final journey. Thank you, both of you, and let us say our farewells for one last time. Chapter 52 The Banyan Tree Baksh sat quietly in his chamber, staring out of the window, waiting for his death. He looked towards the door, wondering where Virini had gone so early in the morning. Has she abandoned me as well? As death approached, he was honest enough, at least with himself, not to blame her if she had. Daksh took a deep breath, wiped a tear, and turned his gaze back at the window, towards the banyan tree in the distance. It was a magnificent tree, centuries old, even older than Daksh. He had known this tree for as long as he could remember. He recalled its size when he was young and the fact that he always marveled at how the tree never seemed to stop growing. Its branches spread themselves out over vast distances and when they extended too far, they dropped thin, reed-like roots into the ground. The drop roots then matured, anchoring themselves deep, drawing nourishment and growing enough in bulk to eventually resemble another trunk, thus supporting the further extension of the branch that gave them birth. After a few decades, there were so many new trunks that it was impossible to tell which the original one was. It had been a single tree when Daksh was born. It still was, but now it was so massive that it appeared like a jungle. Daksh knew all Indians looked upon the grand banyan tree with the utmost respect and devotion. It was considered holy in India, a tree that unselfishly gave its all to others building an ecosystem that sustained many birds and animals. Innumerable plants and shrubs found succour and shade under its protective cover. It remained firm and solid even in the face of the most severe storm. Indians believed that ancestral spirits, even the gods, inhabited the banyan tree. For most citizens of Devagiri, this massive tree represented the ideal of life. They worshipped it. Daksh's perspective, though, was very different. At a very young age, he had noted that no offspring of a banyan was able to flourish or even grow around its parent. The roots of the tree were too strong. They twisted and pushed away any attempt by another banyan sapling to grow roots in the vicinity. For a young sapling to survive, it would have to move very far away from its parent. I should have run away. The banyan tree is pollinated by a particular species of wasp. But the tree extracts a terrible price from the tiny insect that aids its reproduction. It kills the wasp, kills it brutally, ripping the insect to shreds. Duck's interpretation of this fact was very simple. The banyan hated its own progeny so much that it would murder the kindly wasp that tried to bring its offspring to life. To a neglected child's imagination, the banyan tree's munificence was reserved for others. It did not care for its own. In fact, it went out of its way to harm its own. So while everyone else looks upon the banyan tree with reverential eyes, Daksh viewed it with fear and hatred. He was fearful because this was not the only banyan tree in his life. He had had another, his father. He hated his father with venomous intensity, but at a deeper level, perhaps loved and admired his abilities. Just like the desperate offspring of the banyan, 
he had always tried to prove that he could be as great as his father. He had carried this burden all his life. But there had been this one time when he had unshackled himself from his father's grip, when he had been free for a few magical moments. He remembered that day so clearly. It had been a long time ago, more than a hundred years. Sati had just returned from the Maika Gurukul, headstrong, idealistic girl of sixteen. In keeping with her character, she had jumped in to save an immigrant woman from a vicious pack of wild dogs. Daksh remembered well that Parvateshwar and he had rushed in to her rescue. He also remembered that despite not being an accomplished warrior, he had, with Parvateshwar's help, courageously fought back the dogs that were out to kill his daughter. He had been seriously injured in that terrible fight. Fortunately, the medical teams had reached quickly. Parvateshwar and Sati's injuries were superficial and had been quickly dressed. Daksh knew that since he had been in the thick of the battle, his injuries were the most serious. The medical officers had decided him to take him to the Ayurele so that senior doctors could examine him. However, due to massive blood loss, he had lost consciousness on the way. When he had regained consciousness, he had found himself in the Ayurele. He remembered that he scolded Sati for risking her own life to save an insignificant immigrant woman. Later, when recuperating in his room, he had asked Virani to bring Sati to him, in order to make peace with her now. But before Sati could be brought in, Daksh's father, Brahmanayak, had stormed into the chamber, accompanied by the doctor who had treated Daksh. Brahmanayak, being one of the foremost warriors in Meluha, had mocked Daksh about how he could have got himself so badly injured while fighting mere dogs. The doctor had pulled Brahmanayak out of the room using the excuse of a private conversation, wanting to save Daksh from any further mental anguish. As soon as Brahmanayak had left the room, Virani had repeated the plea she had made many times earlier, that they should escape from Meluha and live in Panchavati with both their daughters, Kali and Sati. Daksh, trust me, said Virani. We'll be happy in Panchavati. If there was any other place where we could live with both Kali and Sati, I'd suggest it, but there isn't. Maybe Virani's right. I can escape the old man. We can be happy. Also, Sati is the only pure one in my bloodline. Virini's corrupt soul has led to Kali's birth. It's difficult to help them. But I have to protect Sati from the terrible fate of seeing her father being insulted every day. My elder daughter is the only one worthy of my love. Daksh breathed deeply. But how? You leave that to me. I'll make the arrangements. Just say yes. Your father is leaving tomorrow for Karachappa. You are not so badly injured that you can't travel. We'll be in Panchavati before he knows you're gone. Daksh stared at Virini. But trust me. Please trust me. It will be for our good. I know you love me. I know you love your daughters. Deep inside, I know you don't really care about anything else. Just trust me. Perhaps this is what we need. Daksh nodded. Virini smiled, bent close and kissed her husband. I'll make all the arrangements. Virini turned and walked out of the room. In this moment of solitude, Daksh glanced at the ceiling, feeling light and relaxed, feeling free. Everything happens for a reason. Perhaps even this battle with the dogs. We can be happy in Panchavati. We'll be away from my father. We'll be free of that monster. To hell with Maluha. To hell with the throne. I don't want any of it. I just want to be happy. I just want to be with my Sati and be able to take care of her. I will also look after Virini and Kali. Who do they have besides me? He noticed Virini's prayer beads on the chair. Next to the prayer beads was the tiger claw that Sati wore as a pendant. It must have fallen off during the battle with the dogs and Virini must have recovered it to return it to their young daughter. Daksh stared at the blood stains on the tiger claw. His daughter's blood. His eyes became moist again. I will be nothing like my father. I'll take care of Sati. I will love her like every father should love his child. I will not ridicule her in public. I will not deride her for the qualities she doesn't possess. Instead, I will cherish everything that she does have. She'll be free to live her own dreams. I will not force my dreams upon her. I will love her for who she is, not for what I'd like her to be. Daksh looked down at his own injured body and shook his head. All of this to save an immigrant woman. Sati can be so naive at times. But she is a child. I shouldn't have screamed at her. I should have explained things calmly to her. After all, who does she have to look up to besides me? 
Just then, the door opened and Sati walked in, looking grouchy, almost angry. Daksh smiled. She's only a child. Come here, my child, said Daksh. Sati stepped forward, hesitantly. Come closer, Sati, laughed Daksh. I'm your father. I'm not going to eat you up. Sati stepped closer, but her face still reflected the righteous anger she felt within. Lord Ram, be merciful. This girl still thinks that she did the right thing in risking all our lives to save an unimportant immigrant woman. Daksh reached out and held Sati's hand, speaking patiently. My child, listen to me. I care for you. I only had your best interests at heart. It was stupid of you to risk your life for that immigrant. But I admit I shouldn't have shouted at... Daksh fell silent as the door swung open suddenly and Brahmanayak strode in. Sati suddenly withdrew her hand and turned around to look at Brahmanayak, her back towards her father. Ah, oh, said Brahmanayak, as his face broke into a broad smile. He walked up to Sati and embraced her. At least one of my progeny has my blood coursing through her veins. Sati looked at Brahmanayak adoringly, pure hero worship in her eyes. Dak stared at him with impotent rage. I've heard about what you did, said Brahmanayak to Sati. You risked your own life to protect a woman whom you didn't even know. A woman who was only a lowly immigrant. Sati smiled in embarrassment. It was nothing, your highness. Brahmanayak laughed softly and patted Sati's cheek. I am not your highness for you, Sati. I am your grandfather. Sati nodded, smiling. I am proud of you, my child, said Brahmanayak. I am honored to call you a Maluhan. Honored to call you my granddaughter. Sati's smile broadened as her heart felt light. She had done the right thing after all. She embraced her grandfather once again. Brahmanayak bent down and kissed his adolescent granddaughter on her forehead. He then turned to Daksh, the smile immediately disappearing from his face. With barely concealed contempt, he told his son, I'm leaving for Karachappa tomorrow morning and will be gone for many weeks. Perhaps you will need that much time to recover from your so-called injuries. We'll talk about your future when I return. A seething Daksh refused to answer Brahmanayak, turning his face away. Brahmanayak shook his head and rolled his eyes. He then patted Sati on her head. I'll see you when I return, my child. Yes, grandfather. Brahmanayak opened the door and was gone. Daksh glared at the closed door. Thank God I'm going to be rid of you, you beast. Insulting me in front of my favorite daughter? How dare you! Take the throne away, take all the riches away, take the world away if you wish. But don't you dare take my good daughter away from me, she's mine! He looked at Sati's back. She was still staring at the door, her body shaking. Is she crying? Daksh thought perhaps Sati was angry with Brahmanayak for insulting her father. She was his daughter after all. Daksh smiled. It's all right, my child. I'm not angry. Your grandfather doesn't matter anymore because... Father! interrupted Sati as she turned around, tears streaming down her cheeks. Why can't you be more like grandfather? Duck stared at his daughter, dumbstruck. Why can't you be more like grandfather? whispered Sati again. Duck was in shock. Sati suddenly turned around and ran out of the room. Duck kept staring at the door as it slammed shut behind Sati. Fierce tears were pouring from his eyes. More like grandfather? More like that monster? I'm better than him. The gods know that. They know I will make a far better king. I will show you. You will love me. I am your creator. You will love me, not him. Not that monster. The sound of the door being opened broke his train of thought, bringing Daksh back to the present from that ancient memory. He saw Virani walk into the bedchamber. She glanced at Daksh for an instant, then shook her head, walked up to her private desk and rummaged through it to find what she was looking for, her prayer beads. She brought them up to touch her forehead reverentially, then both her eyes and then her lips. She held the beads tightly and turned to take one last look at her husband. The disgust she felt couldn't be expressed in words. She had no intention of desecrating her ears by listening to his voice. She hadn't spoken to him since Sati's death. Daksha's eyes followed Virini's passage. He couldn't muster the courage to speak even if it was only to apologize for all he'd done. She walked into the private prayer room next to her bedchamber and shut the door.
She bowed low before the idol of Lord Ram, which was, as usual, surrounded by the idols of his favorite people, his wife, Lady Sita, his brother, Lord Lakshman, and his loyal devotee, Lord Hanuman, the Vayuputra. Virani sat down cross-legged. She held the beads high in front of her eyes and began chanting as she waited for her death. Shri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram Shri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram The faint echo of this chanting reached Daksh's ears. He stared at the closed door of the attached chamber, his angry wife closeted within. I should have listened to her. She was right all along. Shri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram Shri Ram Jai Ram Jai Jai Ram He continued to hear the soft chanting of his wife in the prayer room. Those divinely serene words should have brought him peace. But there was no chance of that. He would die a frustrated and angry man. Daksh clenched his jaw and looked out of the window. He stared at the banyan tree in the distance, tears streaming down his face. Damn you! The banyan shook slightly and its leaves ruffled dramatically with the strong wind. It appeared as if the giant tree was laughing at him. Damn you! Chapter 53 The Destroyer of Evil The wind is too strong, murmured a worried Tara, looking at the windsock that had been set up close to the Pashupatiastra missile tower. Tara and Shiva were mounted on horses, stationed far from the Pashupatiastra launch tower. It was almost the end of the second Prahar, and the sun was just a few moments away from being directly overhead. Shiva's entire army and the refugees from Devagiri had been cordoned off seven kilometers from the launch tower, safely outside the Pashupati Astra's blast radius. Shiva glanced at Tara and then up at the sky, trying to judge the wind from the movement of dust particles. Not a problem. Saying this, Shiva's attention returned to stringing his bow. Parshuram had been working on making this composite bow for months. Its basic structure was made of wood, reinforced with horn on the inside and sinew on the outside. It was also curved much sharper than normal, with its edges turning away from the archer. Due to the mix of different elements and the curve at the edges, the bow had exceptional draw strength for its small size. It was ideal for an archer to shoot arrows from while riding a horse or a chariot. Parshuram had named the bow Pinaka after the fabled great ancient longbow of Lord Rudra. Though Parshuram didn't know this while designing the bow, the Pinaka would prove ideal for Shiva's purpose, as firing the Pashupatiastra was not easy. The Pashupatiastra was a pure nuclear fusion weapon, unlike the Brahmastra and the Vishnavestra, which were nuclear fission weapons. In a pure nuclear fusion weapon, two Paramanus, the smallest stable division of matter, are fused together to release tremendous destructive energy. In a nuclear fission weapon, anus, atomic particles, are broken down to release paramanus. And this is also accompanied by a demonic release of devastating energy. Nuclear fission weapons leave behind a trail of uncontrollable destruction, with radioactive waste spreading far and wide. A nuclear fusion weapon, on the other hand, is much more controlled, destroying only the targeted area with minimal radioactive spread. So the Pashupati Astra would be the obvious weapon of choice for those who intended to destroy a specific target with the precision of a surgeon. The problem, though, was its launch. These Devi Astras were usually mounted on launching towers, packed with a mixture of sulphur, charcoal, saltpetre, and a few other materials which generated the explosive energy that propelled the Astra towards the target. Once the Astra was close to its target, another set of explosions would trigger the weapon. The launch material within the tower had to be triggered from a safe distance, or else the people firing the Astra would be incinerated in the initial launch explosion. Keeping this in mind, archers were called upon to shoot flaming arrows from a distance to trigger the launch explosion. These archers usually use long bows with a range of more than 800 meters. To hit a target accurately from this distance required archers of great skill. 
The Brahmastra and Vaishnavastra did not need a precise landing as their destruction spread far and wide. Since accuracy was not of the essence, the launch towers that cradled these weapons had huge firing targets. The Pashupati Astra, or Weapon of the Lord of Animals, was a precise missile. It had to land at the exact spot. What complicated the issue even more at this particular time was that the attempt was to fire three missiles concurrently. The trajectory of three missiles had been planned such that they would detonate over the Svarna, Rajat and Tamra platforms of Devagiri simultaneously, guaranteeing the complete and instantaneous destruction of the entire city. The risk with trying to destroy three platforms at the same time was that the inner circle of devastation would expand since the weapons would have to be triggered from a great height. Tara had planned the angles of descent of each missile such that together their simultaneous explosions would ensure the annihilation of Devagiri, while their excess energies would be trapped within each other, thus preventing any fallout destruction outside the inner circle. A precise descent needed a perfect takeoff. Therefore, the Pashupati Astra missiles had been set at precise angles within the tower. The target area on the tower, where the fiery arrow would be shot, was small. Shiva had to fire an arrow to hit the target placed more than 800 meters away. Moreover, he had to do this while seated on a horse so that he could escape immediately after firing the arrow. Remember, great Nilkant, said Tara. The moment your arrow hits the target, you have to ride away. You will have less than five minutes before the Pashupatiastra explodes over Devagiri. You have to cover at least three kilometers within that time. Only then will you be out of the range of the minuscule number of neutrons from the Pashupati Astra, which may escape that far. Shiva nodded distractedly, still testing his bow's draw strength. Nilkant, it is crucial for you to ride as fast as you can. The blast can be fatal. Shiva didn't respond. He pulled out the arrows from the quiver. He smelt them and then rubbed the tip of one of the arrows against the rough leather of the pommel. The tip immediately caught fire. Perfect. Shiva threw the burning arrow away and returned the rest to the quiver. Did you hear me? You need to move away immediately. Shiva wiped his hand on his dhoti and turned to Thara. Right beyond the safety line now. Shiva, you shoot the arrow and move. Shiva looked at Thara, his gaze glassy. Thara could see the blackish red blotch on his brow throbbing frantically. You will ride away immediately emphasized Tara. Promise me. Shiva nodded. Promise me. I have already promised you. Now go. Tara stared at Shiva. Nilkant. Go, Tara. The sun is about to reach overhead. I need to fire the missiles. Tara pulled her horse's reins and spun it around. And Tara. Tara pulled up a horse and looked back over her shoulder. Thank you, said Shiva. Tara was still, watching the face of the Nilkant with clouded eyes. Ride back quickly beyond the safety line. Remember, all those who love you are waiting for you. Shiva held his breath. Yes, my love is waiting for me. Tara kicked her horse into action and rode away. Shiva pressed his forehead right above the blackish red mark. The pressure seemed to ease the horrendous burning sensation. The pain had been immense and continuous for the last few days, ever since he had seen Sati's body. Shiva shook his head and focused his attention on the tower. He could see the target in the distance. It had been marked a bright red. He took a deep breath and looked towards the ground. Holy Lake, give me strength. Shiva breathed once again and looked up. Lord Ram, be merciful. Arrayed in front of him, was an army of clones blocking his view of the Pashupati Astra launch tower. Clones of the giant hairy monster who had tormented him in his nightmares since his childhood. Shiva looked carefully and noticed that none of the monsters had faces. There was a smooth white slate where their face should have been. All of them had their swords drawn, blood dripping from every single blade. He could clearly hear their ghastly roar. For a moment, Shiva imagined he was a terrified little boy once again. Shiva looked up at the sky and shook his head, as if to clear it. Help me! 
Shiva heard his uncle Monobhu's voice call out, Forgive them! Forget them! Your only true enemy is evil! Shiva brought his eyes down and locked his gaze on the launch tower. The monsters had disappeared. He stared directly at the red spot, right at the center of the tower. Shiva pulled his horse's reins and turned it right, singing softly in its ear to calm it down. The horse stayed still, offering Shiva the stable base he needed to hit a target. He turned his head to his left, creating the natural angle for a right-handed archer to get a straight shot. He pulled his bow forward and tested the string once again. He liked the twang of the bowstring when it was pulled and released rapidly. It was as taut as it could be. He bent forward and pulled an arrow from the quiver. He held it to his side and looked up, judging the wind. The art of shooting arrows from this huge distance was all about patience and judgment. It was about waiting for the right wind conditions, the ability to judge the parabolic movement of the arrow, determining the ideal angle of release, controlling the speed of the arrow at release, deciding the extent to which the string should be pulled. Shiva kept his eyes fixed on the windsock, keeping his breathing steady, trying to ignore the burning sensation between his eyes. The wind is changing direction. Pointing the bow towards the ground, Shiva knocked an arrow. The shaft firmly gripped between his hooked index and middle finger. The wind is holding. He ignited the tip by rubbing it against the leather pommel. Taut muscles raised the bow and drew the string in one fluid motion, even as his warrior mind instinctively calculated the correct angle of flight. Master archer that he was, he kept his dominant eye focused on the target. His left hand held the bow rock steady, ignoring the searing heat from the tip of the arrow. The wind is perfect. He released the arrow without hesitation. He saw the arrow move in a parabola as if in slow motion. His eyes followed its path till it hit the red target, depressing it with its force. The fire immediately spread to the waiting receptacle behind the target. The Pashupati Astra's initial launch had been triggered. Right away! screamed Tara from the distance. Papa, turn your horse around! shouted Karthik. But Shiva could not hear either of them. They were too far away. Shiva kept staring at the rapidly spreading fire behind the target, the pain within his brow ratcheting up once again. He felt as if the insides of his forehead were on fire as well, just like the launch tower. He pulled the reins of his horse and turned it around. He could see his troops far away. Beyond them, he could see his ship anchored on the Saraswati. Sati's body was stored in there. She's waiting for me. Shiva kicked his horse. The animal didn't need much coaxing as it quickly broke into a gallop. The fire within the launch tower finally triggered the initial explosion. The three Pashupati Astras shot out of their pods, the two that were directed at the Tamra and Swarna platforms taking off just a few milliseconds after the third. That was because the target of the third missile, the Rajat platform, was further away. Shiva kept kicking his horse as it galloped faster and faster. He was just a few seconds away from the safety line. The missiles flew in a great arc, leaving a trail of fire behind them. Seconds later, they began their simultaneous descent into the city, like giant harbingers of absolute destruction. Shiva! Shiva could have sworn he heard the voice that he loved beyond all reason. But it couldn't have been for real. He kept riding on. The Pashupati Astras were descending rapidly. Shiva! Shiva! Shiva looked back. A bloodied and mutilated Sati was running after him. Her left hand was spewing blood in bursts, in tune with each beat of her pounding heart. Two massive wounds on her abdomen gaped open as blood streamed out from them in a torrent. Her left eye was gouged out. Her burn scar seemed like it was on fire once again. She was struggling desperately, but she kept running towards Shiva. Shiva, help me. Don't leave me. An army of soldiers chased Sati, holding bloodied swords aloft. Each warrior was the exact likeness of Daksh. The area between Shiva's brows began throbbing even more desperately. The fire within was struggling to burst through. Sade! screamed Shiva as he pulled the reins of his horse. 
he was not going to lose her again. The horse barked at Shiva's anxious command and refused to slow down. Sati! Shiva desperately yanked at the reins, but the horse had a mind of its own. He was not going to either slow down or turn. The beast could sense the stench of death behind it. Shiva pulled both his feet out of the stirrups and jumped to the ground, the speed of his fall making him lurch dangerously. He rolled quickly and was up on his feet in a flash. Sati! The horse kept galloping ahead towards a safety line. As Shiva turned around, drew his sword and ran to protect the mirage of his wife. Baba! shouted Ganesh. Come back! The blackish red mark at the center of Shiva's forehead burst open and blood spewed out. He ran desperately towards his wife, roaring at the army of Dakshas who chased her. Leave her alone, you bastards! Fight me! The three Pashupati Astra missiles simultaneously exploded as planned some 50 meters above the three platforms. A blinding burst of light erupted. Shiva's army and the Devagiri refugees shielded their eyes, only to be stunned by what they saw of their own bodies. Glowing and translucent, blood, muscle and even bone were visible. They even saw a demonic flash within their bodies, an echo of the devastating blasts over Devagiri. Sheer terror entered their hearts. Almost immediately thereafter, three bursts of satanic fire descended from the heights where the three Pashupati Astras had exploded. They tore into Devagiri fiendishly, instantaneously incinerating all three platforms. The great city of the gods, built and nurtured over centuries, was reduced to nothingness in a fraction of a second. Lord Ram, be merciful, whispered Ayurvati in absolute horror as she saw the massive explosion from aboard the ship that was carrying Sati. As the fire ripped through Devagiri, giant pillars of smoke shot up from the site of the explosions. As Tara had predicted, the energy blasts of the three missiles seemed to attract each other. All the three pillars of smoke crashed into each other with diabolical rage as thunder and lightning cracked through the destructive field. The unified pillar of smoke now shot higher, higher than anything that any living creature watching the explosion had ever seen. The smoke column rose like a giant and steeply giant pyramid, and then it exploded into a massive cloud about one kilometer high in the air. And just as instantaneously, the pyramid of smoke collapsed into itself, closeted permanently within the ruins of Devagiri. Shiva unmindful of the terrible devastation taking place in front of him, kept running forward, his sword drawn, his brow spouting blood at an alarming rate. As soon as the pyramid of smoke collapsed, another silent blast occurred. As this blast of neutrons raced out, the sound of the initial explosion reached Shiva's army, cowering behind the safety line. Baba! screamed Ganesh as he jumped from the platform he was on and raced towards his horse. The neutron blast was invisible. Shiva couldn't see it, but he could feel a demonic surge rolling towards him. He had to save his wife. He kept running forward, screaming desperately. Sade! His body was lifted high by the neutron blast wave. For a moment, he felt weightless, and then the wave propelled him back brutally. His brow and throat were on fire, while blood spewed out from his mouth. He landed hard on the ground, flat on his back, his head jerking as he felt a sharp sensation on the crown of his head. And yet, he felt no pain. He just kept screaming. Sade! Sade! Suddenly, he saw Sati bending over him. There was no blood on her, no wounds, no scars. She looked just like she had on the day he'd met her, all those years ago at the Brahma temple. She bent forward and ran her hand along Shiva's face, a smiling visage suffused with love and joy, a smile that always set the world right for him. She touched the crown of Shiva's head. The sharp sensation receded and was replaced by a calm that was difficult to describe. He felt like he had been set free. Strangely, his blue throat was not cold anymore. Equally strange was the realization that his brow had stopped burning from within. Shiva opened his mouth 
but no sound emerged, so he thought of what he wanted to say. Take me with you, Sati. There's nothing left for me to do. I'm done. Sati bent forward and kissed Shiva lightly on his lips. She smiled and whispered, No, you're not done yet. Not yet. Shiva kept staring at his wife. I can't live without you. You must, said Sati's shimmering image. Shiva couldn't keep his eyes open anymore. Sati's beautiful and calm face began to blur. He collapsed into a peaceful, dreamlike state. As he was descending the depths of consciousness, though, he thought he heard a voice, almost like a command. No more killing from now on. Spread life. Spread life. Chapter 54 By the Holy Lake Thirty years later, Mansarovar Lake at the foot of Mount Kailash, Tibet. Shiva squatted on the rock that extended over the Mansarovar. Behind him was the Kailash mountain, each of its four sides perfectly aligned with the four cardinal directions. It stood sentinel over the great Mahadev, the one who had saved India from evil. The long years in the tough Tibetan terrain had taken its toll on his body. His matted hair had greyed considerably, though it was still long and wiry enough to be tied in a traditional bun with beads. His body, honed with regular exercise and yoga, was still taut and muscular, but the skin had wrinkled and lost its tone. His nilkant, the blue throat, had not lost color at all over the years, but it didn't feel cold anymore. Not since the day he had been hit by the neutron blast from the Pashupati Astra that had destroyed Devagiri. The area between his brows didn't burn or throb either, perhaps also due to the neutron blast. But it had taken on a darker hue, almost black, that contrasted sharply with his fair skin. It wasn't an indistinct, indeterminate mark either. It looked like the tattoo of an eye, an eye with the lids shut. Kali had named it Shiva's third eye, which stood vertical on his forehead between his natural eyes. Shiva looked across the lake at the setting sun. In the distance, he spotted a pair of swans gliding over the shimmering waters. It appeared to Shiva as if the birds beheld the sight together. The setting sun cannot be enjoyed unless shared with the one you love. He breathed deeply and picked up a pebble. When he was young, he could throw one such that it skipped off the surface of the lake. His record had been 17 bounces. He flung the pebble, but he failed. It sank immediately into the lake with a plop. I miss you. Not a day passed in his life without his mind dwelling on his wife. He wiped a tear from his eye before turning back to look at the bonfires outside his village compound. A large crowd had gathered around the fires, eating, drinking and making merry. Some members of his Guna tribe had followed him when he had returned to Kailash Mountain many years ago. In addition, nearly 10,000 people from across India had decided to leave their homes and migrate to the homeland of their Mahadev. Chief amongst them were Nandi, Brahaspati, Tara, Parshuram and Ayurvati. The deposed Ayodhya ruler Dilipa, who was still alive thanks to Ayurvati's medicines, former Maika Lothal governor Chenar Dhwaj, and former Naga Prime Minister Karkotak had also migrated to the shores of the Mansarovar. Shiva's followers had established new villages in close proximity to his. Seeing the massive contingent Shiva now commanded, even the Pakratis, the local Tibetans who had maintained a long-standing enmity with the Gunas, had made peace with the Nilkant. The fires reminded Shiva of one of the worst days of his life, the day he had destroyed Devagiri. Sati had been cremated on the same day, later on in the evening. But Shiva did not have memories of that event. He had been unconscious, having been battered by the neutron blast of the Pashupati Astra. He had been fighting for his life under Ayurvati's care. What he knew about Sati's cremation was from what Kali, Ganesh and Karthik had told him. He had been told that a calm breeze had blown across the land, picking up the ashes from the ruins of Devagiri and scattering them around slowly. 
It was almost as if the ashes were trying to reach the waters of the Saraswati to give some closure to the souls of the departed. Hazy specks had colored the entire landscape around the Saraswati to a pale shade of grey. The sandalwood pyre, lit by both Ganesh and Karthik, had taken some time to light, but once it did, it had raged like an inferno. It seemed as if even Lord Agni, the god of fire, needed some coaxing to consume the body of the former princess of Maluha. But once the task had begun, it must have been so painful for Lord Agni that he wanted to finish it as soon as possible. Shiva had regained consciousness three days later to find an anxiety-filled gathering of Kali, Ganesh and Karthik sitting next to him. After he had regained his strength, a tearful Ganesh had handed him an urn containing Sati's ashes. A few drops of water splashed on Shiva, perhaps from a fish swimming vigorously below. They pulled him back from the thirty-year-old memory to the present. Shiva tarried on for some more time, allowing his gaze to dwell on the lake waters. As always, he could have sworn that he saw Sati's ashes swirling in it. Of course, it was a mirage. Her ashes had been immersed in the holy Saraswati, a day after Shiva had regained consciousness. He remembered struggling weakly onto the boat thirty years ago, helped by Ganesh and Karthik. The Nilkant had been rowed to the middle of the river, where Kali and he had jointly scattered some of Sati's ashes into the water. Shiva had refused to immerse all of it, regardless of what tradition held. He needed to keep some portion of Sati for himself. Indians believe that the body is a temporary gift from Mother Earth. She lends it to a living being, so that one's soul has an instrument with which to carry out its karma. Once the soul's karma is done, the body must be returned in pure form, so that the mother may use it for another purpose. The ashes represent a human body that has been purified by the greatest purifier of them all, Lord Agni, the God of Fire. By immersing the ashes into holy waters, the body is offered back with respect to Mother Earth. He recalled the Brahmins in an adjacent boat chanting Sanskrit hymns throughout the ceremony. One specific chant from the Isha Vasya Upanishad had caught Shiva's attention and had been committed to memory. Vayur Anilam Amritam Athidam Bhasmantam Shariram Let this temporary body be burned to ashes, but the breath of life belongs elsewhere. May it find its way back to the immortal breath. My lord! shouted Nandi loudly. Shiva turned to see Nandi standing at a distance, two hooks where his arms used to be. My lord, everyone is waiting, said Nandi, keeping his voice loud enough to reach his ears. Shiva held his hand up, signaling for Nandi to wait. He needed some more time with his memories. They had sent Nandi to call him, as they knew he had become Shiva's favorite. He had fought bravely alongside Sati thirty years ago, losing both his hands in his doomed attempt to save Shiva's wife. I glanced beyond Nandi and saw Maharishi Bhrigu sitting away from the others, talking to Ganesh and Karthik. The sage seemed to be explaining something from a palm leaf book. Both his sons listened attentively. Chandraketu, the king of Branga, and Matali, the king of Vaishali, were also listening intently to Maharishi Bhrigu. He looked back towards the lake and took another deep breath. Karthik saved my honor. Karthik had chosen the moment wisely to tell Shiva how he had saved the Devagiri scientists who had the knowledge of the Somras. The Nilkant had received the news with equanimity. Shiva was also happy that Bhrigu had been saved, as the great Maharishi had had no role to play in Sati's death. Furthermore, the India of the future would be the proud inheritor of the legacy of his immense knowledge. Shiva had decreed that the Somra scientists be given lands in central Tibet, far beyond the expanse of Indian empires, in fact, beyond the reach of any empire. The Somra scientists had established their home with the help of Suryavanshi and Chandravanshi troops. These survivors named their new dwelling place after their original city, Devagiri, the abode of the gods. This new city, established in Tibet, was given a name with the same meaning, albeit in the local Tibetan language, Lhasa. The knowledge of the Somras, the elixir of immortality, was to be the sacred secret of the citizens of Lhasa, till such a time as India needed that knowledge again. 
Shiva had also decreed that his two sons would set up the tribe that would protect Lhasa. The tribe that Ganesh and Karthik established was drawn from an eclectic mix of Chandravanshis, Suryavanshis and Nagas. They had also inducted most of the Gunas, Shiva's tribesmen and many other local Tibetan tribes. Virbhadra, Shiva's friend and loyal follower, was appointed chief of this tribe. He was given the title of Lama, the Tibetan word for guru or master. The people of Lhasa and the followers of the Lama would protect India's ancient knowledge. Their sworn duty was to rise up and save India whenever it faced the onslaught of evil again. The Somras waste dump site that had been set up in Tibet on the Sangpo River was dug out and its contents were removed. This waste was taken further north into an inhospitable, remote and mostly uninhabited part of the Tibetan plateau. It was buried there, deep into the ground, enclosed within sludgy cases made of wet clay and bilva leaves, which were further encased within boxes of thick lead. These boxes had been buried deep under vast quantities of earth, snow and permafrost. It was hoped that this poison would remain undisturbed forever. Fortunately, there would be no new toxic waste to be taken care of since the manufacturing of Somras had stopped with the destruction of Devagiri. Shiva had also realized that just removing the knowledge of the Somras was not enough to stop the drink of the gods. If it had to be wiped out from India, its very foundation needed uprooting. In that sense, the idea that Parshuram had had was sound. Without the Saraswati, the Somras couldn't be manufactured. Furthermore, the river's present course was picking up radioactive waste at Devagiri and poisoning the lands further downstream. The Saraswati emerged from the confluence of the Sutlej and the Yamuna. If these two tributaries were separated, the Saraswati water itself would not be available for the manufacture of the Somras or for picking up radioactive waste. Shiva had decided that, in the interest of India, the Sutlej and the Yamuna would part company forever. It was decreed that the Yamuna's course would be changed once again, back to the temporary course that it had taken more than a century before the destruction of Devagiri, when it had merged into the Ganga. But this was easier said than done. If the course of a river as mighty as the Yamuna was changed suddenly, the resultant flooding would cause havoc. The change had to be controlled. Bhagirath, with the help of Meluhan engineers, had come up with a brilliant plan. The sides of the Yamuna were dug up and giant sluice gates were built along them. These gates, serving as locks, would be opened slowly to guide the Yamuna onto its new course in a deliberate and controlled manner. Over many months, Bhagirath had named these sluice gates the locks of Shiva. The Yamuna was thus slowly diverted onto its new course to unite with the Ganga at Prayag. The locks of Shiva had thereby allowed the Ganga to take its new form gradually without the chaos of an uncontrolled flood. The addition of the massive Yamuna, along with the already worthy presence of the enormous Brahmaputra, had enhanced the mighty Ganga into the biggest river system in India. It also came to be believed that the Yamuna carried the soul of the Saraswati into the Ganga, thus transforming it into the holiest river in India. In a sense, the devotion associated with the hallowed river Saraswati had been transferred onto the Ganga. Furthermore, the burst of fresh clean water from the Yamuna had cleansed the poisonous wastes in Branga, freeing the great rivers in that land of the Somras poison. The Brangas living at Ganga Sagar, the place where the resurgent Ganga met the sea, began to believe in a legend over time that the Ganga had purified their land. It was a myth that was not far from the truth. Meluha, without the centralizing presence of Devagiri, had devolved into its different provinces which became independent kingdoms. Without the incompetent rule of Daksh and with the fresh breath of freedom, there had been a burst of creativity and an efflorescence of varied but equally beautiful cultures. Shiva heard a loud laugh, which he knew could belong only to Bhagirath. He turned and looked at him, standing near a bonfire, talking animatedly to Gopal and Kali. Dilipa had been deposed by his army before the destruction of Devagiri. He was succeeded by Bhagirath, who had ruled Ayodhya wisely, heralding a new era of peace and prosperity. Judging by the expression on Dilipa's face as he stood close to Bhagirath, the former emperor seemed to have made peace with his fate. 
Shiva turned his attention to the tall, lanky figure speaking with Bhagirath and Kali. The great Vasudev perhaps sensed that somebody was looking at him. He turned to look at Shiva, smiled, folded his hands into a namaste and bowed low. Shiva returned Gopal's greeting with a formal namaste. Gopal had made his peace with Shiva. The outcome at Devagiri was certainly not what the Vasudev chief had desired, but what had given him peace was the realization that evil had been removed and the knowledge of the Sombra saved. India had rejuvenated itself as the malevolent effects of evil were removed. The Nilkant had succeeded in his mission, and in that lay the success of the Vasudevs. Gopal had also established formal relations with Virbhadra and the citizens of Lhasa, the new tribe of the Mahadev. The Vasudevs and the Lhasans would maintain their watch over India in tandem, ensuring that this divine land continue to prosper and grow with balance. Seeing his friend Gopal also reminded Shiva of the Vayuputras. They had never forgiven Shiva for having used the Pashupati Astra. It had been a source of particular embarrassment for the Mitra, since he had personally backed the announcement of Shiva as an Ilkant against some virulent opposition. The punishment for the unauthorized use of a Devi Astra was a 14-year exile. As a form of atonement for breaking his word to them, and for having been the cause of the death of his mother-in-law Virini and his friends Parvateshwar and Anandamai, Shiva had punished himself with exile from India, not just for 14 years, but for the duration of his remaining life. Baba, Shiva hadn't noticed Ganesh, Karthik and Kali sneak up on him. Yes, Ganesh. Baba, it's the feast of the night of the Mahadev, said Ganesh, and the Mahadev needs to be a part of the celebration instead of brooding next to the lake. Shiva nodded slowly. His neck had begun to hurt a bit, the perils of old age. Help me up, said Shiva, as he made an effort to rise. Karthik and Ganesh immediately leaned forward, helping their father to his feet. Ganesh, you get fatter every time I see you. Ganesh laughed heartily. He had suffered intensely and taken a long time to recover from his mother's death, but had ultimately reconciled himself with that loss, choosing to learn from her life instead. He had taken it upon himself to spread the word of Shiva and Sati throughout India. That sense of purpose in his life had helped him return to his calm state of being. In fact, he was even jovial at times. Thanks to your wisdom, peace prevails all over India, Baba, said Ganesh. There are no more wars, no conflicts. So I do very little physical activity and eat a lot. Ultimately, the way I see it, it's your fault that I'm getting fatter. Kali and Karthik laughed loudly. Shiva nodded faintly, his eyes not losing their seriousness. You should smile sometimes, Baba, said Karthik. It will make us happy. Shiva stared at Karthik. It had been a long time since Sati's death, and even young Karthik was now beginning to acquire a smattering of white hair. Shiva knew that Karthik had travelled a very long distance to come to Kailash. After most of Shiva's tasks had been completed, and he had decided to return to Kailash Mansarovar, Karthik had migrated to the south of the Narmada, going deep into the ancient heartland of India, the land of Lord Manu. History had recorded that Lord Manu was a prince of the Pandya dynasty. This dynasty had ruled the prehistoric land of Sangam Tamil. That nation and its fine Sangam culture had been destroyed as sea levels had risen with the end of the last ice age. Karthik had discovered that many people continued to live in this ancient Indian fatherland, breaking Lord Manu's law that banned people from travelling south of the Narmada. Karthik had established a new Sangam culture on the banks of the southernmost major river of India, the Kaveri. I will smile when the three of you will reveal your secret, said Shiva. What secret? asked Karthik. You know what I'm talking about. Shiva did discover in due course that on the night before the destruction of Devagiri, Kali, Parshuram and Virbhadra had kidnapped Vidyanmali. Under pain of vicious torture, Vidyanmali had revealed the names of Sati's assassins. He had then been tormented with a brutal and slow death. A few years after the destruction of Devagiri, Kali, Ganesh, Karthik, Parshuram and Virbhadra had slipped out of India. Nobody really knew where they had disappeared. They had consistently refused to tell Shiva perhaps 
because he had prohibited any further reprisals for Sati's death. But Shiva had his suspicions. Those suspicions were not unfounded because around the same time, rumors had arisen in Egypt about the near complete destruction of the secretive tribe of Aten. It was said that the death of each of the tribe's leaders had been long, slow and painful, their blood-curdling screams echoing through the hearts of their followers. What Kali and the rest didn't know was that a few months earlier, Swat had exiled himself. He had gone south to the source of the Nile River and had spent the rest of his years bemoaning the fact that he had been unable to complete his holy duty of executing the final kill. But the magnificence of Sati had been branded upon his soul. He didn't know her name, so he worshipped her as a nameless goddess till his last days. His descendants continued the tradition. The few remaining survivors of the tribe of Aten would have to wait for centuries before a revolutionary pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, reformed and revived the cult. That pharaoh would be remembered as the great Akhenaten, the living spirit of Aten. But that is another story. Baba, we had gone to... Kali placed her hands on Karthik's lips. There's nothing to reveal, Shiva, except that the food is extremely delicious. You need to eat, so follow me. Shiva shook his head. You still haven't lost your regal heirs. Kali didn't have a kingdom anymore. Within a few years of her return from Egypt, she had renounced her throne and supported the election of Suparna as the new queen of the Nagas. Leaving her kingdom in capable hands, Kali, accompanied by Shiva, Ganesh and Karthik, had toured the land of India. The family of the Nilkant had established 51 Shakti temples across the length and breadth of the country. Kali had also convinced Shiva to part with the portion of Sati's ashes that he had kept for himself. She had told him that Sati belonged to the whole of India and not just to Shiva. Therefore, small portions of Sati's ashes were consecrated at each of these 51 temples so that Indians would forever remember their great goddess, Lady Sati. Kali had finally settled down in northeastern Branga, close to the Kamakya temple, and devoted her life to prayer. Her spiritual presence had made the Kamakya temple one of the foremost Shakti temples in India. Many Suryavanshis, Chandravanshis and Nagas, who were inspired by the Naga queen, had followed her to her new abode. Over time, they had set up their own individual kingdoms. The Suryavanshis had named their kingdom Tripura, the land of the three cities, after the three platforms of their destroyed capital. The Chandravanshis, worshippers of the seventh Vishnu, Lord Ram, had called their land Manipur, the land of the jewel. For the seventh Vishnu was, no doubt, a crown jewel of India. Many of Kali's Naga followers established their own empire further to the east. All of these different peoples followed the path of Kali, proud warriors forged from the womb of Mother India. Therefore, if treated with respect, these people would be your greatest strength. If you disrespected them, then no power on earth would be able to save you. I may not have a kingdom anymore, Shiva, said Kali, her eyes dancing with mirth, but I will always be a queen. Ganesh and Karthik smiled broadly. Shiva just stared at Kali's face, a splitting image of Sati's. It reminded him of how happy his life had once been. Come, let's go eat, said Shiva. As a family of the Mahadev walked back towards the bonfires, Ganesh and Karthik started speaking to Shiva about the brilliant composition that Brigu had just shown them. It would be known over the millennia as the greatest classic on the ancient science of astrology, the Brigu Samhita. Over the subsequent years, Shiva became increasingly ascetic. He began spending many days, even months, in isolation within the claustrophobic confines of mountain caves, performing severe penance. The only one allowed to meet him at such times was Nandi. Legends emerged that the only way to reach Shiva's ears was through Nandi. Shiva also devoted long hours to the study of yoga. The knowledge that he developed helped create a powerful tool for finding physical, mental and spiritual peace through unity with the divine. Shiva also added many fresh thoughts and philosophies to the immense body of ancient Indian knowledge and wisdom. 
Many of his ideas were captured in the holy scriptures of the Vedas, Upanishads and the Puranas, benefiting humanity for millennia. Notwithstanding the prodigious productivity of Shiva's mind, his heart never really found happiness ever again. Legend has it that despite repeated attempts by his family, nobody ever saw Shiva smile again after that terrible day in Devagiri. Nobody saw his ethereal dances or heard his soulful singing and music again. Shiva had given up everything that offered even a remote possibility of bringing him happiness. But legends also hold that Shiva did smile once, just once, only a moment before he was to leave his mortal body to merge once again with the god whom he had emerged from. He smiled for he knew that the love of his life, his sati, was just one last breath away. Karthik's wisdom and courage ensured that the Sangam culture in South India continued to flourish and its power spread far and wide. While Karthik continued to be adored in Northern India, especially in Kashi where he was born, his influence in Southern India was beyond compare. He is remembered to this day as a warrior god, the one who can solve any problem and defeat any enemy. Meanwhile, the adoration for Karthik's elder brother, the wise and kind-hearted Ganesh, grew to astronomical heights in India. People revered him as a living god. A belief spread throughout the country that he should be the first god to be worshipped in all ceremonies, before all others. It was held that worshipping Ganesh would remove all obstacles from one's path. Thus, he came to be known as the god of auspicious beginnings. His profound intellect also led him to gradually become the god of writers. Thus, his name acquired immense significance for authors, poets and other troubled souls. The Somras had had an especially strong effect on Ganesh, so he lived for centuries beyond all his contemporaries. And Ganesh did not mind this. He loved interacting with people from across India, helping them, guiding them. But there did come a time when, enfeebled by old age, Ganesh began to think that perhaps he had lived in this mortal body for too long. For he would have to suffer the mortification of seeing the ancient Vedic Indians turn on each other in catastrophic civil war. A minor dispute within a dysfunctional royal family escalated into a mighty conflict which sucked in all the great powers of the day. The calamitous bloodletting in that war destroyed not just all the powerful empires of the time, but also the way of life of the ancient Vedic Indians. What was left behind was utter devastation. From these ruins, as is its wont, civilization did rise again. But this new culture had lost too much. They knew only snippets of the greatness of their ancestors. The descendants were, in many ways, unworthy. These descendants beheld gods in what were great men of the past, for they believed that such great men couldn't possibly have existed in reality. These descendants saw magic in what was brilliant science, for their limited intellect could not understand that great knowledge. These descendants retained only rituals of what were deep philosophies, for it took courage and confidence to ask questions. These descendants divined myths in what was really history, for true memories were forgotten in chaos, as vast arrays of Devi Astras used in the Great War ravaged the land. That war destroyed almost everything. It took centuries for India to regain its old cultural vigor and intellectual depth. When the recreated history of that great war was written, built through fragments of surviving information, the treaties was initially called Jaya or Victory. But even the unsophisticated minds of these descendants soon realized that this name was inappropriate. That dreadful war did not bring victory to anyone. Every single person who fought that war lost the war. In fact, the whole of India lost. Today, we know the inherited tale of that war as one of the world's greatest epics, the Mahabharat. If the Lord Nilkant allows it, the unadulterated story of that terrible war shall also be told one day. Om Namah Shiva The universe bows to Lord Shiva. I bow to Lord Shiva. Hope you enjoyed it.